please like, subscribe and share. Without further ado, let us continue our odyssey through the captivating world of, Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 251, Heartless and Cold-Blooded Lord. Damn it, why did you stop me? Rommelson was extremely agitated the moment he woke up. He rushed towards Link and grabbed him by the collar as he screamed. Even if he were to ignore the fact that Link prevented him from going to Milda's rescue, Link actually knocked him out using brute force. How could a magician ever resort to such tactics? It's simply unbelievable. A savage, crazy man. Link allowed this high elf to roar and go berserk for half a minute. After making sure that he had calmed down, Link laid out his hands helplessly and said, Have you calmed down? You must understand that every second you waste is also one second more dangerous for Princess Milda. This sentence was akin to a bucket of ice water, dousing Rommelson's fiery rage in one blow. He then picked up the blood-stained rocks on the table and strode towards the door. As he walked, he turned to Link and said coldly, Magician, I'll remember you. When I return to the Isle of Dawn, I will request for an audience with the Queen. I'll make sure you are blacklisted as one of the unwelcomed people of my race. He then opened the wooden door in rage. After taking just a step out of the house, Rommelson stopped and stared at the scene in front of him in horror. There were bodies lying helplessly on the ground as the mercenaries and residents cleaned up the mess silently. One could see some people weeping for their losses, some places on fire, some collapsed wooden houses. The stench of fresh blood filled the atmosphere. It was the complete opposite of the peaceful and calm furred wilderness Rommelson had seen just a while ago. How long have I been sleeping? Rommelson asked as he imagined the fierce battle that ensued. Not more than half an hour, Link said as he walked towards him. There were many assaulters I assume. There weren't many, only fifty of them. However, each one of them was extremely powerful. If I wasn't present, my territory would have been in ruins by now. Link's voice was calm. He seemed unaffected by Rommelson's previous threat. Rommelson could not help but turn to look at the human magician beside him. There was not a shred of agitation or rage on Link's face. Usually, a lord would have been enraged and depressed after suffering such huge losses. How could he stay so calm? Rommelson was baffled by this magician in front of him. He also did not want to understand his peculiar mindset. The tragedy in front of his eyes completely doused the rage he had as he whispered, I will be going off to find the princess. I'll accompany you. Link stayed by his side. Upon hearing those words, the rage that just subsided within Rommelson's heart was once again ignited. He bellowed, Oh, you are finally interested in saving the princess. To think that the princess gave you the heart of the puppet in the carriage just now. It would be fine if you refused to save the princess yourself, but how could you stop me from going as well? What a cruel and heartless lord you are. You will die if you go alone, Link reminded. Then I will die with no regrets. Rommelson growled. Grency had had enough of Rommelson's tantrum and shouted furiously, Young lad, Master Link did what he was supposed to. The person who made the decision to leave was your highness herself. Since she was the one who made the mistake, she naturally has to bear the consequences. Humph, I know what you people are planning. You guys are afraid to be implicated by the princess' death and are only leaving me alive as a witness. Humans are such hypocrites. Rommelson shouted as he strode out of the territory. When Rommelson reached an open space, a warm glow enveloped his wand as he summoned a black horse. He then mounted the horse and headed straight towards the east gate of the camp. He is a young lad after all. How stubborn, Ferdinand sighed. There was no right or wrong in the decisions made throughout this incident. The only thing that mattered was the difference in perspectives. Ferdinand was of the human race and would definitely support Link's approach to the matter from his perspective. He would have done the same if he was met with this dilemma. Grency then sighed, he is still too young and arrogant. He is talented and powerful, but he is not seeing the big picture. As Rommelson was about to leave the territory, Link said, All right, I'll leave the territory in the hands of the two masters. I'll be accompanying him to find Princess Milda. Celine, you will stay with the masters. Link knew what he had to do and would not be easily swayed by Rommelson's insensitive words. Link could care less about what Rommelson said, the high elf magicians in this timeline were generally the same after all. They had enjoyed peace and luxury on the Isle of Dawn for over hundreds of years. 
the younger generation had never quite understood the cruelties of the world. All right, you take care then, Celine said in a concerned tone. She was also not angry at Rommelson. In her eyes, the high elf was merely just a little more than a moody little brat. Lynn nodded and summoned the wind Fenrir immediately, chasing after Rommelson all the way out of the scorched ridge. Grency stared at the disappearing figures of the two young magicians into the darkness and finally said, let's hope that Rommelson will stop throwing his tantrums on the road. Ferdinand nodded as he said, both of them are young genius magicians. However, Rommelson's character is a far cry from Link. He is too unreliable, indeed, a disappointment. Why did the two masters not harbor a single shred of suspicion towards Link when they received the letter and the Dark Soul Stones? Apart from the fact that it was a clear framing technique, Link's usual conduct was a major reason as well. From the beginning when he handled the Darius ambush incident with maturity, to the revelation of Bale's experiments with dark magic and finally to his glorious victory against Demon Tarvis, Link had displayed a large number of commendable qualities. He was thoughtful, sensitive, objective, and rational. He would never judge anything or make a decision purely based on personal emotions. When Dean Anthony did not believe Link's warning regarding Tarvis' appearance, Link did not even utter a sentence of defiance. He simply spent all his time studying magic and eventually saved the entire academy. While it was fallacious to say that Link would never experiment with dark magic, it would be fair to say that Link would never allow himself to be exposed by such careless tactics. All in all, Link was a young lad that deserved their trust. Around 600 feet outside the scorched ridge, two dark shadows were overlooking the situation in the camp from behind a small hill. It's over, one of them said. His voice was raspy and low. He wore black leather armor and tied a dagger to each of his thighs. These daggers looked slightly special, having a rare crimson color and were enveloped in a layer of flaming brilliance. They looked gorgeous. From his gears, one could tell that he was an assassin. He has become even stronger. Our plan this time has failed, the other person spoke. This person was clad in a hooded robe and held a wand in his hand, he was a magician. Although they had killed many people, they were all insignificant mercenaries. Their primary targets had all been well protected and suffered practically no damage. The framing techniques that they had employed right from the beginning were all meaningless. He is already building his mage tower. Based on his current progress, it will be completed in about a month's time. With the monitoring ability of the mage tower, we will not have another chance at a sneak attack. The ambush this time around took advantage of the absence of a mage tower in the scorched ridge. However, now that this disadvantage would be addressed, the only way to deal with Link after the completion of the mage tower would be to use brute force. This was a devastating result. However, the black-robed magician suddenly emitted a quizzical sound and pointed to the scorched ridge in the distance before saying, Look, two people are running out from the territory. It is the escaped High Elf and Link. The assassin squinted his eyes to take a look and eventually nodded. He then said, It is indeed them. From the direction of their travel, they should be looking for the High Elf Princess. We have a chance. The magician then shook his head and said, We have around thirteen assassins left. Even after adding us both, it would only make us fifteen men strong force. It would be more than enough to deal with the High Elf. However, Link would be a problem. That guy knows how to use a group transportation spell. A transportation spell like Burst might not increase the combat powers of a magician. However, it was an exceptionally useful spell to use for escape purposes. Not only could Link manage this spell, he could even bring people along with him, making him extremely difficult to deal with. Even if they were to send 100 people to ambush him, he could also easily escape from the predicament. This was the exact reason why they did not intend to kill Link from the beginning even with over 60 assassins on their side. They chose to frame him with the crime they committed instead. Alas, the assassins that they sent to the Scorched Ridge did not seem to get the memo and fought against Link in a direct battle. The end result was telling enough. However, the assassin thought otherwise. He stood up and chuckled, the task of framing Link had not completely failed. As long as we kill the High Elf Princess, not only would the Furred Wilderness be in trouble, so would the Norton Kingdom. The ties between the High Elves and the human race would then become estranged, giving less pressure to you guys in the North. The magician nodded but was still hesitant. He then said, that might be true. But the High Elf Princess is extremely good at hiding. How will we find her? 
That is easy. The assassin smiled as he said. He then pointed at Rommelson from afar and said, Look, the high elf didn't take the main road the moment he left the camp. Instead, he ran straight into the wilderness, why do you think that is? The magician was extremely smart as well. He immediately continued the sentence, he can bring us to the high elf princess. Yes. Notice the direction that he travels in. It is basically a straight line. This suggests that he is finding the princess through some sort of connection. Extrapolating this line of travel would probably lead us to the high elf princess. We can totally get ahead of him and kill the princess first. If we have the time, we can even plan another ambush. Perhaps we can kill the high elf this time around. The assassin was extremely pleased with himself the more he thought about his plan. By making use of the high elf's eagerness to save the princess, they would follow his tracks and first kill off the princess. It was a perfect plan. The magician also praised him from the bottom of his heart. This plan is indeed good. It is worth a try. I will then wish you success in the advance. The assassin was taken aback and said, You are not taking part in this. Me. The magician smiled as he said, Of course not. The only reason for my trip to the south is to bring you the divine liquid. Furthermore, I have just reached level 6 and do not specialize in combat spells. I would only drag you down if I join this mission. The assassin then shrugged his shoulders and said, All right then, watch my wonderful performance. Chapter 252 Confrontation in the Wilderness Ferd Wilderness Romilson's summoned unicorn was even faster than Link's wind Fenrir. After a few minutes, he was more than 300 feet ahead of Link. However, he was not stupid. He knew that if he wanted to save the princess, he needed Link's power. So, after getting more than 300 feet ahead, he did not speed up and just maintained this distance. The princess's blood aura in the stains was fading. This meant the princess's life was fading too. Rommelson must get to Milda as fast as possible. Not a second could be wasted. The wilderness terrain had no pattern. Sometimes there would be boulders in the way, but that was okay. His level for Unicorn was very powerful and helped him quickly pass through these obstacles. Hey! Rommelson controlled the unicorn to jump over a boulder and then land before continuing forward at breakneck speed. He then heard a call from behind him. It was Link, trying to say something to him. He wanted to ignore the men. The humans were cold-blooded, selfish, and fake. If he didn't need Link's power to save the princess, he wouldn't even slow down to wait. So what if you're the number one human magician? So what if you can do spatial magic? F asterisk CKU. Anger rose inside Rommelson. He stopped controlling the unicorn's speed and prepared to charge wildly. But then, he suddenly heard a whoosh sound behind him. At the same time, there were violent mana waves, it was a magic spell. Someone was attacking behind with a spell. Looking back, he saw a metallic tip piercing towards him. The mana on it showed that it was Link's spell. Link. Attacking me. What is he doing? Rommelson grew even more furious. Getting an idea, he instantly cast the defensive spell Shield of Thorns. Shield of Thorns. Level 2 Elite Spell. Effect, Rotten Thorns created by solidified natural elements form a flexible shield. It can effectively block all piercing attacks. Note, Exclusive High Elf Spell. A green light flashed in the air, and countless thorns formed instantly. They wove together and created a ten-foot-wide shield. Poof. The whistle collided with the shield and exploded. However, the countless thorns absorbed all of the destructive force. It was basically ineffective. Romulsev instinctively began to fight back. He pointed his wand at the ground. A beam of dark green light shot into the soil. Poison Ivy Puncture. Poison Ivy Puncture. Level 3 Elite Spell. Use, creates a bundle of ivy vines that snakes across the ground. These vines are very resilient, highly penetrative, and poisonous. They can pop out of anywhere within 210 feet and attack the enemy. Note, exclusive a high elf spell. A flood of vines slithered across the ground, stretching toward Link who was catching up. Using the delay caused by the whistle, Link had decreased the distance between them to around 180 feet. Seeing the vines coming for him, 
He scrutinized the soil for any changes and guided the wind Fenrir left and right. Pop. 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 With each explosion, the soil beside Link burst. Bundles of black, thorny vines shot up rapidly. If Link was hit, he would either die or the poison would make him wish he were dead. Unblinkingly, Link multitasked while dodging the poison ivy. With a slight change of thought, he hurled a level 1 vector protective force field at Rommelson who was 120 feet away. While maintaining his summoned unicorn, Rommelson focused on controlling the poison ivy to attack Link. Seeing how Link was dodging pathetically, he thought that Link would be unable to cast spells and didn't give himself any defensive spells. He was wrong. The magicians who practiced with him in the Isle of Dawn couldn't do it, but that didn't mean Link couldn't. Multitasking with two tasks or even three, and counterattacking while defending was something every magician needed to know in a battle. If you couldn't do it and didn't want to die, then you should just hide in the back and play nurse. Boom. Rommelson was instantly hit by the force field. The force field wasn't very strong, but it was still painful for an average man. Rommelson was stronger than most people, yet he still toppled down the unicorn in a jumbled mess. He dropped his wand too. The unicorn and poison ivy all vanished. Footsteps approached him. The wind Fenrir had reached him. Link perched on the Fenrir and pointed the wand at Rommelson. The vector protective force field was in preparation, the semi-transparent force field easily restricted Rommelson on the ground. Rommelson stared at Link in disbelief. You want to kill me? Are you really studying dark magic? Link sighed, feeling sad for the high elf's brain. He said coldly, I'm stopping you from killing Princess Milda. Rommelson was instantly furious. Kill Princess Milda. Bulsh asterisk T. I'm saving her. Link's patience had a limit too. He pointed in the direction Rommelson was heading to. Is the princess in that direction? Yes. Let go of me. Rommelson roared. Link said coldly, there are most likely still assassins hidden in the wilderness, including at least one level, six magician. If you go directly, the enemies will easily find where the princess is hiding. You're killing her. You. Rommelson uttered before he finally processed it. He shuddered and the blood drained from his face. Seeing that he understood, Link let go of the force field. He waited for the high elf to stand up dazedly and growled, What are you waiting for? Where's your unicorn? Hurry up. But this will reveal her highness's hiding spot. Rommelson had broken down like a system's collapse, his IQ was plummeting too. It was useless to hope he could do something. Summon your unicorn. Link changed his tactic and ordered. Rommelson mumbled something and wanted to argue, but what he had just done was honestly too stupid. He had no confidence now. After hesitating a bit, he summoned the dark brown unicorn again. Link said again, go. You point the way, and we'll take a detour. Which way? Rommelson asked another stupid question. Rather than berating him, Link pointed in a random direction. That way and speed up. Ah, uh, okay. Rommelson obediently steered the unicorn and then sped up. He honestly had no self-esteem now, he went at Link's speed. Link asked, how far are we from the princess? Around five miles away. Link quietly estimated and then said, then, the princess will be absolutely safe within five minutes. After five minutes, she'll be in danger, so we have five minutes to act. Rommelson didn't understand. Ah, how did you calculate that? Are you sure it's five minutes? Won't they be confused by the direction we're going in? To make him cooperate, Link explained, it's a simple deduction. I hypothesized that you were discovered the moment you ran out of the territory. The enemy also guessed the princess's hiding spot at once and sent the command immediately. It's around five miles from the territory to that spot. If the assassins go directly there at top speed, it'll take five minutes. This was a really simple math problem. The shortest distance between two points was a line. Divide the shortest distance by the enemy's highest speed, and you would get the period of absolute safety. They might use magic communication to send the message, Rommelson tried to argue impossible. Link said decisively and explained, firstly, I didn't sense any strange mana waves around here. Secondly, that command is complicated and temporary. 
it's hard to use magic communication to send messages like this. Rommelson was speechless and completely convinced. After a few seconds of silence, he asked, what if they're fooled by what we're doing now? Will it help win us some time? A little but not much. If I were them, I'd choose to split my men into two groups. One group would follow the original direction. The other would follow us. Link had thought it through. Hearing this, Rommelson grew anxious. Then why don't we just go in a straight line? Calm down. Link seemed to have already won. After a while, he suddenly said, Okay, change your direction and go at top speed, then keep the distance between us to 160 feet. But this is the wrong direction. It's wrong by a lot. Rommelson honestly couldn't understand. I know, but stop hesitating and just go. Link had become strict again. Rommelson's self-esteem had recovered a bit, but he still couldn't fight against Link's command. Gritting his teeth, he started galloping towards the direction Link had pointed out. After a while, he turned around and saw that Link's wind Fenrir had started galloping too, maintaining the 160-foot distance between them. This was slightly reassuring. At night in the wilderness. Chief, they changed direction. Changed direction. How? The assassin speaking held two dark red daggers. Link caught up to the high elf, and they seemed to have a scuffle. Then, they changed direction. Hey, don't hesitate. Continue searching in the original direction. And send two more men after them. Don't lose them. Understood. Half a minute later, another assassin came to report. Chief, they changed direction again. They seemed to have argued and the high elf ran forward again. He's super fast. Oh. The chief sank into thought. After a few seconds, he asked, is it the original direction? It's at least 20 degrees off. Tell the men to change direction. Follow the high elf's current direction. Hurry, they must hurry. Understood. Seeing the men leave, the chief sped up too. He was extremely fast, even faster than Link's wind Fenrir. After sprinting for two minutes, the high elf and Link appeared in his vision. He cackled, Link, so what if you saw through my plan? It's not my fault that high elf is stupid, ha. Huh? Thinking a bit, he felt that it still wasn't safe. The two were too fast and might get to the high elf princess first. He must slow them down so his men would have more time to search. Chapter 253, Humiliated Furred Wilderness As every second and minute passed by, Rommelson felt increasingly anxious. It would only be around one mile before he would miss Princess Milda's hiding spot. The presence of her blood was getting thinner, suggesting that her life was only hanging on by a thin thread. She must have suffered some fatal wound. If I do not get there in time, I am afraid the princess, Rommelson did not dare to continue on that train of thoughts. After ten more seconds, Rommelson could not help but look behind him. He then saw Link leisurely following him 150 feet away. Rommelson could clearly see the calm expression on Link's face as the distance separating them was short. Link appeared to be in control of the situation and even nonchalant, as though all these things did not matter to him. Upon seeing his calm demeanor, Rommelson could not help but shout, Link, the Highness has suffered a fatal wound. She can only last for half an hour more. Rommelson then turned back as the mana within himself surged immediately, activating the defensive bracelet on his wrist. With a light buzzing sound, a light green crystal barrier surrounded him. This was a level 5 defensive spell, natural rune barrier. Following which, he saw a dark figure standing on a huge rock around 150 feet away. This person wore pure black leather armor and was surrounded by a crimson miasma. He also held two daggers that surged with streams of bloody red brilliance. He didn't make a move, only standing on top of the twelve-foot-tall rock and said, it is not very safe to be running across the wilderness at this time, my two dear magicians. Who are you? Rommelson pulled his unicorn to a halt. Without waiting for the assassin to answer, Link had already caught up and ran past Rommelson without slowing down his speed. He had also completely ignored the assassin and said, why are you bantering with him? Saving lives takes precedence. But he... Rommelson wanted to say that there might be an ambush lying in wait for them. However, Link had already run past him as he said, he is merely stalling time, can't you tell? 
Rommelson was immediately enlightened and felt his face turn hot. He then immediately willed the unicorn to charge at full speed and quickly caught up with Link. He then stared at the assassin on top of the rock and felt a wave of anger rush through him. He then raised his wand and fired a spell at the rock. Venom Ball. Venom Ball. Level 5 Spell. Effect, concentrates natural elements to form an extremely corrosive light ball. Note, exclusive high elf spell. A green light then began concentrating at the tip of Rommelson's wand and quickly, an emerald-colored ball of more than one foot in length appeared. Rommelson then flung this ball straight towards the rock without hesitation. Go to hell. The venomous ball traveled at an insane speed. The assassin snickered and leaped backward right before the venom ball was about to hit his body. He then fell swiftly from the rock and escaped this spell in the nick of time. The assassin's speed was so fast that Rommelson could not react in time. The venom ball had already flown past the rock and hit the ground around 180 feet away. Bang! The venom ball exploded, and the ground within a 15-foot radius was immediately reduced to a pile of dark green mush. It also bubbled and emitted a turquoise-colored smoke, showing its destructive, corrosive power. The assassin then looked behind him and felt a shiver down his spine. He was lucky to have escaped the attack swiftly. If not, even his bones might have been melted by the destructive attack. He then stared at the distant figures of the two magicians and frowned. This high elf was merely a young, immature brat, he would be easy to deal with. However, Link was the problem. The assassin felt extremely bitter as he watched them going further away. He then shouted, Link, aren't you afraid that I will attack Scorched Ridge right now? Link then replied, if you truly have the strength, why would you still be chatting with me? Along with the reply, Link had also greeted the assassin with two whistle spells. The spell was extremely fast and was fired at a precise angle. The assassin immediately used his dagger to shield himself from the direct blows of this attack. However, before the dagger could hit the whistles, they exploded in midair, causing the sacred silver fragments to splatter around him, encasing him in a rain of deathly metal fragments. He was unable to escape. Left without a choice, the assassin could only retreat while shielding his face using his hands. Most of the sacred silver was blocked by his leather armor. However, a few managed to slip through the cracks in his armor and pierce into his body. A sharp pain then seared through his mind. The assassin felt terrified and immediately hid behind a rock. Behind the rock, he observed his injuries and realized that there were a few holes the size of a fingertip in his hands. Silver liquid flowed within these injuries, and turquoise smoke could be seen oozing out from those wounds as well. So this is sacred silver, it truly is powerful. The assassin decisively brought out his dagger and severed the flesh affected by the sacred silver. The moment the silver liquid was removed, the gory wounds started wriggling and healing itself at a speed visible to the naked eye. These wounds then disappeared in five seconds. The assassin then heaved a sigh of relief and said in satisfaction, the power of the divine liquid is truly amazing. He then emerged from behind the rock and realized that Link and the high elf had already moved forward another few hundred feet. He immediately picked up his speed and chased forward. Although Link was a difficult person to deal with, he would stall as much time as he could. As long as he could kill the high elf princess, his mission would be accomplished. On the other side. Rommelson no longer took the lead arrogantly. He ran beside Link as they charged together towards their target. Link, that guy is chasing us again, Rommelson said. I know. Let him do it. We have two people. He is merely irritating us. Link had a clear view of the situation. Rommelson still could not help but look behind and gasp. How can he be so fast? He should have been injured from the previous attack. He looks completely unscathed. Link then observed his surroundings, and after making sure it was safe, he explained to Rommelson. That assassin is pretty strong. He should be around level 6 in strength even before he was strengthened. Now that he has received the blessings of the Dark Serpent, he should be at the peak of level 7. This grants him extreme vitality. The small injuries that I dealt previously probably healed in around a few seconds' time. In order to deal with these creatures, you have to completely destroy their bodies. Even crushing their hearts would not kill them off immediately. They can still maintain a few seconds of combat following that fatal wound. Then what is his weapon? Do you recognize it? 
Rummelson asked again. His attitude towards Link had already changed for the better. He probably didn't realize it himself. I don't recognize it. However, for an assassin to be using such a conspicuous weapon, he is either an idiot or that the weapon is extremely strong. If we really end up in a direct battle, we need to be careful. In fact, Link recognized those two daggers. He had seen them in the game before. A crimson body and a fiery red aura, this pair was an extremely famous epic quality weapon called the Reaper's Gaze. He remembered that this pair of daggers had an extremely powerful special effect. If they were forcefully brought into a battle against this assassin, Link should be able to deal with it. However, if Rommelson was careless, he might be killed easily by his opponent. Upon this thought, Link added, after we find the princess, I predict that this person will try to intercept us. Do not try to attack him then, just protect yourself. This was Link's good intentions and him trying to be kind. However, it sounded pretty insulting. One should know that by the ranking of strength, Rommelson was a level 7 magician while Link was only level 6. To be warned by a magician lower in rank was humiliating for Rommelson. He thus sneered, you don't have to care about me. Link simply glanced at him and smiled faintly. Rommelson could not take it any more and shouted, what kind of glance is that? Contempt. Disdain. Let me tell you, while I might not be as strong as you yet, I am still able to take on one assassin by myself. Let's hope so, Link shook his head as he spoke. He had exchanged a few strikes with this high elf just now and already had a basic understanding of his skills. Link could only say that this young high elf was truly overestimating his abilities and had clearly not gained enough battle experience. Hey, are the both of you really afraid of me? The assassin's voice sounded from behind again. He sounded really provocative. Rommelson then stared at Link and saw that he was unmoved. He hence also kept his rebuttals to himself. The voice then sounded yet again, I say, are the both of you cowards? Haha, <laughs> the flame controller that has his name known throughout Fireman is actually keeping silent in front of me. Link pretended not to hear those words while he calculated Milda's exact location in his head. Rommelson, on the other hand, could not stand it any more and growled, you cowardly mouse. Take one shot of my magic if you dare. Oh, do you really think I am dumb? If you can hit me then come at me. As he spoke, this assassin swiftly ducked behind a huge rock, only revealing his head. Rommelson gritted his teeth as he finally saw through the intentions of this guy. He hence started learning from Link to ignore and not reply to his provocations. After two more minutes, Link suddenly spoke, prepare. What? What do I do? Rommelson could not react in time. Link did not explain and merely surged his mana through his body and cast the dimensional jump spell. In a blinding white brilliance, Link and Rommelson disappeared from their current location, and in an instant, they were transported to a place a mile away. The moment they landed, Link asked, is the princess nearby, never mind, I already see her. Just sixty feet away between two boulders, Princess Milda lay on the ground drenched in blood. Her face was turning blue, and her breathing was faint. A crossbow arrow had pierced deeply into her right abdomen. Link then quickly walked over, and after some observations, he said, the arrow did not hurt any key organs. However, there is fatal poison smeared on the arrow. As he said those words, he did not hesitate to pull the arrow out from the wound. Blood then gushed out from the wound, and the half-conscious Milda whimpered in pain. Rommelson was heartbroken by this scene and growled, What are you doing? Are you trying to kill her highness? Shut up. I am trying to save her. Link pressed his hands on the wound and cast the blizzard spell to concentrate water elements, encasing the wound in ice. It was completed within three seconds. Although this would not cure Milda's injuries, it could greatly slow the spread of the toxins through her body. Link spent less than five seconds accomplishing all these. He then cast a flotation spell on Milda and turned to Rommelson and said, You bring the princess along, we will head back to Scorched Ridge immediately. Ah, oh okay. Rommelson summoned the unicorn and used the magician's hand to place Princess Milda on the back of the unicorn. He then charged straight in the direction of the Scorched Ridge. Link similarly summoned his wind Fenrir and stayed by Rommelson's side the entire time, keeping his sensors on high alert. On the other side of the forest, the assassin stared at the empty plot of land where Link and Rommelson once stood dumbfounded. 
It took him several seconds before he recollected himself and slapped his thighs in agony. Link you truly got me, I still fell for your trick. Needless to say, the first direction which the high elf proceeded with was the correct one. The change in direction was definitely something planned by Link. He deliberately chose a 20 degree turn from the original to give the illusion that they were merely adjusting their direction of travel. He had gotten information from the dark elves that Link's transportation spell had a maximum distance of a mile. It had been four miles since they made a change in direction. As they merely made a slight adjustment of running 20 degrees away from their original trajectory, their displacement would then be only a mile away from their original destination. After a few adjustments in the spell, it would become a perfect distance for Link to cast his dimensional jump spell. Link had managed to use his group transportation spell to once again create a huge time advantage for himself. Damn it. I hate this guy. The assassin recalled Link's behavior all this while and realized that Link had completely seen through his tactics. This was truly humiliating. At this moment, he saw his own underlings in front of him. He immediately bellowed, follow me, let's intercept them. Link had already used the group transportation spell once. He did not believe that Link could cast it again. Even if he could, they would merely be a mile ahead. They could still catch up if they went at top speed. He was interested in seeing how much mana points Link still possessed after the huge battle at Scorched Ridge. Chapter 254, Thin Line Between Life and Death Furred Wilderness Link looked up at the sky. The moon hung high, casting down silver light and covering the wilderness with a layer of frosty white fog. It was a clear night and was suitable for flying. Rommelson, don't use the unicorn. Use a flight spell so we can get back quickly, Link said. He was pretty sure the assassins would try to stop them. If they flew, they could pass over the trouble. Unexpectedly, Rommelson grew awkward. I don't know how. Aren't you a level, 7 magician? You don't know any flight spells. Link knitted his brows. This was an awkward situation. Rommelson became more embarrassed. I don't like being in the air, how about you do it? Who would have thought that he was scared of heights? Link shook his head. I don't have much mana left, and one of the enemies is a level 6 magician. I need to be ready for any sneak attacks. He had encountered a level 6 hellfire magic seal earlier. This meant that the enemy had a very powerful magician that he must be careful of. The gears in Link's mind moved, and he suddenly had an idea. Giving up on the original plan of returning to the camp, he steered the wind Fenrir and started running towards the coastline. Follow me. To where? Rommelson hurried to catch up. There'll be assassins on the way back. It's not safe, Link said. If it was just the two of them, Link could battle it out. But now they also had to protect the gravely injured elf princess Milda, so he wasn't confident. Rommelson didn't have any other ideas and could only follow Link closely. After a while, he suddenly yelled in panic, Link, her highness can't keep going anymore. What should we do? Link turned to glance at Milda. Her pallor was sickly, and her light golden hair had lost luster. Looking closer, he saw that Milda's breathing had become weak. Her mana aura was extremely chaotic. Chaotic mana meant that one's consciousness was slipping and losing control of one's body. Warriors had a similar phenomenon. Many times after a powerful warrior died, the battle aura inside would collapse. Sometimes, it would even cause a battle aura tornado. If this was happening to Milda now, it meant she was on the brink of death. Even if they could return to Scorched Ridge, probably no one would be able to save her. Did you bring medicine? Link asked. Yes, but they're useless. Her Highness always has elf nectar with her. It's a type of sacred medicine with great detoxification effects. She's already taken it, but it's useless. This poison is too powerful. Rommelson's expression was grim, he looked like he was about to cry. He used to live a peaceful life in the Isle of Dawn but ran into this mess as soon as he arrived in the Norton Kingdom. Now, even his princess was about to die. He was having a complete mental breakdown. The problem was that even the elf nectar was ineffective against this poison. It was a rare feat. Thinking of something, Link said, let me check her injuries. With that, he activated the magician's hand and moved the princess from Rommelson's unicorn. This time, Rommelson didn't stop Link. 
he was already a mess and Link, ever so calm, was his last thread of hope. When Milda reached the wind Fenris back, Link controlled the beast to run smoothly. He cast a flash spell for illumination and carefully lifted Milda's eyelids. The crystal-like eyes had no luster, and the light purple irises had become dark green. Her pupils had dilated and, this was bad news. Link turned Milda's hand over. He pinched the skin on the back of her hand and studied it closely. He'd seen her hands during the day. At that time, the skin was still smooth and flawless like cream. Now, Link discovered that the skin had darkened. When he pinched and pulled the skin taut, he could see little dark green dots underneath. At a glance, it was like countless little bugs under her skin. Seeing this, Link had some idea what kind of poison had been on that arrow. He thought, system, I need specific info about the toxin, gray blood poison. After a while, information on the gray blood poison was displayed in Link's vision. Gray blood poison. Epic toxin. History, it first appeared in the year 1229 of the Divine Calendar. The first generation blood poison was created by Deans, a disciple of Dark Elf Master Magician Amons. After countless modifications, it has become a practically incurable poison. Use, fusing into the victim's blood, the poison destroys the cells along the way. There will be dark blood spots under the victim's skin. Then their organs will begin to dissolve, followed by the muscles. Finally, the victim will be reduced to mostly undamaged skin and a skeleton. Special circumstances, high elves severely lack immunity to this poison. Even with a cure, the victim may not be able to survive if they are a high elf. Solution 1, Moonlight Potion. Solution 2, Blood Purification. Note, this toxin must be removed as soon as possible. If the organs begin to dissolve, it will become truly incurable. Link scanned the information quickly. Having a general idea, he quickly pulled open Milda's shirt. He pressed down lightly on her chest to test the status of her organs. Milda's body was now covered in dark and pale patches. There was no beauty to speak of, so Link was not distracted. After a few seconds, he closed Milda's shirt and said, I have an idea of what poison it is. It can dissolve her organs. I checked, and her organs have some small changes already. She can last for half an hour at most. Ah. Rummelson gasped. Staring at Link, he said, Master Link, you have a solution. You must have a solution, right? Yes, but we have to get rid of the enemies in the way first. Link could already sense the assassins behind him. They didn't disguise themselves and used their advantageous speed to pursue Link and Rommelson. Now, they were more than 2,000 feet away. At their rate, they would be here in five minutes. Rommelson could feel it too. Furious, he yelled, those de-asterisk MN assassins. I'm gonna kill them all. No, we can't fight them. He princess won't be able to handle it. Link calmly considered the situation. Milda was running out of time, her life was hanging by a thread. He must detoxify her immediately. Rommelson was about to cry. He kept looking behind him or to the princess on the wind Fenrir. His thoughts were a mess, and it would probably affect his casting of spells. Relax, Rommelson. The princess won't die. I have a way to save her, but you have to do what I say. Rommelson also realized that he had lost it. Forcing himself to calm down, he nodded. Okay. Sitting on the Fenrir, Link produced some magic materials. He didn't have any moonlight potions and didn't know how to make one either, so he couldn't consider the solution. As for solution two, he needed a blood purifier. The theory behind blood purifiers was simple. It was basically a precise water purifier with a simple transmutation magic seal on the filter. Then, the magician must control the magic seal precisely and remove the toxin without damaging the blood cells. All in all, the magician must have a very strong enchantment foundation, which Link obviously had. Link didn't have a blood purifier either, but it wasn't too complicated. He had the materials so he could quickly make a simplified version now. Without saying anything else, he focused and started making it. Rommelson caught up and asked anxiously, where are we going? Don't disturb me. If anyone comes, stop them. Link had to control the wind Fenrir and create the blood purifier at the same time without making any mistakes. It was extremely hard. 
All hope of saving the princess was on this human magician. Rommelson didn't dare to say anything. He followed Link quietly with a wand in hand. He was ready to attack any assassin who appeared. The seconds ticked by. Link could feel the mana fading from Milda, and she was barely breathing. She was about to die. Rommelson kept an eye on Milda's status too. He was so nervous that it felt like his heart had jumped into his throat. He just wished Link would hurry up. Around two minutes later, there was a blood purifier made of mithril in Link's hands. It was shaped like a small heart with an entrance and exit for the blood. The center was an empty atrium the size of a fist. It was crudely made, but he didn't have time to worry about that. After testing it a few times to confirm that the thing worked, Link lifted Milda's shirt again. He pressed down on her chest and back to discern where the heart was. Then he applied pressure and stabbed the two tubes into Milda's heart from under her armpits. With the two tubes in her body, Link extended his perception along the blood purifier. Higgs' force field also extended into it. The force field changed the tube's shape with minor adjustments. It carefully connected the tubes to the aorta. Certain that there was no error, Link activated the spell on the blood purifier. The mithril heart glowed dimly. Then, Link saw viscous black blood get sucked out of Milda's body. It flowed into the blood purifier and flowed back into her body after being purified by the magic seal. The cycle repeated. Link carefully controlled the magic seal on the blood purifier. Bit by bit, the gray blood poison was picked out. This was highly technical work. He needed to ensure the stability of the mana waves and distinguish the toxin. If he messed up, Milda's blood would be destroyed even if he got rid of the toxin. She would definitely die then. Link focused entirely on this work to avoid any problems. After around two minutes, the blood from Milda's body contained some slivers of red, while the purifier grew darker. Milda's breathing also grew heavier. Success. Link thought in relief. As an amateur, he had succeeded the first time he performed such a complex heart surgery. He was truly blessed by God. To be honest, he had been relying entirely on his strong perception as a magician to feel around. It had been like walking in the dark. He had no clue if he could succeed and just tried his best. Since there was some effect, he needed to keep it up. Link continued to operate the blood purifier. He estimated that at this rate, Milda's blood would be completely detoxified in 10 minutes. All his focus was on the blood purifier, but he was also worried about the assassins. How's the situation? He asked Rommelson. Rommelson had seen Milda's state. Link was suspect of groping the princess's body, but she truly had recovered, so Rommelson had nothing to say. To answer Link's question, he quickly reported, they've caught up. They're only around 400 feet away now. 400 feet. Link glanced back. Using the moon for illumination, he saw a dozen black shadows racing towards them. The one at the front was the one who had the reaper's gaze dagger. I need ten more minutes for the blood purifier. I can't cast spells, so you have to stop them. Link exclaimed. Ah, there are fourteen of them. I don't think I can handle it. Rommelson didn't dare overestimate his power. Link continued, just do what I say. If you can't follow directions, then just say so. What do I say if I can do follow directions? Rommelson asked stupidly. Link sighed. He was losing patience from dealing with this imbecile. He growled, if you can what I day, then just do it. What else do you need to say? Do I have to teach you this too? Ah, oh, oh. I get it. Rommelson realized immediately that he had asked something stupid. Now, cast the magic light spell at the sky. Keep going, don't stop. This was an illumination spell. It was simple, and Rommelson obviously knew how to do it. He didn't know why Link wanted it, but he just followed the order. Bright balls of light streamed from his wand and rushed into the sky. The formation of white light lit up the area as if it were daytime. No secret attacker could hide in this brightness. Link looked up at the coastline in the near distance. He adjusted his direction and ran to the beach. The assassins behind them were now within 300 feet. Link glanced at the cave on the beach and saw the two familiar eerie green flames of the soul inside. Making a decision, he ran another 600 feet and said, Now stop and cast a level 7 offensive spell. 
I need at least three seconds. They're not stupid, and they'll definitely dodge it. Then, it'll be over for us. Rommelson cried. Do what I say. Link ordered. The high elf had wasted two seconds with his nonsense. Rommelson jumped in fright. He immediately started casting the spell Thorn Jungle. Thorn Jungle. Level, 7 Master Magician Spell. Cost, 3,500 mana points. Effect, Rotan Thorns created by solidified natural elements form a dense and deadly thorn array within 240 feet of the spell caster. Note, this is a semi-supplementary, semi-offensive spell, used mainly to trap the opponent. Chapter 255, I Am Truly a Fool. Nightfall, The Beach. The assassin leader chuckled when he saw Rommelson channeling his spell. He then said, my brothers, retreat further behind, this guy is panicking. His underlings then erupted into bursts of laughter. They were around 300 feet away from their opponent. Judging from the magic fluctuation around Rommelson, it should be a level 7 spell. Emerald light glittered around him, and he was encased in an elemental brilliance at least 6 feet in diameter. However, a spell would be for naught if it could not hit its enemy. Just to be safe, the assassins retreated a little further and were prepared to watch the show from the beach. To tell the truth, a magician looks pretty darn scary while they are casting a spell. I did not believe people when they said that high elves are good-looking. But geez, even I am feeling something for this magician. If we manage to kill them, I'll have a shot at taking that good-looking elf for myself. Heh. As they conversed, Rommelson's spell had taken form. With a whooshing sound, a large number of thorn vines appeared from the ground with him as the center. The thorns on these vines were as sharp as daggers, with their tips shaped like hooks. Under the illumination of Rommelson's magic aura, the vines looked like snakes slithering in all directions. In an instant, the area within a thirty-foot radius around Rommelson was covered in such vines, completely sealing off the only way forward for the assassins. At the same time, violent magic fluctuations could be felt. The assassin leader frowned slightly as he said, This spell is slightly troublesome, not good, it's a sneak attack. As he spoke, he could feel imminent danger approaching. He immediately released his battle aura, causing a crimson glow to envelop his body. He then immediately moved away from his location, retreating almost 150 feet in an instant. However, although he could escape this attack, his underlings were not so lucky. As he spoke, red flaming runes more than 15 feet in diameter appeared on the spot his underlings were standing at. These runes overlapped one another, forming a complex formation of countless runes. It was also situated at a perfect location, trapping five assassins at once. These assassins who were distracted by the level 7 spell of the High Elf naturally reacted slowly to this sudden attack. By the time they wanted to dodge, it was too late. Almost an instant after the runes appeared, an explosion sound rumbled through the beach as a 15-foot-thick incandescent pillar of flame rose from the ground. It reached an altitude of 150 feet, consuming the assassins in the process. Arg. The five assassins were burned to ashes after only a few screams of despair. This was the power of a level 7 spell. Fortunately, there were eight other assassins who instinctively retreated in time. Although they just had a close shave with death, they immediately let down their guard and thought, lucky I am still alive. However, little did they know that the attack had not yet ended. Almost immediately, another rune formation appeared at the most precise location once again, accurately predicting the eventual position of the assassins following their retreat. It engulfed four assassins this time around. To be exact, it seemed as though the four assassins stepped into the rune formation of their own accord. Boom. After another huge flaming pillar eruption, four assassins uttered the final scream of their lives. Four assassins remained. The four of them exchanged glances and were already terrified. They were prepared to flee and give up on this battle when the rune formation appeared once again. Boom. With the sound of another explosion, two more assassins were consumed by the attack. Within a tenth of a second, another spell erupted, taking the lives of the last two assassins. Apart from the assassin leader, the rest of his underlings were completely annihilated. Although the process might seem long, the entire duration of this spell was less than a second. Within a second, four separate rune formations appeared in the area around the assassins. Four consecutive flaming pillars then erupted from the ground and consumed all the assassins in the process. 
These four incandescent flaming pillars formed a complete level 7 spell. Level 7 spell. Instantaneous spellcasting speed as well. The assassin leader was horrified. He knew that his opponents must have gotten some backup and immediately thought of retreating. He then released his battle aura as he turned in the opposite direction. Won't you stay? A voice rang from the shadows of the forest followed by a beam of emerald light. It was the level 6 spell, Metal Decay. Spells that were light-based in nature traveled extremely fast. In the darkness, one could see a beam of light flashing through the air, charging straight towards the heart of the assassin leader. However, the assassin leader was experienced as well. He released a huge amount of battle aura in the last moment and managed to escape to one side. This was not to say that the assassin leader was faster than the spell. He merely predicted his opponent's attack beforehand. When a magician cast a spell, he would first have to determine the position where he wanted his attack to land. The spell would then take time to travel to that location. All these processes took time. In the eyes of other professions, this time was called the golden period. Different types of spells had different golden periods as well. The length could be as long as half a second. For example, Link's whistle needed to travel through the air before reaching its target. In that time, an experienced warrior could easily erect his defenses. Of course, the practicality of the defense then depended on the warrior's judgment and skills. Short golden periods could be only around 10 microseconds long. Within these spells, the light-based spells were known for having extremely short golden periods. Most of these spells had a foundational golden period of not more than 100 microseconds long. If the magician was an experienced one, he could even shorten it to under 10 microseconds. With a buzzing sound, the metal decay beam shot across the assassin's arm and left a charred mark on his hand. It then hit the ground, causing a pile of rotten mud more than 9 feet in diameter to appear immediately. The assassin leader had succeeded in avoiding the attack. However, the metal decay attack was not completed. This spell was similar to the fire pillars previously and was made to fire in bursts. After the first beam, three consecutive beams emerged from the shadows. Each of these beams had been carefully adjusted to aim at the assassin leader's fatal spots. Boom. 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 Three beams of light flashed across the atmosphere. The assassin leader also changed his stance three consecutive times in an instant, escaping these deadly beams one by one. His speed was outrageous. From others' perspective, his body seemed to have split into multiple images in that instant. Every beam seemed to pass through the image but was just so close to hitting his real self. The attack ended after a second with all four beams landing onto the ground. All the images of the assassin leader then converged into a tangible body. He then immediately headed in the opposite direction. He was running for his life. You stay. Rommelson was the one shouting this time around. The unexpected support was a huge confidence booster for him. He had already cancelled his Thornvine spell. When the assassin leader was busy dealing with the spells coming from the shadows, Rommelson skillfully manipulated his unicorn and charged straight at the assassin. As the assassin leader was about to flee, he raised his wand and pointed it towards the assassin leader before shouting, Poison Thorn Vines. Whoosh! A series of noises sounded from the ground as countless magic vines sprung up towards the assassin. Boom. Boom. The vines appeared one after another, charging towards the assassin leader in all directions. However, this assassin leader had just escaped a light-based spell. These vines would be a piece of cake compared to the close shave with death he just encountered. He skillfully dodged left and right, escaping Rommelson's attacks while showcasing a beautiful dance. Rommelson could not seem to land a hit. Damn it. How can he be so fast? Rommelson was terrified. He felt as though he was punching the air when the enemy was right in front of him. However, his attack was not useless. It had successfully trapped the assassin leader in his location and gave the figure in the shadows enough time to cast a spell. Flame Blast The figure in the darkness used a standard fire elemental spell. An incandescent fireball charged towards the assassin leader. Although it was a level 4 spell, the destructive force of this spell was terrifying. If the assassin leader was engulfed by these flames, he would be heavily injured and most probably done in by the next few follow-up spells. The attacking range of this spell was huge as well. 
After the explosion, the area within a 90-foot radius of the point of the explosion would be engulfed in flames, there would be no place for the assassin leader to hide. In an instant, Rommelson felt a sense of relief as he thought that this battle was settled. However, at the moment, Link's voice sounded, Fool! Get back! Back! Why? Rommelson had not reacted to the situation. The next moment, he felt his heart palpitating at an insane rate, as though he had been targeted by an ancient ferocious beast. It was an intense feeling. More importantly, although he felt this dangerous premonition, he had no idea where the danger would strike. In his state of panic, he could only follow Link's instructions and give up on his poison thorn vine spell and ran back with his unicorn mount. But he was too late. The next instant, he heard a huge explosion behind him. It was the flame blast spell. Following which, Rommelson realized that the assassin leader had disappeared. Where is he? Where did he go? Rommelson instinctively cast a defensive spell on himself. Before the defensive spell was completed, he suddenly heard the sound of howling winds. Following which, he saw a dark figure beside him. It was the assassin leader who was just getting cornered a moment ago. How can he be so fast? Rommelson was horrified. The assassin leader smiled cruelly as he raised his dagger and plunged it straight towards his heart. The speed of this attack was outrageous. It's over. I won't be in time. Rommelson knew that he would not have the time to complete his defensive spell. In fact, the emotional fluctuation that he was going through had already undone whatever progress he had made in casting the spell. As the dagger was about to pierce through his skin, Rommelson felt his body tremble at the very last moment. He then noticed that a faint crimson glow was enveloping his body. He then took a look at the assassin leader and realized that the speed at which the dagger was reaching his heart had slowed down significantly. Furthermore, within this red glow, the black leather armor on the assassin leader's body began to burn. Link cast a defensive spell on me. Rommelson finally reacted to the situation. He felt as though he was just pulled back from the brink of death. The assassin leader decisively gave up on his assault after this delay and retreated a total of 30 feet in a single leap. After 30 feet, a dark crimson miasma could be seen enveloping his body. Whoosh! An emerald light beam pierced this crimson miasma and almost dissipated it. However, after the miasma dissipated, the assassin leader was nowhere to be seen. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. Where is he? Rommelson could not wrap his head around this situation. That was a battle aura illusion. His real self was concealed under some sort of stealth spell, Link explained. It was a shame that he had to concentrate on curing Milda. If not, the assassin leader would have been a corpse by now. I am here. You fool. A voice emerged from afar. Rommelson stared in the direction of the voice and saw that several hundred feet away, the assassin leader was waving to him. This guy was laughing hysterically and suddenly turned his body around. He then accelerated and disappeared into the darkness. He was gone. Two level, seven magicians were unable to stop him. If not for Link's intervention at the end, Rommelson would already be dead. Rommelson was devastated at this result. He then thought back on his immature ravings and felt his face turn hot. He almost wanted to find a hole in the ground and bury his head in it. He remembered that his mentor had told him before he left the Isle of Dawn, you are now an official magician. However, you are still not fit for combat. You must be extra careful when you go to the Norton Kingdom. He thought nothing about it then. This was because the strongest magician in the entire Norton Kingdom was Dean Anthony, who was merely a level 7 magician like him. How dangerous could such an undeveloped place be? But now he totally understood the teachings of his mentor. His path of magic had just begun. As Link and this assassin leader had said, in a real battle, he was nothing but a fool. This was truly a painful realization. Chapter 256, and then, a demon king will appear. High Elf Rommelson stood dazedly on the beach. From the corner of his vision, he saw the black-robed magician leave quietly. He did not know who that magician was or why he would help them. He'd even sensed a dark aura from the magician's magic, but Rommelson didn't want to stop him. No matter who he was, he had saved them and that was a fact. Rommelson knew he wasn't a match for the magician either. The sea breeze blew by, and the crashing of waves traveled to his ears constantly. 
He stood for a good ten minutes before he finally recovered and went back to Link's side. Link was sitting on the beach now. Princess Milda was still leaning in his arms. Her clothing was a bit disorderly with two mithril tubes reached inside her collar. There was a thin aura of blood coming from her. How is she? Rummelson asked. He could see that the princess was much better. Her breathing was more stable, and the darkness of her pallor had faded to nothing. Link was still focused on detoxifying and nodded when he heard Rommelson. Not optimistic. Rommelson's heart clenched. Seeing Link's state, he didn't dare disturb him and just waited patiently. After another ten minutes, Link's finger moved. He said, the purification is mostly done, but Her Highness's body is greatly damaged. It's hard to say, come, help me hold this. Rommelson hurried over. He knelt down in the sand and held the crude yet effective mithril blood purifier with both hands. With his hands free, Link started casting the Higgs force field. He connected the entrance and exit tubes with a click. Then, he twisted the dirty filter off. Rommelson pointed at the mithril tube still connected to the princess's body and asked, What about this? The mithril tube is connected to Her Highness's artery. Without a priest, the wound won't be able to heal promptly, so I can't take it out for now. Hold it, and I'll anchor it on her ribs with a cloth. With that, Link pulled out a clean shirt from his dimensional storage gear and tore out a few strips. He lifted Milda's shirt and tied the tube tightly. After detoxifying, Milda's skin was different. It was dazzling white with pinkish breasts. Rommelson quickly looked away. Link moved as fast as possible too. He anchored the tube tightly and made sure it wouldn't move and damage Milda's artery. Then, he quickly pulled her shirt down. Done. Do you have elf nectar? Link asked. Yes, 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 I have a bottle, Rommelson answered quickly. Good. Feed it to Her Highness to replenish her fading vitality. Okay, okay, Rommelson answered. He pulled out a beautiful crystal bottle filled with purplish emerald liquid. Link lightly pinched Milda's chin and throat. Her mouth opened subconsciously, and Rommelson carefully poured the elf nectar in. Milda was still unconscious and couldn't swallow. During this process, Link used the magician's hand to close her windpipe. After a full five minutes, the mere 50 milliliter bottle of elf nectar dripped into Milda's stomach. Rommelson was covered in sweat when they finished. The elf nectar was definitely powerful. Without the gray blood poison's restrictions, it was fully effective. Milda's pallor recovered visibly, her breathing became stronger as well. Link opened Milda's eyes and saw that the pupils were pale purple again. He used the flash spell and the pupils restricted immediately. This meant it responded to the light. Fully relieved, Link said, good, she won't die. However, she'll be very weak for a long time. Rommelson wiped the sweat from his forehead and sighed. He mumbled, as long as she's alive, as long as she's alive. It was okay if she was weak. The high elves had tons of ways to restore her health. Link cast the levitation spell on Milda again and helped her up with the magician's hand. He said, summon your unicorn. Let's go back to Scorched Ridge. Okay, no problem. Rommelson obeyed Link's orders without any temper. He summoned his unicorn and used the magician's hand to gently place Milda on the beast's back. Link also summoned his wind Fenrir and they started back. After 300 feet, Link turned back. He saw Vance in the shadow by the beach and smiled. Subtly, he made some complex hand gestures to the lich, saying, Thanks, I'll come find you after I settle these matters. Vance reached out his skeletal hand and gestured that he understood. Then, he retreated and disappeared into the shadows. Nothing happened on the way back. The two men reached Scorched Ridge without any obstacles. In the camp, the corpses all over the ground had been gathered. Occasionally, there were sniffles and cries but the fire was put out, and order was reinstated. Seeing Link return, Jacker welcomed him. Lord. Link nodded. Good job, but there's something else. Please tell me. Link pulled out his wand and a sheepskin parchment. He pointed the wand at the parchment and activated a level, one magic image. A few seconds later, a clear image of the lead assassin appeared on the parchment. His two daggers were especially detailed, practically identical to the original. 
Link then used the copy spell to write down the leader's specific characteristics, going into more detail about his weapon. He even wrote down the special effects. In the end, Link gave Jacker the parchment. He is the culprit who attacked the territory, a powerful level 7 assassin. Release an announcement that he's wanted. Those who can provide accurate information will be rewarded 100 gold. Anyone who can kill him will get 10,000 gold. One of his weapons is 20,000 gold. Jacker gasped. Lord, isn't that too much? This would be the highest reward money in the history of firemen. It's not too much. Anyone who can kill this assassin is worth the money. Link saw that Jacker had more to say and waved his hand. Don't. I've already decided. He had an idea of what had happened. The Syndicate of the South and the Dark Elves of the North had schemed together against his territory. It was a very good move. They publicly declared war on him. However, both the Syndicate and the Dark Elves seemed to have forgotten that the world was not so simple. The Syndicate did not own the South either. There would always be a powerful solo warrior, there would always be powerful mercenaries. If he provided an extremely high reward, someone would do everything for the money. Seeing Link like that, Jacker remembered that they'd discovered a clay mine in the territory and had more money than they could spend. He had no need to argue any more and nodded. I'll do it this instant. Link nodded. He turned to Rommelson and said, Let's go find a priest. Scorched Ridge may be small, but it had everything. There was already a small church with a mid level priest. When they arrived at the church, the priest saw that it was the Lord and the patient was the high elf princess, so he naturally worked as hard as he could. Half an hour later, Milda's outer wounds were mostly healed. The mithril tube was removed as well. Afterwards, Rommelson took Milda to rest. This was the high elves' business, so Link didn't bother them after arranging their lodging and guards. Rather than going to rest himself, he started taking care of the other matters. He worked deep into the night until two in the morning. Finally, everything was settled, and peace started settling in Scorched Ridge again. Huff, huff. A black shadow sprinted across Ferd Wilderness, not stopping until he had run ten miles. He panted heavily. It was the lead assassin who had escaped earlier. The previous battle seemed easy, but actually, he had always been hanging by a thread. He had used all his might in every second. After a short rest, he heard something beside him but didn't sense any danger. Looking up, he saw the dark elf magician. Here for the show. He was a bit angered. He wouldn't have lost if this magician hadn't helped earlier. You must be blaming me, right? The magician chuckled. The assassin was furious. Humph, you're still laughing now. The magician sighed. It's great news that you escaped alive. Of course I should laugh. The assassin huffed. But if you helped, my men would still be alive. We could have killed the high elf princess too. The dark elf magician shook his head. No, you're wrong. If I joined, we might have been able to kill the High Elf Princess, but then Link would have been freed too. Then you would realize that you're faced with a Demon King. We would have died in that wilderness. The leader winced, he hadn't thought about this. He was only thinking of killing the princess and didn't consider Link's potential revenge afterward. During the fight, Link seemed to have been treating the princess the entire time. Despite that, he was still able to easily stop the fatal attacks. The assassin thought of Link's track record he'd heard rumors of. If Link had fought freely, the assassin shuddered. He truly had been careless. When he snapped out of it, the dark magician continued, I'm here to remind you that Link will definitely take revenge when he returns. If I were him, I'd announce a great reward to catch you. For example, 5,000 gold for your head. How many people do you think would go crazy for that? The assassin paled. Trying to stay strong, he said, let me see who dares to accept the challenge. I'll kill anyone who comes. What if they come in tens or hundreds? The assassin gulped. He sighed and said to the dark elf, thanks for the reminder. I'll go hide now. With that, he started flying to the south without stop. Seeing the assassin disappear into the dark night, the dark elf magician sighed. The mission still failed. That link is so difficult. He had to return to the north promptly as well. The Dark Serpent did not have much more time left in Fireman. 
the victor of the Northern War must be decided. Chapter 257 It's a shame you are not a high elf. Furred Wilderness These few days, news about the Furred Wilderness spread around like wildfire. The most popular one was not the one regarding the ambush, but rather, the outrageous compensation the Lord of the Furred Wilderness was offering. The head of the assassin was worth 10,000 gold coins while his weapon was worth a whopping 20,000 gold coins. This news was like a red-hot iron being thrown into a bucket of cold water. It exploded and splattered across the Norton Kingdom swiftly, reaching the ears of even the most elusive people. A huge crowd gathered in front of the bulletin board outside Scorched Ridge every day, commenting on the rewards. It would be a wonder if the assassin can stay alive after this declaration. I will feel safe staying in this place. I bet there will be someone sending his head over in a month's time. One month is way too long, half a month is more than sufficient. If I had any battling skills, I would definitely hunt him down as well. These discussions happened every moment throughout the day. Anyone who set foot on the territory would first and foremost be attracted by this notice. The residents of the Scorched Ridge prided themselves on this aspect of their land. This also greatly reduced the negative implications the ambush had on the reputation of the territory. However, it was still the truth that the territory was ambushed by an enemy. Such a thing must not happen again. The day after the ambush, Gildern rigorously sieved out the syndicate spies from the mercenary band. The magicians also doubled the construction speed of the mage tower. High Elf Rommelson also joined the team to facilitate the process. In return, Link also increased the commission for the magicians. Under the efforts of the magicians, the mage tower seemed to have a new look every day. With this speed, the mage tower should be completed in half a month's time. As for Link, he dedicated two hours a day to deal with the administrative things regarding his territory. He then spent the rest of his time experimenting with magic, especially the theories regarding the construction of a magic puppet. The third day after the ambush, Link was studying theories regarding magic puppet construction in the top level of the administrative building as usual. These few days, he delved deeper into the theories written in the heart of the puppet and Vance's theory of magic puppet. After combining the wisdom from both books, a magic puppet theory unique to his own understanding was slowly forming in his mind. But it still wasn't enough. I don't have enough relevant books regarding this field. If I am able to read more theories regarding magic puppets and extract the essence of their theories, that would be great. The wisdom of the predecessors was necessary in order to attain greater heights. Link was now eager to attain this wisdom. Unfortunately, the magic foundation of the human race was way too weak. Link was already at the peak of knowledge and strength in the human race, only second to magician Bryant. Link then heard someone knocking at the door. Link frowned as he checked the time. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. He had instructed his servants to let no one disturb him during this period. What happened? Is there something wrong? Sir, Princess Milda is awake and wishes to see you. The voice of a young girl sounded outside the door. Link remembered this voice. It belonged to a female servant which he specially assigned to Milda. It was his duty to pay Milda a visit when she woke up. Link then put away his magic book and opened the door before saying, let's go. The princess had to be given special treatment everywhere she went. Princess Milda lived in the only house built from stone in the entire territory. This was a house which Link commissioned the magicians to build just for the purpose of Milda's visit. It was a two-story villa and had a large balcony and a small garden. Link passed through the small garden that was built in a rush and entered the villa before finally reaching the bedroom on the second floor. In the bedroom, Milda leaned her back against the bed frame as a servant carefully fed her meat soup. As she saw Link walking into the room, she smiled and pointed to the chair not far away from the bed, whispering, sit. Link sat down and observed Milda's face. As compared to the first day when he saw her, she still appeared pale, and her eyes were dim and lifeless. She wore plain white pajamas and let loose her golden brown hair. Without the overwhelming presence of a high elf princess, she looked more like a girl next door. Of course, the features of this girl next door were too delicate and gorgeous to be true. I have some things I wish to speak with Lord Link alone. Milda waved her hands at the two servants who bowed slightly before leaving the room and closing the door behind them. Silence took over the room for a few seconds before Link said out of courtesy, I'm glad to see the princess in good health. 
To his surprise, the moment he said those words, Milda chuckled and said, Are you truly glad? Link, I actually woke up way earlier this morning. Rommelson had already told me the whole story. I'm afraid that in your eyes, I am merely a princess whom you can let go any time you want. Link lifted his head to look at Milda in shock. He realized that she was also staring right at him, her pair of amethyst eyes shining with sarcasm. Link was also not surprised by those words. When he made that choice, he had also predicted that this would happen. He did not make any excuses for himself, but merely changed the topic of the conversation, Your Highness, your reason for summoning me is. Princess Milda sighed helplessly upon seeing his reaction. She had complicated feelings towards this magician. She had great respect for his magic talent and was grateful to him for saving her life. However, she was also depressed at his previous choice, although she could totally understand his perspective as the princess of the high elf race. Her political education from young had informed her that Link's decision was the correct one. If she were in charge of the situation, she would have done the same. Though, she would never have accomplished it nearly as perfect as Link did. I apologize for my actions that night. I should not have suspected you. In the end, Milda said an unexpected line. Link then looked at Milda in shock. From her reaction that day, he thought Milda was just like Rommelson, merely a fledgling young magician who had no experience in dealing with issues. Her sarcasm just moments ago further confirmed his suspicions. However, her sudden apology had reversed Link's negative impression of her. She seems to be slightly more mature than that brat Rommelson. Link had a slightly better impression of Milda now. You don't have to apologize. If I had encountered such a situation, I would not have trusted the other party as well, Link said. Indeed, but you never would have left in a fit like I did. Milda had a self-loathing expression when she said this. If you had encountered the same situation, you would not reveal any signs of dissatisfaction or distrust. You would even show support for the other party. If it was a misunderstanding, the other part would be grateful for your trust, and even if the other party had indeed dabbled in dark magic, your trust and support would have won you a good reputation. Others would then recognize your character, am I right? Link thought for a moment before nodding. If he was really caught up in that situation, he would settle it as per what Milda had said. It might seem silly to trust someone unconditionally. However, this was actually a smart investment. As long as one invested enough in self-protection and strategized carefully, they would become the ultimate winner in this exchange. Using this strategy would gain you more loyal allies the further you down the road of power. On the contrary, Milda's actions looked shrewd and applaudable at first glance. However, if she continued on this path, her allies would slowly reduce in size, and she would eventually be left alone. The difference between these two choices laid in the magnanimity of the person. After a long sigh, Milda said with a depressed expression, You are not like me. Not only did I offend you, I even caused Latour to lose his life. Even I almost died in that incident. I feel horrible looking back at my actions. It was impossible for Link to reply to this statement. After some thought, he could only comfort, everyone makes mistakes. It will be fine as long as we change for the better. Milda laughed as she said, Look, you always make the best choice. When you first entered this room, I was enraged at your decision and could not help but ridicule you with my sarcastic tone despite the fact that I knew it was wrong. However, you did nothing as such. You still saved me in the end even though I suspected you. You comforted me even when I was rude to you just moments ago. I am extremely curious. Don't you have any emotions at all? Link frowned. He did not wish to be talking about such superfluous things with Milda. He then said, Your Highness, did you call me in here just to say all this? He nearly said the word, nonsense, before he stopped himself. Milda's smile grew even brighter upon seeing his expression, it seems like you still have emotions. You are just not going to hold it against a young and inexperienced girl like me. All right then, I will stop spouting nonsense. This is what I want to say. I feel that you are a reliable ally worthy of the strong support of the High Elves. Link raised his eyebrows. This was a result he did not expect. You are surprised, yes. It was truly something I didn't expect. Link was surprised at the sudden maturity of this young girl. Milda then said softly, My mother once said to me that if the High Elves wished to stay strong forever, we would need a reliable ally. 
A true reliable ally is not one who stays loyal to you indefinitely, as those people simply do not exist. Reliable allies are those that can benefit from a mutual cooperation and have a common interest. This is the only way a cooperation can last long. You are the person I am looking for. Cooperation between races had never been a one-sided connection or a highly imbalanced exchange. Even if it existed, there was bound to be suspicion and fury after some time. Link then nodded as he commended, You mother is truly wise. As Link brought up her mother, Milda's face lit up with pride. She continued, You are a perfect magician. I heard that you have been studying magic most of the time during the day. Indeed. Milda then laughed as she said, I will put this bluntly. While the human race does have some interesting magic, the magic you have in general is still crass and vulgar. You guys don't even possess a complete level 8 magic book. Even if you have exceptional magic talent, you can at most reach level 7 in strength. Link felt that something huge was happening and he straightened his body to look at Milda. Milda stared at him as she straightened her body and curled her lips slightly before saying, Hence, I invite you for a trip to the Isle of Dawn. We have a magic library on the island which contains the magic knowledge my race has accumulated throughout the years. When you are free, you can stay there for around, three months. Link was truly touched by this offer. His eyes lit up as he bowed to Milda respectfully before saying, I am extremely honored. Milda then took out another magic book named Freedom and Puppet. This is a book written by the legendary magician of our race, Raphael. It is a book regarding the workings of the magic puppet. You might need it. Link was elated and immediately flipped open the book as he received it. After merely a few pages, he felt that the book was filled with undiscovered knowledge he had never imagined possible. However, he also had a question. Your Highness, why do you have so many magic books with you? Milda then smiled as she said, I actually brought a mini library with me. I have many copies of famous magic books back on the Isle of Dawn. Link was extremely envious of Milda's accessibility to knowledge. The High Elves were truly a race that built their foundation on magic. Not only did they possess a vast amount of magical knowledge, but they also possessed a lot more magic books than the human race. Milda could not help but chuckle at Link's expression, as she said, Link, it is such a waste that you are not a high elf. If not, you would definitely become one of the greatest magicians in the history of our race. Link merely dismissed her last sentence as it was impossible for him to ever become a high elf. He was already eager to delve into the mysteries of the magic book he just received. After asking Milda to take good care of her body, he was prepared to leave immediately and go back to his study room. Milda then added, I have at least ten more books regarding magic puppets over here. You can exchange it with me after you are done with that one. The information regarding the divine gear has already been passed on to Isle of Dawn by a messenger. I will be staying here to recuperate for some time. Link once again thanked her for her generosity before hurrying away. Milda then got down from her bed and walked to the window beside her bed, keeping her gaze on Link until he was no longer in sight. She sighed once again, what a waste that you are not a high elf. Chapter 258, Potentially an Unbeatable Monster After receiving a new magic book, Link was like fish in water. For the next few days, he spent almost all his time on the book Freedom and the Puppet. He practically forgot to sleep and eat. Celine was unrestricted and could disturb him while he was studying magic spells, but he closed his door to everyone else. The morning three days later, Link had flipped to the last page. He had pretty much figured out the entire book. This is such fine and flawless wisdom, but there's not enough, Link sighed sadly. He picked up the book, ready to look for Milda and exchange for another one. He was completely obsessed with the puppet theory. After finishing this one, he had his eyes on the other nine books Milda had. If he didn't read them, he would feel something missing from him. Just as he went to open the door, someone knocked on it. Tuck tuck, tuck tuck. The rhythmic tapping meant that it was Celine. Link walked quickly and opened the door. He was in a good mood, seeing Celine's lovely face, his mood became even better. Smiling, he said, My dear, how can I help you? It was the first time Link used such an affectionate term. Surprised, Celine blushed and whined. Go away. I'm not your dear. She looked inside the room. Seeing that the book wasn't on the table, she asked, Are you busy now? I'm free. 
Link moved to the side with a smile, letting Celine in. Once inside, Celine took out her basic wand and said, For some reason, my power is increasing faster and faster. With that, there was a mana influx in her wand. It merely rushed in without constructing any mana structures, but Link was affected by it. He was shaken. Wow, it's only been one week, and her power has doubled, Link thought, amazed. Soul Dominator bloodlines were truly powerful. Seeing Link's surprise, Celine was a bit proud. She giggled and said, that's not it. My premonitions are getting stronger too. Instead of long-term premonitions, they're short-term, like some really weird gut feeling. Like just now, I was outside and thought that you would be free, so I knocked on the door. Huh. This ability was curious. Link couldn't figure it out, but after thinking for a bit, he pulled out a gold coin. He said, I'll toss it and guess heads or tails. Heads. Celine's answer was definite. Link tossed the coin, and it fell to the ground half a second later. It rolled and landed heads up. It may have been lucky so Link tried again and again. He tried ten times, and Celine was guessed correctly each time without any hesitation. This was probably a short-term predictive ability, and she was completely accurate too. The ability was very powerful. However, since it was short-term, there should be a time limit. Link tried something else, still using the coin. This time, I'll toss it five seconds after you guess. Try it. But Celine shook her head. I can't. There's no feeling. Just guess. Then tails. Link waited five seconds and tossed. The coin dropped onto the table with a clink, spun, and landed heads up. He tried this ten times again, but Celine was only right four times. Her rate was about fifty to fifty, just like the average man. Link reduced the time, going from four seconds to three, then two. Finally, Celine's feeling came back at 1.5 seconds. Her accuracy shot up to 100%. This meant that she could guess anything that would happen within 1.5 seconds with almost 100% accuracy. Of course, guessing heads or tails was simple. If it was a more complex matter, the time might decrease further. Link tried other tests. In the end, he concluded that Celine could choose correctly between two options if the time frame was 1.5 seconds. If there were more choices, such as 3, 4, or even 10, the time frame went from 1.5 seconds to around 0.5 seconds. More complicated guesses were still maintained at 0.5 seconds. This meant that Celine could accurately predict anything that happened within 0.5 seconds. Half a second was short, and she couldn't do much to change the big picture. However, if one had this ability in a fight, one's combat power would at least double. If trained well, Celine could become an unbeatable monster. Awesome. Awesome. Link praised repeatedly. He spun Celine in the air and then studied her as if looking at a rare treasure. A little shy, Celine said awkwardly, Actually, there's something else. Tell me, Link said. I don't have any power now, and it feels weird. Would you like to learn magic with me? Link's eyes brightened even more. A magician with short-term predictive abilities would honestly be unbeatable in battle. If he could have this ability, he would be invincible. Celine shook her head furiously. No, no. I have mana talent, and I can learn some basic spells, but when I look at advanced books, my head hurts. I think I'm better as a warrior or something but definitely not a magician. Link was disappointed, but he understood Celine's interests. He knew she wasn't suitable for learning magic. Pondering, he asked, Do you have any thoughts? Celine furrowed her brows. I, I haven't thought much, but I don't want to be like now. When the assassins attacked, I could only stand to the side. I couldn't help you and had to be protected. I don't like this feeling at all. Oh, then you think over it, and I'll help you think too. Link started wondering what Celine should do. It should be a professional that was safe and didn't require killing people directly. It had to take advantage of Celine's talent as well. It would be best if she could develop combat power quickly without needing any difficult training. This was a lot of requirements. Link racked his mind, and suddenly, an idea popped up. The Yabba race has a type of magic pistol. It's really destructive, and I've seen it before. The structure isn't that difficult, so I can make one. 
How about I make you a magic pistol? Celine thought it over, and her eyes brightened. Her blush cheeks were so cute. That's a great idea. Please help me make a magic pistol. It has to be accurate and powerful. It's on me. You'll definitely be satisfied, Link promised. Link wouldn't dare brag about other weapons, but for pistols, he could use memories from Earth for reference. There were a bunch of enchantments he could use too. If he couldn't make something incredibly awesome with all that, he should just jump off a cliff. Celine smiled brightly. Link's enchantments were renowned throughout Fireman. Since he promised, this magic pistol would definitely be powerful. Actually, ever since the Storm Lord sealed the demonic power in Celine's body, her personality became brighter, and she loved to smile. Whenever she smiled, her eyes would turn into crescents. Her lips were pink and plump, bright and beautiful. Seeing it, Link became happy. He couldn't stop himself from pulling Celine into a hug. Celine froze. At first, she was tense, but she quickly softened. She didn't protest, but her face was as red as a tomato. The two hugged quietly, enjoying the sweet serenity. After a long while, Link unwillingly let go. Smiling, he said, I'm going to find Princess Milda for another book. Your magic pistol, how about three days? I'll find time these three days to make it. Celine shook her head. No need to hurry. Wait until you're free to do it. I need to start working out again too. Hearing this, Link suddenly thought of the epic battle art he had taught Jacker and the others. Hitting his forehead, he said, your body leans more toward the water element. I have an epic battle art for the water element. Take it to practice but don't work too hard. Celine giggled. I was waiting for that. Give me the battle art. Link placed the book in her cream-colored hands. They shared another moment, and then Link kissed Celine's forehead before leaving. As for the magic pistol, he decided to start on it as soon as he exchanged the book. When he reached the stone house, Link saw Milda working in the small garden. She had recovered well. She was still weak but could do some light physical work. Planting flowers and such helped her recover even faster. She saw Link and took off her dirty gloves. Smiling, she asked, What, you finished the book? Indeed. Link returned freedom and the puppet to Milda. I want to get another one. Milda was straightforward. She took out a book with a purple cover. The title was 129 Ways to Connect Joints. Rather than a theory book, this was an explanation of specific techniques. Link accepted it, thanked her profusely, and turned to leave. Hey, not so fast, Milda called out. How can I help you? Link's attention was already on the new book. Seeing him like this, Milda sighed. She asked, I heard you accepted a disciple called Rylai. Link smacked his forehead. He had been so busy these days that he practically forgot about Rylai. He was honestly an irresponsible teacher. Indeed, Link admitted, a bit guilty. Milda shook her head. Oh, you're really wasting her high talent. She spends all her days frolicking with the Wind Tiger. I see that you're too busy while I have nothing to do so why don't you let her study with me? This was great news. Link quickly agreed. Okay, go do what you need. I'll tell her myself. Link left quickly, unwilling to waste any time. Looking at his back, Milda shook her head again. No wonder he's accomplished. He's obsessed with learning. On the other hand, Link had forgotten all about Milda. When he returned to the cabin, he flipped through the new book and scanned it roughly. Then he took out papers and pens to sketch the blueprint of the magic pistol. This was for Celine. He had to do his best. Chapter 259 A Huge Fire Gun for the Beloved In the world of firemen, the small-built Yabas were known to be extremely adept in their handicrafts. They were the experts at engineering, and amongst their many ingenuity, the magic pistol was one of their greatest inventions. Although they would strictly be categorized under the gun category as well, the construction of a magic pistol was ten times more complex than a normal gun on earth. Naturally, the firepower of the magic gun also put the gun on earth to shame. Link had already reached a level of his own in the area of enchanting magic. He was undoubtedly the best within the human race when it came to enchanting. Even Master Enchanter Weissmuller in East Cove Higher Magic Academy could not compare. 
he would naturally have no problem crafting a magic pistol. After thinking for a moment, he had a rough idea in his mind and began sketching the blueprint for the magic gun. This magic pistol needed to have strong firepower and simple controls. It should also be reliable and should not fail under any environment or circumstances. Most importantly, it must be safe for use. These were all basic requirements for the magic pistol. Link then tried to recall the appearance of those powerful sniper rifles on Earth as he sketched the first blueprint. The first step of the process was simple enough, Link completed it within 10 minutes. Following which, he then started revising his blueprint according to the magic principles in the world of Fireman. Although Selene has a dimensional pendant, it is not really safe to put a weapon inside it. It would be a tragedy if the dimension collapses with the weapon still in it. Hence, this pistol will have to be portable. It must be small in size, meaning that the barrel has to be short. If I want to maintain the firepower while reducing the length of the barrel, I will have to improve the fire elemental pressure within the barrel, this way, the material requirements for the pistol will be pretty high. Link had planned to create a magic pistol that could forcefully blast its way through a level 6 defensive spell. This way, it would even be possible to blast through a level 7 defensive spell if coupled with a special type of anti-magic bullets. He would need an extremely strong barrel to withstand such tremendous firepower. Link then recalled the materials he had in his storage and finally wrote a note on the side of his blueprint, Mysteria Gold. Mysteria Gold. Epic Quality. Effect, Incredible Strength and Can Withstand High Temperatures. Has near-perfect resistance to magic and performs well as a vessel for magic runes. Note, this metal is made using transformation magic and is extremely valuable. Vance had three blocks of Mysteria Gold in his storage. They totaled 15 pounds, and they were so rare that their price on the market could not even be estimated. It was more than enough to create just a single barrel. The barrel is the first step. The rune formation on the pistol is the second step. It must be made using a reliable material. This material also cannot conflict with the properties of the Mysteria Gold. What should I use? After a few minutes, Link then wrote down another main material on the blueprint, Shattered Star Thorium. Shattered Star Thorium. Epic quality. Effect, an extremely powerful magic conductor. It is the perfect neutral material. This was a metal that was of the same grade as Fire Star Thorium. On the Hot Spring City Market, one gram of Shattered Star Thorium cost 987 gold coins. Link did not have a lot of these on hand he merely had 50 grams. Clearly, 50 grams of shattered star thorium was not sufficient, so Link decided to use these materials only on the most crucial parts. He would then use fire star thorium to fill in the rest. As such, Link wrote down the third material on the blueprint, fire star thorium. After he settled on the three main materials he would be using, the remaining things would be simple. He simply had to choose materials that complemented the qualities of the three main materials. Half an hour later, Link wrote down a list of materials. Although the rest of the materials were not as expensive as the first three main materials, they were also treasured items. The estimated total cost of the materials on the list was millions of gold coins. Alas, it was only an estimated price. No one would use gold coins to purchase these materials. For such ultra-high value materials, people usually trade for them by bartering. After confirming the materials, Link then started sketching the second version of the blueprint. This blueprint was more detailed than the first. Link took a total of three hours before he was done. It was dinner time by that time, and he took the blueprint to the dining area. This was a private dining area especially made for Link and Celine. When Link arrived, Celine was already waiting for him. He then passed her the blueprint and said, I intend to build a magic pistol based on this blueprint. See if you are satisfied with it. That's fast. Celine was elated and immediately started observing the blueprint. In the blueprint, Link not only sketched the appearance of the product but also included the functions of each specific parts and structure. From Link's perspective, Celine should be able to understand it easily. After five to six minutes, Celine returned the blueprint to Link. It was difficult to tell if she was satisfied with the design. How is it? Link was actually quite nervous about Celine's opinion. If this scene was seen by the people from the mainland who quoted high prices for Link's equipment, they would definitely be bitter and dumbfounded. This was a weapon which Master Link had specially tailored, to think that he would be worried about his customer satisfaction level. 
Celine then laid out her hands and said, it looks beautiful, and I can roughly grasp the workings of the pistol. However, I do not have a good understanding of it and cannot determine the quality of a gun. I'll let you decide for me. All right then. Link probably read too much into it. After dinner, Link started revising the blueprint for the third time. He was extremely detailed this time around. Roughly four hours later, the third version of the blueprint was completed. It was already 10 o'clock at night by then. Link did not intend to give himself a break. He immediately pointed to the blueprint and asked the in-game system, can you begin the simulation? Yes, please confirm to begin the simulation. Confirm. The next moment, he saw a hologram of the magic pistol in front of him. It was translucent, and one could easily see the internal structure of the magic pistol. The magic pistol was around three feet in length and had a precision sight mounted on it. Link adopted the Yabba Race's Sorvata linkage structure to ensure the reliability of the sight. The exterior of the pistol had similarities to a sniper rifle on Earth. However, the style of the two guns was starkly different. The magic pistol had a large number of magic runes carved on its exterior, giving it a rustic aesthetic. Shooting simulation, Link said. The magic pistol had no trigger. It employed a touch sensor magic rune. When the rune carvings lit up, one could hear a light popping sound of a gun firing. The in-game system even simulated the sound of the gunshot. This was because Link had carefully adjusted the volume of the gunshot to a minimum. This would ensure that Celine's position would not be exposed after firing just the first bullet. After the sound reached his ears, Link slowed down the movement of the pistol in his field of vision. He could clearly see every single detail, the accumulation of fire elementals, the potential energy of the magic bullets, and how it rotated at high speed out of the gun chamber. The in-game system then reported the simulation results. Chamber speed is at 6,300 feet per second, and the bullet flame is hidden. The wind elemental magic formation is activated and gravity balance spell is activated, preliminary results estimate that the traveling distance of the bullet will be 5,900 feet. Any distance further than that and the bullet will start to veer in directions too complex for the system to predict. Link was pretty satisfied with this result. However, he still had no idea how reliable the pistol was. Simulate burst firing, 1,000 times, one shot per 0.5 seconds. Boom. Boom. The in-game system faithfully fulfilled Link's instructions as the bullets continuously fired from the chamber. At the shot number 532, a loud sound suddenly erupted from the chamber. It was a chamber explosion. In an instant, the accumulated fire elemental energy and the bullet fragments flew in all directions. Although this was only a simulation, one could tell the devastating force of this explosion. It was no weaker than an explosion from the flame blast spell. Link could not help but squint his eyes at this sight. This was too tragic. If Celine met such an accident while she was using the magic pistol, she would definitely be killed in the process. Getting killed by your own weapon was too much of a joke. Replay the chamber explosion process. Link then started analyzing the reasons for the chamber explosion and started making adjustments to the pistol. Luckily, the structure of a magic pistol was not that complicated. It merely took him half an hour to make those changes. Begin simulation. This time around, the pistol lasted a total of 900 shots before the chamber explosion happened. Link then continued refining the pistol and simulating it. He repeated this process again and again. Time flew and four hours passed in an instant. Link was just about to begin simulation after yet another round of adjustments. This time around, Link reduced the firepower of the magic pistol slightly. From Link's perspective, he could see the bullets being fired one after another, 100 to 200 to 300 and so on. This continued until the shot number 6932, where the chamber explosion finally happened. The situation after the chamber exploded was also vastly different. When the chamber explosion happened, a defensive spell seemed to appear on the magic pistol almost instantaneously. This magic enveloped the user in an instant, offering protection from the flames and metal fragments the user would be completely unharmed. Link was finally satisfied with the results. He felt slightly tired but was too lazy to return to his bedroom. He laid down on a shabby wooden table and fell asleep. In his semi-conscious state, he felt as though someone had entered the room. As he did not feel any sense of danger, 
he did not force himself up from the bed. Not long after, he felt a warm feeling spreading through his cold body. Someone had covered him with a blanket. There was a familiar fragrance in the air as well. Link knew that it was Celine and slept with a peace of mind. After a good night's rest, Link felt refreshed and started crafting the magic pistol right after he had his breakfast. The blueprint was already completed. Link acted fast. Due to his obsessive compulsive disorder, he had to make sure every part was perfect until he would decide to use them. Fortunately, Link was skilled in his enchanting techniques and did not spend too much time in the entire process. He started work in the morning, and by dusk, a brand new magic pistol had appeared in his hands. The magic pistol weighed 26 pounds and was 3 feet in length. The exterior was dark green in color and seemed inconspicuous at first glance. However, closer inspection would reveal a large number of magic runes, giving the pistol a heavy and reliable tone. It looked like a ferocious beast that could explode into a frenzy any moment. This magic pistol was probably the most non-aesthetic equipment Link had ever crafted. However, it was also the equipment with the greatest firepower. The in-game system then sent a message. Player Link has successfully crafted an epic quality magic pistol. Omni points plus 50, payable in 112 days, please name the weapon. Let's call it the huge fire gun. Link seriously had naming issues. Naming completed. Huge fire gun. Quality, epic. Shooting frequency, 0.3 seconds per shot. Penetration level, level 7. Note, Link's huge fire gun, a gift for his beloved. Link fell speechless looking at this information. Why would such decent equipment be paired with such a peculiar description by the system? Since the equipment was completed, it would have to be given to its owner. Link then took the gun and proceeded to approach Celine. However, the moment he opened the door, he saw Celine already lying in wait outside. She then smiled as she said, It seems like my premonitions were right. The gun is completed. Of course, have a look. Link gave the huge fire gun to Celine as though it were a treasure. Celine then took over the gun and observed it from all angles. She then shook her head and said, It looks ordinary enough. Is it really powerful? Link was dumbfounded. His ability and reputation were at stake. He would not tolerate this. We will test out the gun right now. Chapter 260 Disorder in the South Furred Wilderness Woo, woo. There was the deep sound of the conch. In the furred sea pier, a flat sail cargo ship slowly approached the dock. The sailor at the bow sounded the horn, asking for permission to dock. A soldier ran on the pier while waving a bright command flag. Bit by bit, he guided the large ship to dock in the respective berth. Ten minutes later, the large ship about 150 feet long safety stopped in the pier's berth. With a whoosh, the plank was put up. The physical laborers rushed over, fighting for a chance to work. They were all farmers from the furred wilderness with land newly partitioned to them. However, it was off-season, so they all came to the pier to make some extra money. A buff sailor walked down from the ship. He pointed at some stronger men casually. You, you, and you guys, come and transport the goods. You get 100 coppers when it's done. The chosen laborers were overjoyed. They strode up the ship and started moving the goods on the deck. The sailors helped while maintaining order. After a while, the bottom cabin was opened. Countless young men and women in rags and shackles walked out. Look, it's the slaves the Lord bought. Look at that woman, the one with the torn shirt. Geez, her titties are so big and round. Wow, is that a warrior? He's so muscular. The laborers discussed the slaves while transporting the goods. On the other hand, the slaves were terrified. Some of the women carried babies who were crying and waiting to be nursed. Because they were in an unfamiliar environment, they hugged their mothers and howled. Occasionally, there was the crack of a whip from sailors forcing the slaves to hurry up. The pier instantly grew lively. Another plank was propped against the other end of the ship. A few well-dressed merchants walked down. The leader was Warder, the owner of the Green Leaf Merchant Firm. As the owner of the goods, he didn't have to oversee the unloading personally. After walking down the ship, he walked quickly to the pier office building. He said to the guard, I am Warder. I have an emergency and must see Sir Allison. 
Allison was the man in charge of the pier. Warder had interacted with him many times before. The guard recognized Warder too, so he moved aside. Sir Allison is in the second floor. Please go on ahead. Warder walked briskly. His steps were hurried, and his expression was somber. Finally, he reached the main hall of the second floor and saw Allison behind the business table. Allison used to be a mercenary. Due to his extraordinary abilities, he became a core member of Ferd and was sent to manage the new peer. He was only 30 years old and was in his prime. Right now, he was processing some documents speedily. When his subordinates asked questions, he could explain clearly within a few sentences. He was obviously a competent worker. Warter waited patiently at the side. When Allison finished with the task at hand, he walked over and said quietly, Sir. Recognizing him, Allison smiled and said, Oh, my friend, just call me Allison. Warter nodded and continued, I just came back from the kingdom of Delanga in the south. Something horrible happened in Delanga, and I'm afraid it might affect Ferd. Allison narrowed his eyes at Warder and asked, What exactly happened? The kingdom of Delanga was to the south of the Ferd wilderness with only the Blackwater River between them. If something happened in Delanga, Ferd would definitely be affected. Warder glanced around at the other people in the hall. He looked hesitant. Allison quickly waved. Come, let's go to my room. He rose and led the way out the hall, up to the third floor, and into the room overlooking the sea. Here, Warder pulled out a scroll to Allison. He said, the scroll contains a magic image. I bought it from an escaping court magician at a high price. The image recorded some secret things that happened among the Delanga royalty. Allison opened the scroll. There was a very clear image recorded on it. Under the light, he could see that the location was in a secret room. There were seven or eight men, mostly magicians. One man had a gold crown. A magician with red eyes and a dark aura was bowing to him. What's this? Warder explained, the one with the crown is King Roy V of Delanga. According to the escaping court magician, the magician beside him had shocking dark waves. He promised to help King Roy create a secret army and the king agreed. Allison couldn't believe it. How can a magic image with such a secret be preserved? Is the court magician reliable? Very reliable. He actually is Master Amandal, the head magician of Delanga. After he felt something was amiss, he quietly escaped. When I saw him, he was being pursued and then he gave me this. Allison was quiet for a few minutes. Then he asked, this is very important. I'll take you to see the Lord. This was what Warder wanted. The Ferd wilderness was developing rapidly, and Link's reputation was rising. It was getting harder and harder for him, a mere merchant, to see him, which was why he came to ask Allison for help. The two left the building. Getting horses and a dozen guards, they hurried to Scorched Ridge, dozens of miles away. On the way, Allison asked, Warder, you've been going to the south a lot recently. How is the state of the Southern Trade Federation? Warder shook his head and sighed. There's unprecedented chaos. Delanga is being forced back by Southmoon, and Roy V has started sparing no costs. The Daska Kingdom is almost entirely controlled by the Syndicate and can barely survive. The Gaul Kingdom is corrupted. The officials will do anything for money, I remember that when I went to the South twenty years ago, I didn't need guards on the road. Now, I'm terrified when I go to the wilderness, and I don't even dare to go out at night. He sighed continuously. He had truly experienced the downfall of the South. Hearing this, Allison's expression darkened. Norton is also fighting with the Dark Elves. I heard that the North isn't doing well either. The military has already retreated to the Iron Wall defense line. It feels like the mainland fell into chaos so suddenly. How can it be like this? Maybe the world is ending. The merchant's brows were knitted. In a time of unrest, a man's life was like grass. No one wanted this situation, but for some reason, the world just became more and more of a mess. As an unimportant figure, Warder could only watch everything happen without being unable to help. Both fell silent for the rest of the journey. More than one hour later, they could see Scorched Ridge in the distance. Gazing at it, Warder sighed. The changes are so big. When I left last time, the Mage Tower only had its foundations. Now, you can see its general shape. 
and the camp looks like a small town now. No matter how the south was, the furred wilderness was still calm and peaceful. Everything was developing rapidly and prospering. For some reason, Warder felt much better. Allison looked a bit proud. This is only the surface. Let me tell you, even the High Elf Princess is staying here. A lot of powerful High Elf magicians are helping with the Mage Tower too. They all respect the Lord. Warder smiled. Our Lord is a smart and powerful man. When I was in Delanga, I saw many refugees from Ferd and guess what? What? Allison asked with a smile. They snuck back and then took their friends and family back to Ferd. Allison laughed out loud, and the guards laughed as well. The mood had lightened, and the group forged in light spirits. Three hundred feet ahead, there was a rock thirteen foot tall. Rocks were everywhere in the Ferd wilderness, there was nothing special about it. But then, the reddish rock suddenly exploded with a loud boom. The rock, almost thirty feet wide and thirteen feet high, cracked into two. Shards flew everywhere, and dust rose up to the sky. Careful, it's a magician's sneak attack. Raise your shields. Where? Where's the magician? Where are the archers? Archers. The procession panicked. Everyone was terrified as if they had run into a huge enemy. They looked side to side, trying to find the magician who had attacked. However, this was a prairie, and it was daytime, the vision was great. Everyone looked around but could not find the attacker. Warder was extremely frightened. He wiped at his sweat and asked quietly, What's going on? Who attacked? Allison was tense as well. He looked at the boulder that had been split by some power. He said in a wavering voice, I don't know, but it seems like he's really powerful. Warder rolled his eyes. He wasn't blind, it was obvious that the magician was powerful. The problem was, where was he? If they couldn't figure it out and there was another attack, they wouldn't even know how they died. Everyone stood rooted to the spot with their guards up but the magician didn't appear. The terrifying attack didn't come either. Just as Allison and Warder were at a loss, a soldier suddenly pointed at the road before them. Look, I think it's the Lord. They all looked up. Indeed, there was a magician clad in a dark red robe, covered in firelight, racing over on a horse. He had a person with him, a woman, to be specific. She wore leather armor and grasped a plain-looking dwarf gun. She looked happy. Allison looked closely and let out a sigh of relief. It truly is our lord. The one beside him is Selene, the affairs officer of the territory. What just happened was a misunderstanding. I knew there wouldn't be a magician attack near Scorched Ridge, Allison thought. Let's go to them. The group started off again, and the two parties quickly met. Sorry about that. I was testing the power of the spell, Link explained voluntarily. It's all right. The group shook their heads. Link went straight to the point. Allison, what are you doing away from the pier? Lucy had recommended Allison. He was hardworking, so Link naturally knew him. Allison pulled Warder over quickly and said, He has something to tell you. I was escorting him. Warder walked up and bowed. Lord, something terrible happened in Delanga. I must inform you about it. Link recognized Warder as well. The merchant had helped him greatly before, but they hadn't met recently. Link said, Tell me after we return to the camp. Chapter 261 Someone has completed the reward. In the hall of the administrative building. Link, Jacker, Lucy, Gildern, and Celine all had arrived at the hall. The magic projection merchant warder brought with him was placed on the table right in front of them. Link tapped his fingers lightly on the table and suddenly said, It is merely a magic projection that suggests Roy V might be in cahoots with dark magicians. However, this cannot prove that this incident indeed happened, unless we can find Amons himself. It was horrible news that Roy V was working with the dark magicians. This meant that his future behavior would become extremely unpredictable. He might even become a serial killer like the Dark Elves. The Furred Wilderness and the Delanga Kingdom were only separated by a body of water. If this magic projection was true, it meant that the Furred Wilderness had made a dangerous enemy out of the blue. The magic projection was extremely clear. The red-eyed magician looked familiar. His stature was 70% similar to Wavier, 
though Link still could not confirm his suspicions. It would be too hasty to jump to conclusions based on just a magic projection, especially when the issue was this serious. Gildern immediately said, My lord, we should set up a rescue team straight away and cross the Black River to rescue Magician Amandal from the Delonga Kingdom. He was already a level 4 archer and was in charge of the scout system in the Ferd Wilderness. This system was the equivalent of the MI3 of the Norton Kingdom. It was tasked with eliminating any spies and gathering of information. If needed, it would also be sent for rescue missions. After some consideration, Link nodded and agreed. He said, just do your best for this issue. Don't make our soldiers lose their lives over this matter. Time will tell us whether Roy V is truly working with the Dark Magicians. After which, Link then turned to Jacker and said, We have to defend against the possible attack from the Delonga Kingdom. It is time to expand the scale of our troops. Didn't another batch of slaves just arrive? Grab the strong ones to become our warriors. Yes, my lord. Link then stared at Merchant Warder and said, as you can see, my territory is still very empty when I have a large land area. Everything is under construction which requires a large number of resources and manpower. It is still too slow if you work alone. Perhaps you can find someone to cooperate with you. I can promise that all the goods transported to the Ferd Wilderness will be acquired at a price 20% higher than the average market price, as long as it is from a merchant firm that you recommended. Of course, the quality of the goods cannot be compromised. Link was not being generous by increasing the price of the goods he acquired by a good 20% of the original price. He was running out of time and by purchasing the goods at a premium, he would naturally be given the priority for these goods. If not for the profit margins, who would go out of their way to come to the furred wilderness? Upon hearing those words, Warder was elated and immediately patted his chest with confidence, saying, that is no problem. I will form a merchant alliance immediately after I leave and increase the speed of resource delivery. I promise that the delivery speed will increase tenfold in one month's time. You would also be getting ten times, no twenty times more slaves. Merchants chased profits for a living, for Link to have increased the profit margins by a good twenty percent, he would definitely get all the businesses in the region. Before he understood more about the situation, this was all the preparations Link could do. He then said, you guys can discuss the specific things later. Lucy, remember to send me a report after you are done. I understand, my lord. Lucy was becoming more capable by the day. She was now the administrative chief of the Ferd Wilderness. She was a truly strong, independent woman holding the reins. Link then stood up and left. In one swooping motion, everyone in the hall stood up to show their respect as Link left. They only sat down after he went out of sight and started discussing the specific details of the plan. As he exited the administrative building, Link gave a long sigh. He could feel that the world of firemen was slipping into the abyss at a terrifying speed. The powers of the darkness had already infiltrated into every single crack they could find. Link could not help but stare into the sky as he whispered, O oh God of Light! Herrera mentioned that I am your chosen one. Lady Fortuna thinks that I can save the world. However, can I really hold up this wheel of glory and brilliance that is sinking into the depths of despair? As expected, he received no answer. The ever-present sun in the sky still shone mercilessly onto the furred wilderness, bringing light and heat to the world. Link then sighed, feeling unconfident in his abilities. He then heard light footsteps behind him. He knew that Selene had snuck up behind him. He did not turn his body but merely stretched his hand backward. After a while, a small and warm hand held his fingers gently. Link, everything is going to be all right. No one can do this better than you can. She seemed to be able to guess Link's exact thoughts every single time. The soft whispers were like clear spring water surging into his heart, nourishing his tired and worried being. Link immediately felt better and grabbed Celine's hand with a bit more force. The smile once again appeared on his face as he asked, How is my huge fire gun? It is indeed powerful, but it is way too expensive. How much did those corium bullets cost? Not a lot. Just five hundred gold coins, Link said as he grinned. Selene was startled by this answer and swore not to use the gun that often anymore. Link then smiled as he said, while five hundred gold coins may seem like a lot of money, every bullet can help me eliminate a powerful enemy. If you think about it this way, it will be extremely worth it, isn't it? Selene hugged the huge fire gun tightly. 
Although she had only fired one shot, this weapon had already become her treasured possession. Upon listening to Link's words, she glanced at him before saying, How can you be sure that I will land every shot? You mean you can't? Link said while maintaining his warm smile. All right then, I will have to do some training. I will craft some training bullets for you. Each of them only requires ten gold coins. I assume that will be acceptable. Celine nodded her head. Ten gold coins per bullet was the limit for the price of a practice bullet. She would still have to concentrate during her practice sessions, striving to get acquainted with the workings of this gun using the least amount of bullets. Link did not idle for long as well. He soon went back to his own little magic hut and started using ordinary materials to craft a few training bullets. The structure of these bullets was simple. As Link was still unfamiliar with the process, he merely spent five minutes on each bullet. By the time Link reached the tenth bullet, his speed had increased to one bullet per minute. Alas, this was menial labor, and he quickly grew tired of it. Link still persevered through the process and managed to craft 100 bullets in one sitting before he stopped. Good marksmanship has to be trained using a large number of bullets. It's not possible for me to craft all the bullets Celine needs by myself. Luckily, the process of crafting these bullets is not complex. When the mage tower is completed, I will find a few helpers to do this task. With this thought, Link then handed the bullets over to Celine. Celine was naturally elated. After making sure that no one was looking, she gave Link a light peck on the forehead before heading over to train with her new batch of bullets. Link felt as though all his fatigue instantly dissipated with that single kiss. He returned back to his room and crafted yet another fifty bullets before stopping to rest and read the magic puppet book he had borrowed from Milda. Link was extremely focused when studying magic theories. Time seemed to pass extremely quickly when he was doing so. On average, Link could finish a book regarding magic puppet theory within a day and a half. He even had the spare time to craft fifty of those training bullets for Celine every day. Link had run out of books to read after ten days. However, by this time, his understanding of the magic puppet had already undergone a qualitative change. His view on the domain had also changed drastically. Half a month earlier, Vance's creation, Nana, was nearly a perfect warrior in Link's eyes. It seemed impossible to make her any better. However, now armed with a treasure trove of knowledge regarding magic puppets, Link had thought of nearly thirty ways to easily deal with Nana. Link had not gotten stronger. He simply saw many flaws in Nana that he could not notice before after broadening his horizons. It is time to find that old guy Vance. Link decided to take a trip to the coastline. Link was just about to return the final magic puppet book that Milda had lent him. However, when he reached his doorstep, he realized that the scorched ridge was exceptionally lively. There were also many people gathered around the east gate of the camp. Link even found Jacker amongst the crowd. What is happening? Link was curious and walked towards the commotion. Jacker saw Link and brushed aside the crowd to get closer. When he reached in front of Link, he pointed to a red-haired man in the crows and said, My lord, do you see that guy? Link nodded. This person was around twenty-seven years old and had shiny red hair. He was extremely handsome, especially the way his slender eyes squinted when he smiled. He had the presence and aura of a vagabond free-spirited individual. He had only been here for a while, but many young women were already attracted to him, casting him seductive glances every so often. His name is Skinors. He has completed your mission. Skinors. Link was slightly surprised. In the game, this person was extremely famous in the mid-late game period. He had many aliases such as the Red-Haired Flirt, the Lady Killer, King of the Assassins, Legendary Samurai, and so on. He was born to a noble family from the Daska Kingdom. However, he chose to give up his right to the inheritance and live a life roaming the world. His strength was formidable, and he was one of those who managed to attain the legendary status in the game. He still had room to grow even further when he died. His character was wild and free-spirited. He gained countless victories in battle and also gathered many negative rumors about his private life. Eventually, when the Lord of the Deep, Nozama descended into the world, he joined the Army of Light and infiltrated the Demon Fortress to gather information. However, due to him having a complicated relationship with a succubus, he exposed himself and was surrounded by demons. During the chaos of battle, 
Nozama managed to take advantage of one mistake he made and reduced him to a pile of mushy meat in just one attack. Well, it was not very noble to have died in that way if you were a well-known assassin. Link then carefully observed the assassin's aura. It did not take him long to have a gauge of his strength. Level 7 strength and extremely close to a breakthrough to level 8. He does not possess a huge amount of battle aura, though that which he possesses is very pure in nature. He is indeed qualified enough to kill the assassin leader. Skinors was extremely sensitive and immediately turned around. Upon seeing Link, he smiled heartily, revealing a neat row of glistening white teeth. He then bowed elegantly towards Link in the style of a noble and spoke in a charming tone, Ah, are you the lord of this land of light? It is an honor to meet you. Chapter 262, Time to Resurrect Nana, 1. Clink. Clink. There were two crisp sounds. Skinors tossed two fiery red daggers onto the ground before Link. They were the weapons that the lead assassin had used that night, the Reaper's gaze. The assassin's body was strange and was hard to kill. I could only burn it, but the daggers are special. It's enough to prove that I completed the mission, right? Skinor smiled, lips curled upward. He started displaying to the people his slightly evil good looks, making some of the women call out softly. Link activated the magician's hand. The daggers floated before him, and he nodded after studying them. Yes, they're his weapons. With that, he commanded Jacker before the hundreds of people, go find Lucy. I must keep my promise. The reward for killing the lead assassin was 10,000 gold. Each dagger provided was 20,000 gold. In total, he would receive 50,000 gold and Link prepared to give it without hesitation. Jacker was unwilling, but he couldn't go against Link. Sighing and complaining, he went to go find the territory's chief executive officer Lucy for the money. The spectators were shocked. This offer had spread throughout the entire mainland. Now, someone had surprisingly completed it, and the Lord fulfilled it without delay. In the Ferd wilderness, Lord Link had very high prestige. No one doubted he would fork out the money, especially after the discovery of the clay mine. Gods, it's happening. Our endless coins going to appear before my eyes, someone cried. Oh, I'm witnessing history in the making. Someone was prepared to take his hat off in respect. I have a question. How can he take all those coins away himself? I think I can help. Another man began thinking of how he could benefit a little. The people discussed amongst themselves, highly anticipating the huge sum of money. Hey, wait. Skinor suddenly called to Jacker. Then he smiled at Link and said, Lord, I trust your credibility and know you'll definitely fulfill the payment. But even though 50,000 gold is a lot, it's not really useful to me. Can I use another way to exchange for the reward money? Jacker stopped. He turned to Link, waiting for the command. Link actually wasn't surprised by the assassin's request. 50,000 gold was just a gimmick. For truly powerful men, there was nothing more useful than a powerful weapon or some kind of magic medicine. Not everyone liked gold coins. Too many of the powerful individuals, they only needed enough gold to survive. Skinors happened to be one of them. What would you like? I'll try my best. Link was very friendly. Skinors looked left and right. Seeing all the spectators, he said, let's find a quiet place to discuss in detail. Just us two, all right. It was obviously all right. Link turned to the side and put a hand out to guide Skinors. Let's go to my home. Skinors strode into Link's cabin, Link followed him. After he shut the door, the civilians all sighed sadly. They thought they would see the piles of gold, but they were let down. Inside the cabin, Skinors took in the furnishing of the cabin for a while before sighing involuntarily. You're a lord who can give away 50,000 gold as a reward, but you live in such a shoddy place. It seems like I made the right choice. Hearing this, Link was interested. In the past game, Skinors was a wandering vigilante type character. He was a bit of a playboy, but he didn't have any bad traits. He'd always been part of the light camp. Later, when darkness shrouded the mainland, he even joined the alliance against the dark army. If someone like that said these words, did it mean he was another talent who wanted to join him? But it didn't seem right. This guy never liked restraints. 
He liked going around for adventures and probably wouldn't become his subordinate. Then, why was he here? Link was curious. There's no one else here, Link said with a smile. You can tell me your request now. Skinorse nodded. He walked to Link's table and took out an old scroll, unfurling it on the table. This is a map of an ancient tomb that I came across by chance. I went to the ancient ruins alone to investigate and found that it's very dangerous there. It is filled with ghosts and strange creatures. I tried to enter but failed. The ghosts are very sensitive, so if you want to enter the ancient tomb, you must kill them all, killing your way in. So. Here, he looked at Link. His meaning was clear, he needed Link's help. Without responding to his plea, Link walked forward to study the map. It was drawn very clearly. The ancient tomb was in the Parmiso Plateau in the west of the South Moon Kingdom. It was called the Tomb of the Late King Taris. Seeing the surname Taris, related memories popped up in Link's mind. Turning towards Skinors, he asked, You said you saw many ghosts and creatures. Were they all very short and stocky? Ah, uh, yeah. They were all like that, short and stocky. How did you know? Skinors was pleasantly surprised. They're all dwarfs, Link explained. Taris is the surname of one of the royal dwarven families who disappeared in the Mana disaster 2000 years ago. The Taris royal family had the tradition of immolation burials. They would use a very cruel way to turn their guards into mummies. These mummies would become very powerful ghosts that would protect the tomb forever. In the game, this tomb was a dungeon quest that contained some ancient books. When Link got bored playing the dungeon, he would read through the books for fun. In this life, he had read many magic books, which contained history. He had a deep understanding of the Taris dynasty. Because of this, when he saw the word Taris, he was able to remember the background facts about the tomb. Though the information was shallow, it was enough to shock outsiders. Skinors chuckled in surprise. He reached out to pat Link's shoulder but felt it was unsuitable, so his hand shrank back. Ha, huh, I really found the right person. Lord, if you can help me, I can forget about the gold. Instead of saying whether he agreed or not, Link asked, just the two of us. We're probably not enough. The ghosts had matured for two thousand years. Now, they had terrifying power and had many unique attacks. In real life, they might even have unexpected tactics. Link didn't want to risk this. Skinors rubbed his hands excitedly. Hee hee, two isn't enough, but I also have two friends. One is a level six warrior, and the other is a genius priest. Oh, she's a beauty too. She's so good she can bring the dead to life. We just need a powerful magician now, so how about it? Interested. Unexpectedly, he had two aces, including a priest. Things were more reliable now. There would definitely be many good things in the tomb. Link remembered that the most valuable thing was an ore called crystallized sheet metal. Its element was very special, and it was a necessary material for creating legendary weapons. It was the only piece of metal like it in Fireman. Similarly, dwarves were an ancient race. They had a unique knowledge of magic. There were sole copies of some magic books in the tomb, each one was worth a fortune. It was definitely worth it to explore a tomb like this. Considering it, Link said, I can participate but merely offsetting the reward money isn't enough. I'm really busy, you know. PSH. Skinors felt slightly annoyed. He wanted to argue, but after thinking closely, he realized that the money truly wasn't enough to hire the renowned magician. This man could hand out 50,000 gold easily, he clearly didn't care about money. Then what do I need to do for you to agree? Skinors asked, throwing his hands up. I recently received a magic image. Link had been waiting for Skinors to ask this and he was well prepared. Taking out the magic image given by Warder, he gave it to Skinors. As you can see, the one with the crown is King Roy V of Delanga. He's working with dark magicians to create a powerful army with dark magic. This poses a huge threat to the Ferd wilderness. Skinors studied the image and asked, you want me to kill this dark magician? Can you do it? Link asked in return. It would be best if the dark magician could be killed. No. Skinor's expression grew somber. He stared at the dark magician in the image and said, 
this guy isn't a human, no, what I mean is he isn't from any of the intelligent creature on this world. His eyes tell me that he's already sold his soul to a demon god. Someone like that will definitely possess terrifying power. The dark aura around him proves this. I don't think I'm his opponent. Link nodded darkly after hearing this. He could see all this too, but Skinors could come up with so much with just a few glances. He was extraordinary. It's okay. As a lord, I must know the nearby threats clearly. I want to know the details of their alliance, what kind of power the army they create possesses, what weaknesses they have, all of that. At this point, Gildern and the others hadn't developed yet. When they ran into truly strong opponents, they were helpless. This was a sign that they had weak foundations and needed time to accumulate experiences. However, he still needed to do things. Now, a powerful assassin had offered himself to Link. He obviously had to take advantage of the situation. Skinors fell silent. After around three minutes, he nodded. I'll do it. Give me ten days. Link smiled, his eyes crinkling. No problem. Seeing him like that, Skinor suddenly realized that he'd fallen into the cunning lord's trap. This was a loss for him. He huffed unhappily and put away the reaper's gaze daggers. These daggers are pretty good. Since I'm helping you, I'm not going to give them to you anymore. Sure. They were just a set of epic daggers. If Link wanted to, he could make some whenever he wanted. They were no big deal. I'm leaving. Skinors was annoyed. He opened the door and left without another word. Just then, he saw Selene who was back from gun practice. His eyes brightened instantly, and all annoyance disappeared. Turning around enthusiastically, he asked Link, Hey lord, that girl's pretty. Hey, that face, that body, that grace, I've never seen someone like that before. Can I know her name, oh, she's walking towards me. Does she like me? Skinors was instantly excited. He fixed up his hair, straightened his collars, and tried to make himself look more attractive. Then the corners of his lips curled, he narrowed his eyes a bit, put a hand behind his back, and reached out the other one. He bowed like a gentleman to Selene, who was now before him. Beautiful miss, my pleasure to meet you, he said gently at the same time. As he spoke, he wanted to take Selene's hand to kiss. Selene was shocked. She moved to the side and walked past the assassin with a weird expression. Reaching Link's side, she said, Link, that guy looks weird. Is there something wrong with his brain? Link grasped Selene's hand to show that she was his and smiled. He's not like the average man. A man who could flirt while investigating demons was clearly in a different world than everyone else. Skinors was taken aback. He could see Link and Selene's relationship now and slapped his forehead. Lord, I'm sorry, I'll go work now, he apologized promptly. With that, he ran out of the cabin. He looked calm but inside, he was wailing, I'm so embarrassed. While sprinting, he passed by a stone house. There was a small garden, and it was exquisite that Skinors glanced at it subconsciously. Then he was stunned as if he was struck by lightning. How can there be such a beautiful girl, elf? Oh my god, is this Aphrodite? What's with Scorched Ridge? Ah, that girl looks good too. Skinors plastered on his mesmerizing smile again and instinctively wanted to go say hi, but he tripped over air and almost fell down. Hey, thankfully I'm skilled. This is nothing. In midair, Skinors adjusted his balance, ready to land with an attractive spin. The next instant, there was a thud, and he crashed. He rolled on the ground a couple of times and then landed face down. It wasn't that he wasn't skilled enough, but that he had been attacked by a magician, destroying his balance. Skinors hadn't sensed any bad intent, so he didn't dodge, resulting in this pathetic state. Then he heard a cold voice. A human must not offend her highness. Skinors turned around and saw a high elf magician glaring at him. He felt for the other's mana and realized, he was a level 7 master magician. Skinors turned back to the garden. The beautiful elf had taken the little girl into the house without even looking at him. Oh, it's the princess. Haha, sorry about that, sorry. Skinors climbed up quickly and patted the dust from his clothes. He apologized again and turned to leave. He seemed calm but inside, he was wailing, ah, this place is so unfriendly. 
it's not suitable for a beautiful man like me. The more he thought about it, the more embarrassed he felt. After leaving Scorched Ridge, he started sprinting. He didn't stop until Scorched Ridge was totally gone from his vision. On the other hand, Link didn't care about Skinor's misfortunes. Smiling, he asked, how's gun practice? Celine was in love with the pistol. Hearing the question, she grew proud. Pretty good. I can hit 9 out of 10 arrowhead seagulls within 1 mile. If I practice a few more days, I can easily get 10 out of 10. But mostly, this gun is so powerful. Arrowhead seagulls were a type of bird with extreme speed. They were agile as well. She was definitely a sharpshooter if she could hit 9 out of 10 within 1 mile. Seeing her animated features, Link was happy naturally. Nodding, he said, good, good. Come, I got you 100 more bullets. Take them to practice some more. The two shared a moment and then Link took out the broken magic puppet Nana. He started organizing the pieces one by one. Chapter 263, It is Time to Resurrect Nana, Part 2. Furred Wilderness, East Coast. The weather was excellent. A cool breeze swept through the beach as golden sun rays graced the world of firemen. There were many seagulls sunbathing on along the coastline, and in places where the tide did not reach, a lush layer of greenery took over. One could even see a few trees swaying in the relaxing breeze. Hey, old guy, it's time to wake up. The sun is up. Link walked towards the beach and lightly kicked a skeleton leg sticking out of the fine white sand. A few seconds later, a muffled sound sounded from beneath the sand, you came here alone. Are you not afraid that someone might be suspicious of what you are doing? Link was different from who he used to be. Now, every single one of his actions was carefully scrutinized. It would be impossible for him to hide his whereabouts even if he wanted to. This was the troubles an overachiever like Link faced. Link then smiled as he said, I came here together with Celine, in the name of practicing her marksmanship. Whoosh, a skeleton appeared from the ground as the fine white sand around him was cast aside. Vance then said in a sleepy tone, Marksmanship. What marksmanship? A sudden explosion on the surface of the water answered his question. This explosion traveled in a linear direction and only dissipated after skidding 150 feet across the water. Looking along the direction of this linear explosion, Vance saw a figure on top of a rock some distance away. Celine, who was clad in gray armor, was waving at him with a cap in her hand. In this period, Celine will be practicing her marksmanship here and also doubling up as our surveillance. You don't have to worry about anyone discovering us. All right then. That is good to know. Vance then stood up and put a black robe on himself. This way, even if someone had seen him together with Link from afar, Link would have room for explanation. Let's go. It is too open over here. It will be convenient to hold our conversation in the cave. Vance said as he headed towards the cave on the side of the coastline. Link then followed behind him as he said, Old guy, I have recently read many magic puppet books that belong to the High Elves. One of them mentioned something called a flesh magic puppet. This body is so genuine that ordinary people would never be able to tell the difference. Perhaps I can create one for you. Vance then waved his hands as he said, I simply like to lie on the beach and rest. I am not interested in the rest. Link then continued, this type of magic puppet has an extremely delicate and intricate body, allowing the user to enjoy everything that a living person can. You will once again be able to taste delicious food and feel the bitter cold and unbearable heat. You can even find yourself a lover. Before Link could complete his sentence, Vance stopped in his tracks and said, it is impossible for such a magic puppet to exist in the world. The reason for his disdain for life was exactly due to his inability to experience the senses that accompanied flesh and blood. He was also unwilling to fall to the dark side and gain pleasure from those sinister acts. Hence, he could only rest on the beach to kill time when he was free. However, with this intricate flesh magic puppet, he could once again enjoy the pleasures that accompanied flesh and blood. He had almost forgotten that feeling. He only remembered that it was a peculiar and wonderful feeling, something that he would do anything in exchange for. The human race is unable to do so. However, the high elves can. They have tens of thousands of years of experience with magic. Amongst these years, there have been countless prodigies which culminated into a vast treasure trove of wisdom. 
I already figured out the exact method to construct this magic puppet. That's enough. I want it. What should I do? Vance answered immediately. Link then said, I am not done. There is a price to pay for this body. What is it? I can pay any price, as long as I am able to. Firstly, this flesh magic puppet is extremely delicate. In order to reap the maximum benefits of this puppet, your soul would have to be completely fused with the puppet. This is the first step to attuning your senses with the puppet. This process is irreversible, that is, once you fuse your soul with the puppet, it would be impossible to draw your soul out again. Why would I want to come out of it after gaining back my senses? That is not a problem at all. Vance shouted. Another point. Link continued, due to the complete fusing of your soul, if the puppet was damaged in any way, your soul will also suffer the same amount of damage. You will die like any ordinary human. Unless you become powerful enough to ignite the sacred fire within yourself and become a god before you die, you will never gain eternal life again. There was a price to pay for all decisions, which was how the world of firemen maintained balance in the world. At that moment, only a divine gear could partially upset this balance. However, Vance showed no signs of hesitation. He merely chuckled and said, Currently, I am no different from being dead. To be able to enjoy the world with my full senses and experience a lifetime of joy again is worth the sacrifice. Link was not surprised at this decision and said, Then it's settled. When we are done with Nana, I will create that body for you. After entering the cave, Link realized that Vance had expanded the place since the last time he entered. It had already been transformed into a place more than 30 feet in diameter and 9 feet in height. It was even extremely cool inside. In the middle of the cave, was a large and smooth table made of stone. There were a few naturally formed holes directly on top of the table, allowing light to enter the cave. There were then a few refraction lenses placed strategically on the ground, refracting the light towards the direction of the stone table. The principle which this setup worked around was similar to that of the astral lamp on earth. A decent enchanting table, Link commended. I did it in my free time. All right then, I know that Nana is definitely damaged. Let me take a look at the pieces, Vance said. Link then took the metal pieces out from the dimensional pendant. Quickly the entire stone table was filled, and he said, she was damaged in the back by the dark serpent. Apart from her head remaining intact, the other parts were all smashed to smithereens. I have checked that the heart situated in her brain was only slightly damaged. We should be able to repair her. Vance merely observed the fragments on the table and stayed silent. He paid close attention to the pieces that were directly hit by the divine gear. It took him a long while before he shook his head and said, the power of a divine gear is truly amazing. Following which, he took Nana's head and cast the Higgs field spell on his hand. With just a little force, the exterior of Nana's head was removed, and a sapphire-colored crystal dropped out from the inside. This crystal was around the size of two fists and contained many runes within it. The runes were so dense that they looked like layers of seamless coating and cotton wool within the crystal from afar. Vance then reminisced, when I just created Nana, there were only over 1,000 rune circles within her heart. However, after my hundreds of years of study, the number of rune circles within the heart has increased tenfold. Take a look at these knots over here. These are all Nana's battle experiences over the years. I had observed it previously when I was making adjustments. Nana has defeated nearly 200 infiltrators in this past hundreds of years trying to protect my underground palace. One of her strongest opponents was a level 9 assassin. Look, it even recorded the name of the assassin. His name is Morpheus. Link was shocked. Morpheus. Wasn't that the leader of the syndicate? The person who had attained the legendary status and was extremely close to becoming a god, the Shadow Stalker. To think that he was defeated by Nana as well. Furthermore, he had not come back for revenge even after so many years. Although this may be due to Morpheus' preoccupation with other issues, this could also refer to Morpheus' fear of Nana. Nana's strength was truly amazing. Oh, look here, it's a crack. The heart was still damaged in some ways. But fortunately, it did not harm the core structure of the heart. I can repair this. As he spoke, a glow enveloped Vance's hand as he was prepared to repair the heart. However, he was interrupted by Link. Wait, there is no rush. 
Link then opened a large scroll on an empty space at the stone table. He then charged it with mana to activate it. With a humming sound, a clear hologram appeared on top of the scroll. It was a detailed structure of the heart of the puppet. Link pointed to the hologram and said, I have many new ideas. I feel that we can improve Nana through these methods. However, I have never put them into practice and am thus unsure about their feasibility. Can you help me take a look? Vance did not speak. He was already completely absorbed in the hologram right in front of his eyes. He circled the hologram again and again and carefully observed every rune formation within the heart. After a full half an hour, he pointed to an intricate structure and asked, I don't really get this part. What does it do? This is an intelligent structure that a high elf thought of. Its role would be to humanize the pure logical thought process of magic puppets, Link answered. Humanize. Vance was still slightly confused. Yes. Link nodded and continued, for example, if I ask Nana what is one plus one, she will only reply two and would give no other answers. However, after this intricate structure, Nana can choose to not answer such simple questions. Its greatest use is to prevent Nana from going into a trap of endless logical loop. Vance then went into deep thought as he whispered, endless loop. I did consider this and made some adjustments to Nana. However, it was not perfect. Your structure seems refined enough and should solve this issue completely. Amazing, truly amazing, the high elves are indeed geniuses. He then continued to observe the structure. Time flew quickly, and Vance was finally done with the structure after three hours. He then sighed as he said, Compared to your magic puppet heart, mine is almost like a sieve. It is full of holes, and I must be lucky that Nana survived to this day. Link then shook his head and said, That is an overstatement. Nana's true strength lies in her battle experience over the past hundreds of years. That is the true priceless treasure. The rest are only parts that complement this aspect. The structure that I developed is also merely meant to help Nana fully utilize her strongest advantage. As Link spoke, he brought out another scroll and charged it with mana. Before long, another hologram appeared in the air. This time, it was a blueprint of the structure of Nana's body. Vance then carefully observed it. His experience with magic puppet creation was rich, and he quickly discovered many flaws in the design. Link stood beside him and started making revisions to the design the moment Vance pointed out the flaws. Every so often, both of them would discuss ways to improve on the design. While Vance seemed like a depressed and unmotivated individual, he was also a prodigy of his times. Their exchange of ideas and thoughts progressed extremely smoothly. New ideas surged into their brains constantly like the bubbles ever present in boiling water. The flaws were quickly taken care of by both of them. Time flew, and the sky darkened. Link had to return to his territory. Vance then said in disappointment, It has been a long time since I felt such joy. Alas, I was born one thousand years too early. If you were present at that time, I would not have to go through that much pain researching into battle auras. Link also felt elated and said, We still have many issues that we have not settled. If I have nothing to do tomorrow, I will come at exactly ten o'clock in the morning. If I cannot make it on time, I will ask Celine to inform you in my place. All right, I already cannot wait for tomorrow to arrive, Vance said. After a short farewell, Link then left the cave by the coastline. Upon reaching the exit, he saw Celine practicing her sword craft on the beach. Link then got inspired by that scene, Celine's battle aura is still quite weak. Although the huge fire gun is strong, she will still be in danger if her hiding spot is exposed. She will need something that can protect her even in a close-ranged battle, a shotgun should be good. Link then decided to craft a pair of shotguns with high firepower for Celine when he was free. Link then greeted Celine who was completely focused on her practice and said, Let's go. All right. Celine then kept her sword. You have used up all your bullets? Link asked. It was just 150 bullets. I was done a long time ago. Celine laid her hands out helplessly. It felt extremely refreshing and exhilarating to shoot the gun. However, there was simply too few bullets. I will try to prepare more bullets for you tomorrow. Link said as he swore to find a simpler way to craft these bullets. It was too much of a chore to do the same things every day. All right, then, Celine said expectantly with a smile on her face. 
the coastline was not far from Scorched Ridge, the two of them quickly reached back to camp. By the time they reached the entrance, they saw Gildern walking towards them. Seeing the serious expression on Gildern's face, Link felt a shiver down his spine as he asked, What happened? Gildern then took out a letter and said, My lord, MI3 has delivered an emergency letter from the battlefield. There is a bloody sword logo on the front of the letter. Link was already a core member of the Norton Kingdom's upper echelon. He enjoyed the same clearance to information as Dean Anthony. He would receive a copy of any reports regarding the situation on the battlefield. If there is a logo of the bloody sword on the letter, it meant that the information in the letter was extremely important, to the point where it might change the tides of the battle. Gildern was aware of this fact as well. This meant that something that would adversely affect the results of the war in the North might have happened. Chapter 264, Secret Plans The emergency letter from the MI3 had a special magic seal targeted at Link's mana. Only Link could open it, if anyone else tried to damage it, the letter would self-destruct. This letter from the battlefield, Link could only read it by himself. He brought it back to his room and cast a silent barrier. Then, he lightly pressed his thumb to the letter, supplying his mana continuously. After around three seconds, the shimmering surface on the letter receded like a tide. The entire outer shell faded as well. Finally, the entire letter transformed into a light blue ball of light. It turned into a face that hovered quietly in the air. The face started mechanically reading the report. Recently, many fear demons were discovered in the northern black forest. These demons and ghouls appear in groups and work well together. Their combat power is many times higher than the ghoul teams from before. The MI3 suffered heavy casualties, and the Black Forest is practically sealed by the Dark Elves. We only know about 10% of what is happening there. There is heavy fog over the entire forest. To counter the possible attacks from the Divine Gear, the Pope and twelve archbishops of the Sacred City have already brought the Holy Grail north to the Arita Fortress. There was not much to report. After that, it added the exact date, showing that it was a report from two days ago. Afterward, the light forming the man's face scattered into faint light spots and disappeared in the air. It was only a few minutes, but it was like a dark cloud over Link. Had the Dark Elf started summoning Fear Demons? Fear Demon High-Level Demon Introduction, Number 28 on the High-Level Demon Combat Power Rank They are extremely powerful. In battle, they can instantly sense holes in the enemy's mindset and use strong psychological attacks to disrupt the enemy. In the game, the Dark Elves had destroyed Greenstone, and then used sacrifices to summon the Dark Serpent Divine Gear. Later, they moved south, fighting smoothly. That was why, five years later, the Light Confederation was formed and they started summoning large amounts of demons to fight against the attacks. The first type of demon summoned was the Fear Demon. But now, it was three years too soon. If the ghouls modified by the venom of the Dark Serpent were like cockroaches that couldn't be killed, the Fear Demons were battle masters with the characteristics of a cockroach. All the high-level demons from the Abyss had boundless vitality comparable to the ghouls. Because of the difficult environment of the Abyss, every demon who could survive had rich battle experiences. These demons were extremely powerful, especially high-level ones like the Fear Demons. Compared to the ghouls with raised strength but low experience, they could fight one against ten. Even more terrifying, the ghouls would definitely make these fear demons their commanders. This would make up for the ghouls' own lack of experience. This was so in reality. The report had said that the combat abilities of the ghoul teams had multiplied. No wonder the MI3 would be forced out of the Black Forest. In war, the most crucial thing was information. Now, the MI3 was unable to see anything in the Black Forest. They had no clue what the Dark Elves were doing. Even worse, there was no news on the actions of the Dark Serpent. If the Dark Elves wanted a surprise attack, the result was too horrible to imagine. However, the Light Church has put the Holy Grail into use. They should still have a chance to fight or at least delay the enemy. Link remembered the characteristics of the Holy Grail clearly. Holy Grail Sacred Gear Rank, 5 Effect 1, it activates a light territory up to 6 miles in diameter. Within this territory, all organisms of the light world will receive the light's blessing. The strength of all dark organisms will decrease by 80%. Effect 2, begins the holy summoning to summon Seraphim to fight in the mortal world. 
the light territory was almost tyrannical. The seraphim it could summon had legendary power, enough to make the dark elves fear for their lives and change their battle tactics. However, this was only an expedient solution. Sacred gears were not the same as divine gears. It could stop the dark elves for a while, but as time went on, the enemy would definitely think of a solution. Pondering, Link realized that he was unable to help with the war in the north anymore. He could only reinforce them in the background, no, he still had Nana. I can't keep procrastinating. I must complete Nana. Thinking of this, Link wanted to go to the seaside immediately and work with Vance to create Nana as soon as possible. However, he knew that as the Lord, it would be troublesome if someone discovered he was with a lich at a time like this. What should I do? What should I do? Link murmured to himself. He paced in the room, trying to come up with a perfect excuse that wouldn't be suspected. After thinking for a while, he really did come up with something. Pretend to be sick. That might work. He could pretend to be sick and stay inside and then sneak out to the shore of the East Sea. If he had Selene for his alias, there shouldn't be any problems. This illness couldn't be any simple one either because there was a priest at Scorched Ridge. He could easily cure Link. For a magician, the biggest problem would be. Yes, spell backlash. A priest couldn't cure this illness, the magician must recover by himself. Thinking of this, Link went to find Selene. After he told her everything, Selene's eyes widened, and she looked at him in surprise. What's wrong? Is it bad? Link felt guilty being stared at like that. No, I just think it's weird you can think of something so interesting, ha. Huh? Not only did Celine not disagree, she even thought it was interesting. So, deal. Sure. Let's discuss the details now. My cover can't be blown. The two put their heads together and discussed for several hours until they came up with a seamless plan. Late night. There was a boom and huge sound waves spread through Scorched Ridge. Firelight rushed into the air, illuminating the night sky. Everyone was shocked awake. Quickly, someone felt something wrong. Oh no, it's the Lord's home. It's on fire. What are you waiting for? Put out the fire. Put it out. Where's the Lord? Is he okay? This was what the soldiers and common folk thought. The magicians of Scorched Ridge rushed to the scene as soon as possible. The two at the front were the two masters from the East Cove Magic Academy, Grency and Ferdinand. They were nervous because they sensed huge mana waves before the fire appeared. Rather than the typical waves, they had been uncontrolled and scattered. Waves like that meant a magician's experiment had failed, and there was a high chance of spell backlash. To a magician, there was nothing more dangerous than this. When the two rushed to the scene, there was only blazing fire. There was no trace of Link. No way, Grency murmured. How could a genius magician die from spell backlash? This was unrealistic. He would believe other people, but it was impossible for Link. He had such fast reflexes that he would definitely realize his mana was losing control and save himself. Do you think he used burst to escape? Ferdinand guessed. No. I didn't feel the mana for burst, a voice said. It was light and lovely with a hint of worry. The voice came from Princess Milda. I didn't sense it either. Did something really happen? Rommelson was here too. More and more people hurried over. They surrounded the blazing cabin, but Link still didn't appear. No, we must run in to save him. Jacker had arrived. He was more straightforward and had a damp blanket over him. The battle aura around him was explosive, he was ready to run into the fire to find Link. But then, something moved inside the fire. Jacker, wait. Look, someone's coming out, Iliard said. The situation inside the fire was very clear now. Everyone could see a blurry figure walk from the blazing flames. When he came out, flames still covered his body. Five seconds later, the flames finally extinguished, revealing Link. His face was as white as paper, and a patch of his hair had been burnt to crisp. He was covered with burns as well. In the empty space, he couldn't stand anymore. He staggered, almost falling over. Countless people rushed over to steady him. The fastest one, the least hesitant, and the closest to Link was Selene. She held onto him and asked anxiously, Lord, how are you? 
My body is okay, but my mana is a bit uncontrolled. Link smiled wryly. Seeing that Link was okay, Grency felt assured. He looked at Link's pathetic state and walked up to reprimand him. After two days, the mage tower will be finished. If you want to experiment with new spells, you should go to the elemental pool of the mage tower. What are you hurrying for? Stop, Ferdinand advised from the side. Everything's all right as long as he's all right. Then he turned to Link and asked, How are you now? My mana is very chaotic. I think I must recuperate quietly and organize my mana. With that, Link coughed lightly. There was blood at the corner of his lips. It was clear that he was badly injured. Milda walked over from the side. The injuries look grave, she said caringly. I have some elf nectar here. Drink it. Link didn't reject her. He took the crystal bottle and drank all of the holy medicine. At the side, Jacker and others saw that Link was all right and the fire had only burned Link's home. It hadn't spread further. Jacker waved a hand and said, Let's disperse now. There's nothing wrong. The Lord was experimenting with a new spell, and it's a small mishap. This won't happen after the Mage Tower is finished. Let's go now. It had made a big commotion, but it actually wasn't that big of a deal. Under the soldiers' urging, the residents of Scorched Ridge all went back to their homes to rest. On the side, Link smiled wryly at the magicians. It was a bit dangerous, he explained. My mind is quite messy right now, and I must rest quietly for a while. I'm not sure if I can be better within half a month. Two masters, all magic-related matters of Scorched Ridge will need your help while I'm resting. No problem, these are all small things. Your health is most important, Grency said. Ferdinand nodded. Then Link said to Lucy, there aren't any big matters on the territory these days. You can make decisions for me for everyday tasks. Jacker, Gildern, it's the same for you. If there's something important, tell Celine, and she'll notify me. Yes, Lord. The three weren't quite familiar with spell backlash, so they agreed without suspicion. Link then smiled apologetically at Princess Milda. I'm sorry for disturbing your highness's rest so late at night. It's nothing, but were you experimenting with a level 7 spell? Yes, but I failed. Link's face was filled with regret. At the side, Rommelson comforted him. Failing is normal. Back in the day, I failed at least seven times and had spell backlash four times. Once, it was even a serious injury, and I had to rest for half a year. But I'm seriously impressed that you dared to experiment without the mage tower. Link chuckled. He didn't dare, this was all a show. Then everyone, I'll go rest now. Go, go. Rest well and don't take risks like this again. Grency chided. Link nodded. Celine helped him toward her own cabin. The people of the territory no longer saw this as strange. Link and Celine's close relationship was old news. Once Link entered Celine's cabin, Milda turned to rest too. After a few steps, Rommelson caught up. He asked softly, Your Highness, this was weird. How can spell backlash happen to Link? It's so weird. Milda smiled. Isn't spell backlash normal? No, it's not the same. For other people, it's normal, but he's different. Back then, he helped detoxify your highness while controlling the wind Fenrir to run smoothly and talking to me at the same time. He was doing three things at once. If this spell backlash didn't really happen, I would never believe it. Milda still didn't feel any suspicion. She smiled and said, Okay, stop feeling strange. Link is a human and humans can make mistakes. There's nothing weird about that. Go rest. Seeing that Her Highness wasn't supporting his idea, Rommelson couldn't do anything about it. Though he was suspicious, he didn't look too deep into it. He turned and went back to his cabin to rest. On the other hand, Link waited patiently for two hours. When the territory fell quiet again, he whispered to Celine, I'll be relying on you for the next few days. Don't worry. It's all on me, Celine promised seriously. Link left the flame controller robe in Celine's room using the aura from that robe as a disguise. He cast the traceless spell and slipped out of Scorched Ridge. Chapter 265, Nana is Alive The full moon hung precariously over the night sky. 
The ever-present silver moonlight illuminated the entire furred wilderness, casting a pale white glow on the barren land. Link could be seen running across the furred wilderness under the watchful gaze of the moon. In order to keep his actions a secret, he did not summon the conspicuous wind Fenrir and merely cast a level one cat's agility spell on himself. Link took almost fifteen minutes to reach the beach, which was around ten miles away from the scorched ridge. By the time he reached the beach, he was already exhausted and placed his hands on his knees while panting heavily. After all, he was not a warrior and did not have a strong physique. He then heard footsteps beside him. Link did not even need to look to know that it was Vance. Sure enough, Vance's voice sounded a few seconds later, Young lad, what are you trying to pull running here at this hour? Link finally caught his breath and wiped the perspiration off his head before saying, I secretly escaped from the camp. Celine is watching my back for me. Currently, no one knows I am here. Vance was startled and asked, Is it that urgent? Link knew the intention of those words and briefly described the situation of the war in the north. In order to gain the upper hand in intelligence, the Dark Elves had once again summoned high-level demons to aid them in battle. It seems to be working well, and the kingdom is losing their footing. In order to defend against the possible sneak attack from the Divine Gear, the Pope is bringing the Holy Grail back to Orita Fortress. Link did not mention this information to anyone else, including Selene. However, he was comfortable sharing this information with Vance. After all, this old guy had a thousand years of wisdom running through his veins. Upon hearing Link's words, Vance looked at him and sighed, It is good to be young. You have the courage and drive to face the divine gear. If I were in your shoes, I would definitely get as far away as possible instead of running here to create some magic puppet. Link then smiled bitterly and said, I am left with no choice as well. If the Dark Elves head south, everything that I ever cared for will be destroyed. I can only face them head on. Vance then headed towards the cave as he said, Then, let's begin. I have a feeling that the resurrected Nana will have the power to rewrite history. Link had also recollected himself from the tiring journey and entered the cave. He first cast an illumination spell in the cave before saying, Where did we stop the last time? Methods to increase Nana's offensive power. You mentioned that you were going to try adding the power of space distortion, Vance smiled as he said. Link patted his head upon hearing this reminder and recalled his previous thought process. He then took out a piece of paper and a pen and wrote down the magic equations on the side of the enchanting stone table. He spoke as he wrote, the power of space is extremely unique. It has a basic property of being malleable. When space is bent past a certain limit, a terrifying phenomenon called space fissure will happen. Vance then took a look at the equations Link was writing and could vaguely understand the theories behind it. Upon hearing the final sentence, he gasped, Space Fisher. It has a similar concept to opening a gate to another dimension, right? Link then shook his head and said, It is not the same. If I liken the space to a pool of water, then opening a gate to another dimension will be like linking two pools of water with a water pipe. There would be no rupture or tear in space. The two originally separate spaces would merely be connected. However, the space fissure creates a crater in the pool of water, causing water to flow out of the hole. The fine difference between the two was a source of debate in the game by many guilds. The trigger for this debate was none other than the increasing mana intensity of the world of firemen. A faction believed that the reason for the increasing mana intensity was due to the Dark Elves constantly using cross-dimensional summoning magic to summon demons. However, there was another faction that believed it was due to the summoning of various divine gears by the different races of firemen throughout history, and the reason for the increase in mana intensity was merely a side effect of the divine gears. Previously, Link merely thought that these guilds had too much time on their hands. However, after delving deep into the principles of the world of Fireman himself, he realized that the latter faction was the correct one. A divine gear could tear through space easily. When a tear in space happened, the energy within the sea of void would enter Fireman through this tear, resulting in the increase in mana intensity. Naturally, the impact of a single divine gear entering the world was minor. The world of firemen had not yet experienced any major changes. However, as the races continued to strategize against the Dark Serpent and come up with ways to summon their own divine gear to go against it, the collision between these forces would then cause the mana intensity to rise drastically. However, Vance did not fully understand the characteristics of space. He then asked in a worried tone, If that is the case, won't the water in the pool eventually run out? 
Link then shook his head and said, no, it is the exact opposite. Not only will the water not run out, something else will be added to it, well, this has nothing to do with our magic puppet as of now. Let's get back to the main topic. He then pointed at the equation and said, the power of mortals definitely cannot cause a tear in space. However, we can distort them. If this distortion frequency is high enough, a space turbulence which possesses incredible destructive force can be created. Vance then replied in shock, you are referring to the space turbulence. If we can really accomplish that, then Nana will possess the power to destroy every being on the world of firemen. Yes, that is exactly my thoughts. Link's eyes gleamed as he exclaimed. His eyes seemed as though he had witnessed the wisdom as far-reaching as the countless stars in the galaxy. He then half sprawled on the enchanting table and tried to figure out the equation. He spoke with fervent passion, in theory, all beings will be affected by some sort of spatial turbulence, including the divine gear. This is because for the divine gear to exist in Fireman, it will have to conform itself to the principles of this world. If we can vibrate it at a frequency high enough, it is possible to eject the divine gear out of Fireman before its expiry. Look, if we do this, we might be able to increase the frequency just a little. This process repeated itself over and over again. On a stone table in a rundown cave by the coastline, a human race magic prodigy and a 1,000-year-old magician pieced together a magic puppet that was bound to leave her name in the annals of history. At that moment, the two creators of the magic puppet had no idea what she would be able to achieve in the future. They were only doing their best to make Nana more perfect in their eyes. On the first day, Link only slept three hours on top of a cold rock. Luckily, it was summertime, and Link brought a blanket with him on this trip. Coupled with his young physique, he was able to hold on. When he woke up, he cast an elemental healing spell on himself and immediately became energetic again. He then once again immersed himself in the heated discussion. Link was fully focused on Nana's creation and had placed everything else at the back of his mind. He felt himself transforming into a burning flame, and Nana was the mineral on top of this fiery passion. It was a process where the flames of wisdom were forging true gold. Vance similarly gave up on his decadent lifestyle and did not sleep for the entire duration. While Link slept, Vance tried to educate himself on the space equations that Link wrote so that he could better understand the power they were dealing with and also to keep up with Link's thought processes. While Link was awake, he would then give suggestions based on what he had understood. He felt as though he was a full 900 years younger, back to the times when he first started learning magic, when his heart was still filled with curiosity and anticipation. This is how life should be. Vance exclaimed as he delved even more fanatically into the creation of Nana. All in all, these two prodigies had gone insane. The world of Fireman had once again made a full rotation around the sun, all in the blink of an eye. By the third day, the two of them had completed Nana's right hand. This was Nana's master hand, the one she would use to wield her dagger. It thus had to be the most delicate structure in the entire body. In order to create this hand of the Reaper, Link used the best materials he brought and made many adjustments together with Vance. After nearly a hundred adjustments, they finally created a beautiful hand with features similar to one of a young girl, but a power equivalent to that of a terrifying ancient dragon. They completed the torso on the fourth day. This would be the source of Nana's majestic strength. They then started building the main body, Nana would still be flat-chested. There was no other way. When the body was moving at high speed, a huge bosom would only become a burden to the body, greatly affecting the body's balance and was prone to damages. For example, when Nana had to come to a sudden stop, the bosom would continue to move forward due to inertia and risk breaking off from the body. That would be awkward. On the sixth day, the two of them attached a pair of beautiful slender legs to Nana's torso. This pair of legs would be Nana's driving force. There was even a coordination field attached to the legs to ensure that Nana could make a turn if she wanted to while traveling at an extremely high speed. When needed, Nana could even make use of sonic explosions to walk in the air or maintain aerial battles for a short amount of time. On the seventh day, the two of them completed the left arm. From Nana's past battle experiences, the left arm was usually used to maintain the balance of the body. However, the left arm Link and Vance created was not much weaker than the right arm in terms of both strength and flexibility. Both of them believed that after a few more battles, Nana would definitely familiarize herself with the use of the left arm and fully utilize its potential. On the ninth day, both of them created Nana's weapon. It was a pair of daggers. 
This time around, Link had pushed his enchanting skills to the limits and handpicked the best materials for this weapon. However, that sound alone was enough to show his astonishment. Player has successfully created an epic quality weapon, OmniPoints plus 200, payable in 100 days, please name your weapon. The in-game system had immediately rewarded Link with a hefty reward of 200 OmniPoints, a testament to the power of the two daggers. Link then asked Vance, what should we name these dagger? Vance then shook his head and said, I shouldn't be the one naming them. You did most of the work. You should do it. We have two daggers, let's name one each, Link said. That's fine, Vance nodded and continued. You take the main dagger wielded by the right hand. Link then thought for a moment before he started writing down a line of beautiful runes on the dagger surrounded by multiple air ripples, spelling the last nightmare. Vance then thought for a few moments as well before carving onto the near-transparent left-handed dagger, Whispers of the Forest. When Vance wrote down the last word, an in-game system message appeared in Link's field of vision. Weapon naming completed. Main weapon, The Last Nightmare. Sub-weapon, Whispers of the Forest. Quality, Epic. Main weapon effect, able to trigger the space distortion effect while attacking. Has the ability to destroy any mortal beings. Sub-weapon effect, this sword has practically no quantitative weight. The user can use this sword to accomplish high-speed defensive movements from any angle. Combined effect, space fortress. This property ensures that the two daggers are protected by an almost impenetrable barrier. Note, Nana's little toy. So far, the body and weapons were already completed. Link and Vance then exchanged glances and started working on the final step, which was to fix the heart of the puppet onto Nana's head. They did not make any changes to the features and shape of the head, merely improving on some minor details. However, the interior of the head, also known as the heart, had received a tremendous upgrade. Apart from keeping the battle experience memories intact, everything else had been upgraded. This took the two of them a total of 10 days, more than the combined time of what they used to create Nana's exterior and weapons. 3 o'clock in the morning. When the sun rose on the horizon, Vance gently placed Nana's head on her body. Link then used the magic field to repair the runes connecting her head to her body. Two hours later, everything was completed, and the sun was already high up in the sky. A golden ray of sunlight illuminated the cave and landed right where Nana was lying. She should be waking up soon right? Vance was slightly apprehensive. I have not activated it, hold on, all right, it is activated, Link whispered. On the enchanting table, Nana still lay flat on the ground, seemingly lifeless. After around 15 seconds, she suddenly blinked and sat up on the stone table. Nana, alive. The voice was as crisp and sweet as before. However, her tone was no longer monotonous and robotic. She sounded exactly like an ordinary person. Chapter 266, The North Has the Divine Gear, The South Has the Undead Army. Seaside Cave. After Nana woke up, she looked between Link and Vance. Finally, she looked at Link and opened her arms. Clothes gone, she said. Nana wants clothes. Link was Nana's highest authority, and she would go to him whenever she needed something. Link quickly took out the feminine leather armor he had prepared beforehand. Nana was actually ungendered, but her outer appearance was feminine to fool the enemies. It wasn't good to let her run around naked. Unexpectedly, Nana shook her head. War kilt. I want war kilt. Link didn't understand why a magic puppet would care about clothes. Thinking for a bit, Vance said, I got it. In battle, clothing greatly affects movement. The magic puppet's combat experience has gotten used to the variable of the war kilt. That's why it would make this choice instinctively. However, a war kilt wasn't the best for movement. Link put the leather on Nana. We wear this now. This was the command from the highest authority, so Nana accepted it. What was interesting though was that she let Link put it on her without moving but she kept pouting, seemingly unhappy. You'll get used to it. Link knew this was programmed, but Nana was too mesmerizing. Seeing her like this, he comforted her reflexively. The armor was blue too. It looked like leather, but it was actually a special type of metal. It was resilient and had high magic resistance. It had a high buffering capacity toward attacks from the outer world and was the first layer of defense for Nana's body. 
After putting on the armor, Link helped Nana put on boots and gloves. He hung two swords on the weapon hook at her waist, and then he stepped back. Okay, he said. Get up and take a few steps. Nana nimbly jumped from the enchantment podium. She landed on the ground and walked around. She was now five feet five inches, and her curves were perfect. Wearing the dark blue and finely made leather armor with two magnificent weapons, she looked like a handsome warrior. At the side, Vance commented, her movements are smooth. There isn't any sign of stiffness. Her eyes are coordinated too, and her skin looks no different than humans. From the outside, she basically looks like a regular person. Link was satisfied as well. Turning toward Vance, he said, I'll take her back to Scorched Ridge. My mage tower should be done now. I'll find time to make the flesh magic puppet for you. Give me a sketch image of what you want the outside to look like. I'm flattered. Vance chuckled and thought for a moment. He pointed his wand in the air, and an image appeared. It was an average looking man. This is what I looked like in life. Just use it. Link studied it and nodded. Got it. Without wasting any more time, he waved at Nana. Let's go. Yes, master. Nana followed behind Link, steps in sync with his. But just as Link reached the cave entrance, an unexpected voice rang out. Lord, so you're hiding here. I had such a hard time looking for you. Link was shocked. Vance immediately got into a defensive position, ready to fight whoever was outside. Link stopped him with a wave. Let's test Nana's abilities. He could tell who it was from the voice, but he wanted to test Nana. Retreating, he said to Nana, send the guy outside to the ground but don't hurt him. Yes, master. With a clang, Nana grasped a short sword and activated. There was a boom, and she disappeared from Link. It was the speed and decisive actions he was familiar with. Half a second later, there was a shocked cry outside. Hey, who is this? No, what is this? Mid-sentence, there were clangs of weapons, and after three seconds, there was a muffled thud. Impossible, the men wailed outside. What is this? Let go. Let go of me. Ah. Link walked out at this time. He saw Nana dressed in her dark blue leather on the beach, her hair pulled in a ponytail, buffering the damage to the magic puppet's heart, with a foot on Skinor's chest. Her legs were long and curvy, looking even better in the leather pants. However, these slender legs had terrifying strength. Under her foot, Skinor struggled in vain. He was immobile as if he had been nailed to the beach. Seeing Link, he smiled wryly. It's just a lich, not a big deal. You won't kill me, right? Nana, let him go. Nana stepped back and pouted with her red lips. Master, she said, this opponent is as weak as a chicken. Ski Norse was speechless. He clutched his chest, heartbroken. Link was speechless too. He had designed this language set for Nana so she could communicate. These instigative phrases were used to destroy the opponent's confidence. He didn't expect Nana to use it now in such perfect context, completely destroying Skinor's self-esteem. Face pale, Skinor's looked cautiously at Nana as if scared she would do something. Nana glared and pursed her lips. She jutted her chin out in disdain. Weakling, are you fearing me, the queen? Her voice was crisp and lovely. She was looking down on him but still seemed playful. Skinor's clutched his chest again. He looked mesmerized, and he sighed in regret. If only she wasn't a magic puppet. Link laughed. Her name is Nana. As you can see, she's a magic puppet. She saved my life in the north. Nana. That's a good name. Her appearance has gone to waste. I was almost won over by her. With that, Skinor's walked around Nana to Link's side. He peered at Link suspiciously. Why are you with a lich? To be honest, the majority of these undying things aren't good news. This interested Link. In the game, Skinors had traveled the world and had vast knowledge. He was very open and would never judge someone too quickly. Now, based on his words, Link realized that his personality was the same as in the game. He laughed. You yourself said, majority. There's also a minority. Fine, that lich does seem different. Skinors glanced at Vance, 
who had exited the cave, and tipped his hat. Vance was curious about this young assassin. Smiling, he asked, Boy, have you met good liches before? Of course. It was in an ancient tomb when I was still young. I'd broken in without meaning to, and he helped me out in the end. He even gave me one hundred gold. It was really memorable, but that's all unimportant stuff. Can I know your name? I'm Vance. Oh, Vance. A good name, Skinor said politely. He obviously didn't know the creator of the battle art. After the polite stuff, he turned to Link. I finished investigating Delanga. Do you want to see? Of course. Link nodded. Skinors tossed a scroll at him. Everything's in there, so look by yourself. Notify me whenever you're free, and we'll set out. Link opened the scroll and scanned it quickly. His pupils restricted, but his expression didn't change. It probably can't be too soon, he said. The northern battle needs me. I have to at least wait until the northern front is stabilized. Skinors was shocked. Brows furrowing, he said, I heard the northern dark elves had received the dark divine gear. Is this true? Rumors had spread everywhere, but Skinors rarely trusted rumors, so he didn't care for this one. Link nodded. Indeed. I had fought with it and barely survived. Are things that bad? Skinors looked anxious. Others spread rumors, but from Link, it would definitely be the truth. After a few seconds, the red-haired assassin glanced at Link. So are you preparing to head north? I'll set out soon. You know, the Iron Wall cannot be defeated. As Link spoke, he could feel that the assassin wouldn't just stand to the side. As expected, Skinors fell silent again. After a while, he said, Hey, Dark Elves are all crazy. Count me in, no, I'm not enough. I'll get a few of my friends too. If the Iron Wall of the Norton Kingdom was breached, it would be a catastrophe to the mainland. Anyone with common sense understood the severity of this. Skinors seemed unreliable and careless, but he actually had foresight. At the side, Vance sighed, face filled with regret. Ah, if only I wasn't like this. Otherwise, I'd go north too. If he showed up in his undead state, he would probably be exterminated by the king before he could even do anything. Link comforted him. Don't worry, old guy. You won't have to worry after I make your flesh magic puppet. Then he said to Skinors, I'm going back to the territory now. If you really want to go north with some friends, you can set out with me. At least I can speak to the higher ups. You won't be looked down on after you go. Skinors nodded. No problem. The time seems tight, so I'll go tell them now. The assassin moved quickly. As soon as he finished speaking, he jumped backwards, ready to leave in a flash. However, he hadn't changed. When he passed by Nana, he sent a flying kiss. Hey, girl, chase me if you can. Nana saw that as a provocation. With a muffled boom, she burst forward without warning and kicked Skinor's butt. Thankfully, she had control over her strength and didn't injure him. Still, Skinor's was sent flying three hundred feet. He landed pathetically with a plop in the water. I'll get back at you someday, came the depressed roar from the silly assassin. Then, he swam away. On the other end, Vance looked at Link and asked, Is the situation with the South bad? Link nodded and showed Vance the scroll. Roy V has gone crazy, he said. He's collecting bodies from the battlefield, and currently, he already has an undead army of around 30,000. The most intimidating thing about the undead army was its numbers. Anyone who died in battle would become their soldier. In war, the undead army would grow with every battle. Like a snowball, it could turn into a super army of one million within a short time. If this really happened, it would be a disaster even more terrifying than the northern Dark Elves. The only solution against the undead army was to stop them before they started developing. Once it reached a certain state, it could defeat anyone purely with their numbers. Vance looked at the scroll in disbelief. I can't believe that the genius Wavier has become demon god Tabino's puppet and even joined the syndicate. What a pity. Demon god Tabino's was a demigod of the Sea of Void. He was also known as the ruler of the dead and was the controller of death. He was powerful enough to be in the top ten of the demon gods. Link sighed. 
No matter what, I must do something about it. Before going north, I must visit the South Moon Kingdom. Nowadays, Delonga Kingdom's enemy was the South Moon Kingdom. If the South Moon Kingdom didn't have any measures against the undead army when they appeared, they would be unable to hold on. If South Moon collapsed, the Ferd Wilderness would be next. At that time, the Norton Kingdom would have to face the Dark Elves in the north and the undead army in the south. It would be checkmate. Therefore, he must stop the undead army before they could start developing. Time was tight, and Link couldn't waste a second. He called to Nana and hurried back to his territory. He could see the tip of the Mage Tower before he reached the territory. There was already a ten-foot-wide mana light ball at the top. Around the ball, dozens of mana threads reached into the air. From a distance, it looked like a spider web. This meant that the Mage Tower had started operating and had successfully integrated with the mana of the wilderness. The Mage Tower has finally been completed. Good news. Link instantly felt better. He sped up. As soon as he reached Scorched Ridge, someone recognized him. It was Eliard, who looked at Link with a pleasant surprise. Link, you're better. Ah, yeah, I'm okay now, Link muttered in reply. Then let me take you to tour the Mage Tower. I participated in the entire process this time, Iliard said with a smile. Link had this intention too, so he naturally nodded. Chapter 267 The Infiltration of the Undead Knights Link spared no thought for the cost of the construction of his Mage Tower. The Mage Tower comprised of the main tower which was 540 feet in height, and three other auxiliary towers which were each more than 300 feet in height. The four mage towers covered an area of more than 20 acres, making it a gigantic architecture in the Ferd wilderness. Standing below these mage towers, Link and Iliard seemed extremely insignificant, as though they were merely ants beneath the feet of a giant. Iliard then told Link excitedly, Currently, there are still a few minor magic formations in the tower that is not completed. However, the detection magic formation is already operating, and its monitoring range is around 40 miles, around 50% wider than the Heaven's Thorn. This means that the entire Ferd Wilderness will be under its surveillance. The elemental pools within the Mage Towers have also started operating. They are all of high quality and can support experiments up to level 8 in strength. We also left lots of room for upgrades for the future. This is all Sir Rommelson's work. He had provided us with a lot of help. Link smiled as he listened, satisfied with the results. With the completion of his mage tower, he was now a fully-fledged successful magician. The two of them then entered the mage tower where many other magicians were already busy with the daily tasks that needed to be completed. Iliard walked in front as a guide and introduced the facilities to Link. That is the entrance to the basement of the mage tower. It houses a level 8 earth elemental ring that can be further upgraded in the future. Look, here is the Parliament Hall that can house 1,000 people. Even if all the magicians from the Norton Kingdom were to arrive, we could easily accommodate all of them. This is the enchanting workshop. It is huge, though we have not fully equipped it with the necessary equipment. This is the library that can hold at least 10,000 magic books. Of course, we still have not started stocking it up with the relevant materials, Iliard explained. Link observed all these facilities carefully and realized that this mage tower had one very commendable trait, almost every aspect of the mage tower had left plenty of room for future upgrades. This meant that as Link grew more powerful, he could also upgrade this mage tower to complement his strength, rather than build a new one. It seemed like both Master Grency and Master Ferdinand were very optimistic about his future developments. After making the tour with Iliard, Link felt satisfied. However, he still had one concern, we do not have any enchanting or alchemy tools. Furthermore, our library is totally empty. We need time to accumulate and gather these things. A mage tower was akin to a small-scale magic academy. While one could compromise on the basic facilities, the enchanting workshop, alchemy workshop, elemental pools and library must be top-notch. These four areas were what determined how prestigious the mage tower was. If the Mage Tower did not provide such facilities to their magician's apprentices, why would any of them want to study there? After all, they were not here to serve as guards. We can use gold coins to purchase enchanting and alchemy tools. We can even purchase magicians with some gold coins. However, high-level magic books, also the most alluring of them all, were not something that could be bought using gold coins alone. 
after a while, Link had an idea. He said, I have to start collecting magic books. In fact, I have many of them housed in my head. I will copy them out in my free time and categorize them respectively, this is going to be a tedious project. The construction of the mage tower was only the beginning. If Link wanted the mage tower to mature and grow stronger, he would still need to continue investing in it and give it a lot more time. The mage tower was huge, and they spent over an hour before they finished the tour. Iliardin looked at Link and asked, so are you satisfied? Link then nodded and said, it is much better than what I expected. Naturally. The cost that went into creating this mage tower is insane. By far, the rough estimate of the cost is around 200,000 gold coins, excluding the money used to purchase those rare materials. If we try to even count those materials in, we might not be able to give you even a specific number. If you ask me, I would say that the total cost is definitely more than 2 million gold coins. This is double the construction cost of the Heaven's Thorn. Iliard witnessed the construction process of this mage tower firsthand. He had gained lots of insights in that time as well. When he was done speaking, he looked at Link, seemingly wanting to speak but choosing to keep silent. Link was familiar with Iliard's antics and said, You seem to like this mage tower a lot. Why not you stay over here to continue your magic research? Iliard immediately broke out into a smile and said, Link, you know me well. Indeed, I have fallen in love with this place. Not only the mage tower but even the entire furred wilderness. I feel like it gives people a sense of optimism and energy. The furred wilderness seemed to be ever-changing, progressing towards a thriving city one day at a time. For people with great ambitions, this place was akin to heaven on earth. Iliard was one who harbored such ambitions. Link then asked, are there any more magicians who wish to stay in my mage tower? Iliard then nodded and said, of course. Out of all the magicians who arrived, at least one third of them wish to do so. That's good news. I welcome them any time, Link smiled as he said. There were at least seven elemental pools in this mage tower. He could not possibly use all of them throughout the day. The original intention of building such a huge mage tower was to attract more magicians to the furred wilderness. At this moment, Iliard moved away from the topic of the mage tower and stared at the woman quietly following behind Link all this while. He then asked quizzically, who is this woman? Why haven't I seen her around? She is called Nana, Link smiled and said. Along the way, Iliard had stolen glances at Nana many times. His curiosity had finally gotten the better of him. How do you do, magician, Nana walked forward and said. Her voice was crisp and delicate as she greeted Iliard with a youthful smile on her face. Iliard scratched his head and asked Link in a confused tone, why does she look a bit strange to me? How do I put it? It's just extremely awkward, something is off. Link could not help but chuckle at his confusion and said, this is a magic puppet that I created. My magic rebound status had already been dispelled ten days ago. This was what I had been busy with all this time. Magic puppet. Iliard could not believe his ears. He was fairly sure that it was a living young girl standing in front of him. How did she become a magic puppet all of a sudden? He then circled Nana and finally found some inhuman traces. He then asked, is her skin made from metal? Yes, it's metal. It's flexible iridium that has been treated through a special process. Many other precious metals had also been mixed in during the process, allowing it to have a flexible, soft, yet hardy texture. Ordinary blades will not be able to leave even a scratch on it. Furthermore, if she suffers minor injuries, she can even regenerate automatically without external help. Link introduced Nana simply. This was merely a small part out of the myriad of outrageous things Nana could do with her new enhanced body. It would not be an exaggeration to say that simply by comparing the number of materials used, Nana would be on the same level as this mage tower. However, if we were to go deeper into the wisdom used to create both of them, then Nana would be the clear winner, outperforming the mage tower in almost every aspect. They could not even be categorized under the same level. Iliard was still observing, but after a while, he gave up and said, it is way too delicate. It is still completely out of my league for now. What can she do? She is a perfect warrior, Link said with pride. Warrior. She looks so meek and delicate, can she fight? Iliard did not believe him. Oh, she is very good, Link assured. 
All right then, Hilliard laid out his hands and said. However, one could tell from his expression that he was still not bought over. At that moment, Link then left the magicians to do the final touches to the mage tower and left together with Nana to Scorched Ridge. Link then first approached Celine and ordered Nana to follow her around. He then approached Master Grency and Master Ferdinand to discuss the counter-strategies with the information brought back by Skinors. The Delanga Kingdom was, after all, an established kingdom. The Ferd Wilderness had just taken its first few steps and was definitely not strong enough to defend against any upcoming attacks. Link had to borrow the strength of the Norton Kingdom to go against it. When he was halfway there, he saw Gildern who immediately strode over with big strides upon seeing Link, as though he had something important to say. Link then stopped in his tracks. Gildern had a serious expression on his face and bowed upon reaching Link and whispered, Sir, I just received some bad news. Link then cast a soundproof barrier before saying, Tell me. Gildern nodded and said, Our scouts seem to have met a group of extremely strong undead knights in the forest to the north of the Black River. Thirteen of our scouts have already died within a day's time. Link frowned as he asked, Extremely strong. Can you describe in more detail? The scout who was lucky enough to escape mentioned that these undead knights have the power of darkness and ice. They are extremely strong and seem to have no weaknesses in their bodies. They can still fight even after their heads are severed and can even pick up their severed heads and place them back on their necks. Their bodies are also filled with corrosive liquids that can kill anyone within a minute if they make contact with it. Battle aura will not work against them. The scouts who were killed by them would then stand up in ten minutes' time as undead warriors, it truly is terrifying. Link then frowned. Gildern seemed to be exaggerating the situation. Even if they were undead warriors, they should not possess such powers. This type of undead warriors did not even exist in the game. Do we have any traces of their whereabouts now? Gildern shook his head and said, they have a total of thirty-five people and seem to be doing a mission. They are moving very quickly. When the scouts found them, they were already heading towards the northwest region of the Girvan Forest. The moment Gildern ended his sentence, Link saw a message from the in-game system. Mission, Tracking. Task, Enter the Girvan Forest and track down the group of undead knights. Investigate the purpose of their mission. Rewards, Lost Magic Book, Space-Time Fusion. Time Limit, 8 Hours. Exceeding the time limit will be deemed as a failure. To think that there would be a mission connected to this. Furthermore, the reward was a magic book. From the title of the book, the magic book seemed to be a high-quality one. Link was enticed by the reward immediately. From the time limit, it seemed like it would be an important and dangerous mission. Link then accepted the mission without hesitation and handed the scroll containing Skinor's message to Gildern, saying, Hand this over to Master Grency, let him settle this issue. My lord, what about you? I am going to stop these undead knights myself. I will set off now. After speaking, Link immediately went to find Dorias. Dorias seemed to be enjoying life a bit too much nowadays. He had put on weight and, another wind tiger half his size lay beside him, probably a mate he found while wandering off on his own. Upon seeing Link, he shook his head and said, Link, I know that something has happened from your expression. Where are we headed to? Northwest side of the Gervant Forest. I am tracking down a bunch of undead warriors. That's near, Dorias crouched down for Link to mount on before he roared, let's go. I can definitely reach them within two hours time. He leaped forward and seemed to be running at a speed much faster than before. Upon seeing Link's surprised expression, he growled in disdain and explained, I have been locked up for too long previously and was too weak. Now, I have regained most of my strength. I am now close to the peak of my past strength. Peak. How strong were you? Link asked. I was level 7 in strength at my peak. After I was locked up in the Tower of Azula, I slowly became weaker, Dorias explained. That is good news. Dorias ran at full speed the entire time and took only an hour to reach the junction between the Girvan Forest and the Ferd Wilderness. Once he reached here, he lifted his head and took a whiff before saying, I can already smell the stench of the undead warriors. Chapter 268 The Real Undead Race There was a creek between the Ferd Wilderness and Girvan Forest called the Moon Creek. Dorias followed the aura in the air and walked along the bank of the creek. After around one mile, he sped up again. 
after running for another mile, Link could see from atop him the corpse in the tall grass beside the creek. The corpse's clothing was ragged and old. He wasn't a scout from the furred wilderness. From the looks of things, he seemed more like a refugee from Delanga. Dorius got a little closer. Finally, he stopped around fifteen feet from the body. A little suspicious, he said, I don't think he's completely dead. Link had a similar feeling. The man was covered in dried blood and had a giant hole in his stomach, but the bare skin on his face still shone like a living man. The slightly opened eyes seemed to be like a living man's too. Even stranger, he was clearly not breathing anymore, but there was still a faint heartbeat. The visible veins bulged, meaning blood was flowing. Dorias, can you sense if he has a dark aura? I can't. This was the part that was hardest to explain. Dorias shook his head too. No dark aura at all. It feels like he's just asleep but with his guts spilled out. Earlier, Gildern had reported to Link that the undead army was very special. They were a type of undead that had never appeared in the game. The corpse before Link's eyes now was similarly out of his knowledge. This had completely destroyed the balance of the world. Getting an idea, Link used the magician's hand to pick up a fist-sized rock and tossed it at the body. Plunk. The rock crashed against the body, ricocheted, and rolled to the side. The body shuddered. The action wasn't caused by the rock's strength, it was more like a reflexive convulsion. He really isn't dead, but he's not alive either. What the heck is this? Dorius felt as if he'd really seen a ghost. This was beyond his common sense. He'd never seen anything like this in his long life. Link didn't know either. He tried casting a glass orb at the corpse. With a boom, flames burst forth and burned the body. The guy seemed to be in pain. He suddenly sat up on the ground for three seconds before falling straight back. Other than having no consciousness, he was completely like a living person. However, his action had revealed more of his wounds. One was at the back of his head. Dorius had sharp eyes and saw it first. Oh my god, look, he cried. He was stabbed in the head, and his brains have all come out. If he had these kinds of wounds but still wasn't completely dead and didn't have any dark aura, it meant he wasn't undead. However, Link still had no explanation. He jumped down from Dorius's back and studied the corpse's surroundings. From the footsteps, a cavalry had passed by once. Let me count, one, two, three. 37 types of horseshoes. This mostly matches Gildern's report. This meant that there were 37 undead knights. Link continued investigating. He used the traces in the environment to deduce the fight that had ensued by the creek bit by bit. There are human footprints here, three people, two men and one woman. One is around six feet, uh, this footprint is from that corpse. That leaves two people. The other man's figure is similar to the corpse. He was probably hurt. Look, that's his blood. From the shape and position of the blood stains, he was probably hurt in the left arm. The wound is pretty deep, he was probably protecting the woman and stuck out his arm to block an undead knight's sword. He blocked it like this, and then, they jumped over the water. Link followed the footprints along the riverbank and finally found two very deep pairs of footprints. They were different and came from two individuals. The Moon Creek is 33 feet wide but these two crossed it with just one jump. They're very strong physically and might be strange undead people like this corpse, let's go across and take a look. The situation was already apparent from the current observations. These undead knights hadn't been targeting the furred wilderness. They were chasing after these targets. So who were these three undead? Why did the undead knights want to kill them? Link was very curious. He climbed onto Doria's again. The beast pounced and jumped over Moon Creek. The aura in the air is really obvious. They chased all the way into the Gervant Forest. Dorius followed the smell in the air and advanced. After walking for around half an hour, they found another corpse beside the path. The corpse's left sleeve was torn with a shallow wound. Like the other corpse, he was filled with life. He'd been stabbed in the back of the head too, so he could only lay on the floor unmoving as if in a vegetative state. Link started investigating the ground again. Ignoring the marks made by the undead knights, he focused on the woman's footprints. Ten seconds later, he found her trace. She ran in that direction and was very fast. Come, let's go after her. 
Dorias pounced in the direction Link pointed out. After running for around one mile, things suddenly changed. There were three corpses of undead knights beside the road. They wore dark silver body armor and emanated a dark aura. After dying, the dark aura poured out of their bodies. The plants within thirty feet of them had all withered. Link deduced the situation from the evidence he could find. The woman ran here, the undead knight sixty-five feet behind her. She was at a dead end, but then, another burst of power came from the forest. It killed the three undead knights closest to the woman and took her away at the same time. The undead knights continued pursuing instead of retreating. He couldn't see clearly from atop Doria's. He cast the eagle's eye for himself and discovered many more details of the fight. This newcomer controls the fire element. They're probably a magic swordsman. They're not that powerful, at the base of level 6. After killing the three undead knights, they were also heavily injured, huh? How come their blood is dark purple? They're a dark elf. A group of undead knights chased after three undead, and a dark elf magic swordsman suddenly popped up who even rescued the undead woman. The situation had become a bit complicated and mysterious. Dorias was shocked. Link, the undead knight's armor has an eagle emblem. That's the emblem of the Delanga royalty. They're from Delanga. Link wasn't surprised by this. Delanga's King Roy V has gone crazy, he explained. He's working together with Wavier, another madman, to create an undead army. It already has 30,000 soldiers. When was this? No way. Dorias was totally shocked. He didn't know about the Delanga kingdom yet. It's true. All right, I'll tell you in detail later. Right now, we don't have time. The dark elf magic swordsmen can't keep up for too long. Let's pursue them to see. Go that way. Okay. Dorias pounced in the direction Link pointed out. This time, they ran one mile, and two more undead knights' corpses appeared. Link scanned them and frowned. It's weird. These were all killed by the magic swordsman, but he shouldn't be powerful enough, look here, he's clearly a on the brink of death, but the undead knight suddenly made a mistake and was killed. Dorias was utterly confused by the mysterious situation. What's going on, he just asked. It's too complicated. Link didn't reply. He continued observing and discovered a fresh mark on a tree half a minute later. Look, the bark is gone. Someone had been here. He perched on the tree to watch the fight on the ground and acted here, I got it. It was a pebble. He tossed a pebble, resulting in the undead knight's mistake. So another person appeared. Dorias finally understood something. Link nodded. He looked at the eerily dark forest up above and knitted his brows. So many strong figures appeared. This can't be a coincidence. This woman is most likely important and involved in something very beneficial, so many are focused on her. Dorias, there will most likely be many unpredictable dangers up ahead. We must be careful. I understand. Dorias grew serious for once. Things were too complicated today, and he could sense the danger. For the rest of the journey, he slowed down a bit for safety. This time, they traveled for around two miles when Doria's ears twitched. Listen, he whispered to Link. There's commotion in the forest ahead. The fight seems intense. Stay down low, be careful. Before Link could finish, he felt heart palpitations. It was fatal danger. Without even thinking, he moved his wand. Spatial distortion. Spatial lens appeared in all directions, surrounding Doria's and Link. Practically at the same time, a purple laser appeared behind him. It shot into the distorted space and veered to the side. With a sizzle, it shot into a thick tree. The tree was instantly shot through by the laser, but the laser didn't stop. It continued through five more large trees until it finally disappeared. Seeing this, Link was extremely shocked. This laser's strength is at least at the pinnacle of level 7, but where do you get so many level 7 magicians? With this thought, the alarms went off in his mind again. Danger came from behind him. Just as before, it was another purple laser beam. He could tell that the enemy had adjusted his attack direction. Based off of the previous distortion angle from the spatial distortion, then the laser would hit Dorias after the enemy's adjustment. 
Thankfully, the powerful thing about the spatial distortion spell was that Link could adjust the frequency however he wanted. Boom. This fatal laser brushed past Doria's again, but Link wasn't happy at all. Even after these two continuous attacks, he still couldn't nail down the enemy's exact position. The laser seemed to have come out of thin air. There was no one at the other end. This meant that he couldn't fight back, he could only defend himself passively. Two level, seven spells in an instant. This should be some kind of magic tool and this person is great at hiding. Who exactly are they? Link had a feeling that he had been sucked into a giant vortex, and the strange woman was at the heart of everything. Chapter 269, Enemy of Our Enemy Link, what do we do? Doria's voice was shaking as he spoke. There was no helping it, he was extremely nervous. If not for Link's assistance, he would already have died twice from the previous attacks. This place was way too scary. Don't fret. Their assault had ended, Link whispered. Even if it was the work of a magic equipment, based on the mana intensity in the world of firemen, two consecutive level, seven spells should be enough to completely deplete their energy. Link estimated that the other party probably still held one trump card in their hand. However, this time around, they would not cast it as easily as the first two unless they were sure of securing a kill. Hence, they were safe for now. Clang. The sound of swords clashing against one another could be heard from the woods in front of them. Occasionally, a strong wave of energy could even be felt. The situation there must be chaotic and heated. Behind them, an unknown professional was lurking in the shadows like a venomous snake, waiting for the right moment to strike. After a few seconds, Link said, let's go, we will proceed in front to see the situation. If he was not wrong, the person behind them was there for the special girl as well. He could not possibly stand by and watch, and they would have to take action if they moved forward. All right then. It's all up to you. Dorias then focused and leaped forward. From the moment Dorias leaped up, Link pointed his wrath of the heaven's wand towards the woods beside him without warning. In an instant, a single directional flame blast spell took form and spewed fiery demise throughout the forest after a deafening explosion. Where can you hide this time? In that instant, when the lurking shadow was attempting to strike while they were in midair, Link noticed his movements and retaliated before he could even react. Amongst the eruption of flames, a figure stood out. It was enveloped in a dark purple battle aura, and Link could not make out his features from afar. Their speed was insanely fast, and in half a second, they managed to escape from the casting range of the flame blast spell. This person was extremely decisive. The moment they realized that they were exposed, they escaped without hesitation. Strangely, the moment this person got out of the flames, their figure immediately blurred, as though their presence was about to disappear into thin air. You are planning to escape. Link then focused and locked onto his opponent who was on the run and cast a vector field spell. As Link deepened his understanding of space, his control over field type spells also increased. He could already control them almost perfectly, manipulating the angle and strength to his own liking. This spell came out of the blue and hit the enemy at the perfect angle. It was impossible to defend against. The figure stumbled upon this impact. After the disruption, the figure once again became apparent. Due to their insane speed, it was difficult for the figure to regain his balance. Link would also not give them the chance to regain their composure. Link was looking for a fatal flaw in his opponent movements to finish him off once and for all. This person was clearly experienced in battle. They could roughly guess Link's intentions and immediately gave up on regaining their balance. They then allowed their body to fall to the ground, and while in midair, they pointed a thing similar to a wooden stick in Link's direction. A purple-colored ray shot through the forest. This was supposed to be a game-changing attack. It took advantage of the enemy's upper hand and retaliated the moment the enemy let down their guard. If it was anyone else, they might already be defeated. However, Link had been through many battles and was a master combat magician. He would not make such mistakes. Whoosh! The sound of space distortion rang through the air as though Link had predicted his opponent's every movement. A space lens appeared around Link, and when the ray hit the lens, its trajectory was forcefully manipulated to veer away from its original path. Around 0.1 seconds later, Link cancelled the space lens spell and started retaliating with full force. The purple ray grazed past Link's body. The nearest it got was merely 10 centimeters away from Link's body. However, 
as with all light-based spell, accuracy was of utmost importance. Even one centimeter would become an insurmountable distance. At that moment, that figure was still in mid-air, and they could not regain their balance. They had also used up their trump card and was completely open to Link's attack. Link then immediately used his signature move, the Titan's Hand. Whoosh! The wind howled as the fire elemental concentrated on Link's wand. A huge hand took 0.2 seconds to take form and grabbed the figure tightly. Link then exploded the fire elementals within the hand without hesitation. Boom. Boom. The first sound came from the explosion within the titan's hand. However, the second one came from the figure, who had exploded their battle aura to escape from the attack. Link had already seen through their ultimate retaliation move. They thus had no intention to be entangled with Link any longer. The moment they escaped from the titan's hand, they started running in the opposite direction. This figure seemed to be using all their strength this time around, releasing their battle aura constantly and evoking a battle skill meant for escaping purposes. Whoosh! Three identical dark purple images appeared in the air and ran in three different directions. Link then had to choose one of them to attack. Doria's was completely dumbfounded by the battle skill. He muttered, the one on the left is real, no. It's the one on the right, that's not correct either. Don't tell me it's the one running straight. He basically said a bunch of crap. If it was another magician facing this figure today, he would definitely have escaped. However, Link was an exception. Link was not all that powerful, but he recognized this exact tactic. I was still thinking who this was. So it is you, Dark Prince. The Dark Prince was the third successor to the throne in the Dark Elves' prowling kingdom. He possessed the royal silver moon blood and was known to like adventures. He had an extremely high reputation and was a highly regarded dark elf ranger. This man was blessed by fate and had great talent in both battle aura and magic. He was especially skilled in crafting magic equipment. The purple ray just now was from his prided weapon called the Remnant of Death. Its special effect was its ability to fire three level, seven spells consecutively. However, after the third time, it then had to be recharged before it could be used again. His battle aura was unique as well. Half of it was from his family traditional battle aura stance while another half was of his own innovation. This battle aura had many advantages, the unique one being its invisibility effect. If the Dark Prince did not receive any damage of interference for three seconds, he could enter the invisibility state. The current skill he was using to split himself into three images was called the Dark Flower Blossoms. This was the Dark Prince's most prized escape technique. He could produce two completely indiscernible images of himself and had never failed him before. At least, that was what happened before he met Link. Link paid no attention to the three images. Instead, he once again cast the Titan's hand and grabbed the area in the center of the three images. He then exploded the fire elementals within it without hesitation. Arg! A cry of pain shot through the air. The Titan's hand had caught the real Dark Prince. The reason was simple. The three images formed by the Dark Flower Blossom's skill were all fakes. The real Dark Prince would be forced to stay in the original position for around 0.2 seconds after casting such a complicated battle skill. If someone did not know about this trick, this battle skill would have been the perfect skill to use for escaping purposes. However, once someone had discovered its true form, this 0.2 seconds would be fatal to the Dark Prince. The Titan's hand then brought the Dark Prince back to Link's side. He was now barely hanging onto life. With a thought, the remnant of death weapon on the Dark Prince's hand was transferred to Link. After observing it for a moment, Link said regretfully, it can only be activated using a special battle aura. It won't be of any use to me. Forget it, the material is still good. We will disassemble it and use them for other purposes next time. He then stared at the Dark Prince held in the air by the Titans had before saying, Walter. This was the Dark Prince's name. Walter then sighed as he said, Since you recognize me, I don't wish to live anymore. Please give me a quick death. The human race and the Dark Elves were deadly enemies. They would not end a fight without one party dying. There was nothing left to say. Link then shook his head and said, That will be going too easy on you. You are here for the same reason as us. Both of us want to get our hands on that woman, but along the way, you have also protected her multiple times. 
She seems to be your friend and probably would not bear to see you die. I can use you to coerce her into giving me information. Upon hearing Link's words, Doria's was slightly puzzled. What did he mean by here for the woman? Didn't they track the undead warriors down all the way without knowing what exactly was happening? He was just about to clarify things with Link when he felt a pinch on his back. He then had the sudden realization that Link was trying to trick information out of this dark elf. Walter indeed thought that Link already knew the situation and sneered, you have gotten the wrong idea. Alo is my enemy. I attempted to kill you only because you are Link. Alo. Link gasped. Alo. Human and Dark Elf mixed blood. In the game, she first served the Dark Elves and subsequently joined the humans after the Dark Elves started summoning demons from other dimensions. Her magic talent was merely ordinary. Even in the late game, she merely just reached the strength equivalent of legendary. However, she possessed amazing talent in terms of insight and observation skills, a talent that even put Iliard to shame. Hence, she had another alias called, the Maiden of Truth. In the game, Alo was of great help in their fight against the Dark Forces. Before her death, she cast her final spell, Ripples of Destruction, in an attempt to stop the demon army from heading south. Destruction Ripple Ungraded Rank Forbidden Curse Effect by taking advantage of the flaw in the principles governing the world of firemen, it creates waves of destruction ripple in a hundred mile radius that can eradicate all beings in firemen with the exception of divine gears. The official site of the game had also created a detailed cut scene for the explosion of the spell. Link had witnessed its power firsthand, and he could testify that even a legendary spell did not possess even a thousandth of its prowess. The game company even created a special documentary titled The Fall of the Maiden of Truth, due to the popularity of this scene. Using the power of the Destruction Ripple spell, Alo destroyed the entire demon army in one blow. Almost 50,000 high-level demons were reduced to nothingness, though she had also disappeared without a trace. No one knew her whereabouts till this date. Link did not think that the Maiden of Truth would betray the Dark Elves so soon in this timeline. After he heaved a long sigh of relief, Link felt something moving in his field of vision. Upon closer inspection, he realized that it was the message for the completion of the quest. A new mission then appeared. Mission, Rescue. Task, Help Alo regain her freedom. Reward, None. Alright, this was the first mission that would offer no reward at all. However, simply from the fact that Alo had created an immortal body, she was worth saving. Link believed that he would benefit greatly if he saved Alo. He then looked at Walter and asked, Since she is an enemy, why wouldn't you kill her, you won't answer my question, so let me guess. She must have found something peculiar that you want. Therefore, you people want to force her to hand it in. Am I right? Walter then sneered, even a fool would realize that. Dorius was infuriated. If Link was a fool, then what would that make him? He pressed his paws against Walter and said, Link, let me end him. Link the shook his head, no, he is dark elf royalty. He will be useful. Take him to the northern fortress and hang him on the castle wall. I believe the Dark Elves' expressions will be fun to watch. Damn it, kill me now. Kill me. Walter started struggling while he bellowed. Dorias then gave him a hard smack on the head to knock him out. Link then dismounted from Dorias' back and said, Dorias, bring this guy back to the Scorched Ridge. He is important, do not let him get away. No problem at all. What about you? The enemy of our enemy is our friend. I am going to save her, Link said. Chapter 270, Pursuit in the Forest Translator, Nyoibo Studio Editor, Nyoibo Studio Gervant Forest After watching Doria's leave with Dark Elf Prince Walter hanging from his mouth, Link cast a traceless spell and snuck forward. Perhaps due to the commotion from his previous fight with Walter, the battle sounds in the distance had disappeared. The forest had become silent again. Link followed the direction the sound had come from and crept forward. After around 300 feet, Link saw the first corpse, an undead knight. According to Gildern, these knights were practically impossible to kill. However, in battle, the other party seemed to have a solution against the undead knights. The corpse before Link now seemed to have been filled with some horrible power. The grey-white skin was riddled with holes like a sieve. Black blood flowed out of the holes and corroded the grass around him. 
the blood was poisonous, so Link didn't dare touch it. He carefully bypassed the body and continued forward. He tried to organize his thoughts about the relationships between everyone. Alo betrayed the Dark Elves, so they wanted to capture her. That makes sense, but then what's with these undead knights? Their armor had the Delanga royalty's emblem, so they were from the south. Could it be the Syndicate? But wasn't the Shadow Stalker working with the Dark God? Why would a mistake like this happen? If it was the Syndicate, it wouldn't make any sense. While thinking, Link suddenly remembered what Skinors had told him. He'd said that Wavier had become demon god to be no slave and had created these undead knights. So these undead knights have nothing to do with the syndicate and belong to Wavier himself. Link wondered aloud. Or more specifically, are they under Tabinos? Demon god Tabinos was not compatible with the spider queen Lolth that the dark elves worshipped. It was understandable if the believers of both sides fought over the Maiden of Truth. However, this explanation also had uncertainties. How did Wavier get the information that Alo had escaped from the north? Pondering hard, Link could only come to the hypothesis that Wavier had something to do with the Syndicate, but they were only close on the surface and had internal conflicts. In order to capture the Maiden of Truth, the Dark Elves asked the Syndicate for help. In the process, they found Wavier, but the Dark Elves didn't expect Wavier would break the alliance halfway through. This was the only logical explanation Link could think of. Of course, this was only Link's guess. As for the truth, he still had to see. He followed the signs of struggle and continued forward. After around 650 feet, there was a clearing in the forest, but it was covered with corpses. This was probably the scene of the previous battle. Link circled it, studying the traces in the area carefully. Eight undead knights, two dark elves, he said to himself. Hey, these are ghouls. Many footprints, undead knights, ghouls, this hoof print, is it a demon? After investigating for five more minutes, Link discovered that three new people had joined the fight. One was a demon, and one was a dark elf magician. The last one was the most mysterious. The footprints indicated that he had existed, but he'd always stayed in the sideline, watching without participating. Link didn't know what kind of power he had. This guy stood by the tree without releasing any aura. He seemed similar to a common man but who exactly was he? Is he from the Dark Elf side or Delanga? Things were becoming more and more complicated, Link grew more cautious. Investigating for a bit longer, Link confirmed that the enemy was still up ahead and he started pursuing. There was another forest. The tall arbor blocked the sunlight, and the lush shrubbery practically blocked off all paths. The only path available had been created forcefully by someone. Here, the undead knights had abandoned their horses and went by foot. From the prince, they had been here less than ten minutes ago. Link observed carefully the entire way. His target was not the undead knights, ghouls, or the dark magician but the mysterious men who didn't fight. This guy felt the most threatening, and Link had to be cautious of him. The mysterious man was very prudent. He didn't leave behind many traces, but they still existed. Link was detailed too. He never lost his target during this entire time. After around two miles, he came across corpses again. There were three, two ghouls and one undead knight. Link glanced around and felt something was amiss. Before, the undead knights had all seemed mutilated, but this corpse was better off. It had fallen mostly because his head had been chopped off. Link realized that the undead knight's body still maintained its vibrant strength. If someone found his head and put it back, he would probably be able to stand up again after a period of time. The ghouls' corpses were much worse off. Two seemed to have exploded. Their internal organs, blood, and muscles were scattered on the ground, turning this place into a hell on earth. After observing for ten seconds, Link concluded, the mysterious man finally acted. His spell was, huh, it's the Black Fire Beetle. Black Fire Beetle. Level, 4 Dark Magic. Effect, creates a beetle with very high penetrative abilities. The beetle contains extremely condensed black flames. Once inside the target's body, it will either become parasitic or explode depending on the situation. Note, boom. An exploding watermelon. The problem was, this dark magic spell was very powerful for sneak attacks, but the spell structures were also complicated. It was much higher than the difficulty of a level 4 spell. 
the difficulty and effect were unequal, so very few people would choose to learn it. In the game, the dark magicians Link had encountered who used this spell were almost all demon god believers. This was because the demon god's power could lower the difficulty of the spell. Link got an idea. Demon god believer Wavier, did you come too? he asked aloud. This was his guess. Following this idea, Link started investigating the situation of the small battlefield in detail. Within two minutes, he found a large number of clues. He had mostly recreated the battle in his mind. The Dark Elves captured Alo and continued northwest, preparing to retreat, from the marks, there weren't many undead knights anymore, only, thirteen. Two ghouls were left to stop the incoming enemy. Two against one, they could have killed the undead knights easily, but Wavier suddenly came out, now, the Dark Elves should be at a disadvantage. This dark magician used three level, six spells and ten level, four spells along the day. Here, he only used a level, three spell to block the path. His mana was practically all spent. Link had received a lot of information from the countless small clues. He had a general idea of the opponent's power. He continued chasing for around one mile. Along the way, three more undead knights had fallen while more ghouls had died. There were nine, all killed from exploding. Link could see from the footprints that the dark elves were disordered. The footprints had different depths which reflected their anxiety. On the other hand, Wavier's footprints were all equal. He was like the king of the jungle, calmly advancing and reducing the places his prey could run to. Wavier is much stronger than before. Seems like the demon god has given him many benefits. After around 300 feet, Link suddenly felt something wrong. Then, a black shadow abruptly jumped out of the forest nearby. Without hesitation, it swung a sword at his area. Poof! The battle aura created a seven-foot-long arc through the air, slicing down towards Link's position. The opponent sensed my existence but couldn't determine my specific position, Link thought. This attack is to force me out. If an undead knight can create a battle aura cut, he'd be at least level six. So powerful. His fight with Dark Prince Walter had made a big commotion. If Wavier was here, he'd definitely know that someone was chasing after him. If he kept some undead knights behind, it was to delay Link. These thoughts flashed past Link's mind. He reacted instantly. Casting Cheetah's agility on himself, he ducked down speedily. With a whistle, the battle aura cut flew past, a hair's breadth above Link's head. He had dodged the attack but also revealed his position. The undead knight adjusted his body slightly and unhesitatingly charged at Link. Link focused, and the opponent's actions slowed instantly. He aimed carefully and activated the Vector Force Field. The Vector Force Field may only be a level 1 spell, but Link had greatly improved the spell's structure. Now, its power was comparable to a level 3 spell. Of course, this wasn't much to a level 6 warrior. However, after experiencing so many battles, Link had raised his understanding of a warrior's different actions of instinctive reactions. Using a force field against them was easy and familiar. As expected, there was a light thud. The undead knight had been attacked by the force field in mid-charge. The crash sent him stumbling back. Because he had been running at full speed, he lost his balance suddenly and couldn't recover. The forest's terrain was complex. The undead knight's left foot had a misstep and twisted. With a crack, a bone was broken, and he flew out. The sneak attack had succeeded, this undead knight was no longer a threat. Link dodged beforehand and avoided the undead knight's flying body. However, he was still in danger, two knights had been left behind. While the previous one charged, the other also started charging from the other side of Link. Link's solution against this knight was even simpler. He hid behind the two-foot-wide tree beside him. The opponent instantly lost sight of him, but it was difficult to turn while sprinting. The undead knight could only halt but he reacted quickly too. He instantly activated the battle aura cut to chop down the tree. Link didn't give him the chance. He had completely grasped the undead knight's rhythm. After hiding behind the tree, he didn't waste any time. He pounced sideways but halfway, he flashed and cast the traceless spell. He disappeared into thin air, and his aura disappeared. When the undead knight hurried to the tree, Link was already gone. The knight looked left and right. He swung his sword wildly at where Link could possibly be hiding but how could Link be there? 
helpless, he turned back to his companion. Ford, how are you? Broke my kneecap. I'll need half a day to recover. Undead Knight Ford's voice was gloomy. His kneecap had been twisted badly, but as if he couldn't feel any pain, he sliced it open with a sword and started fixing the bone. While treating himself, he asked, where's he? He slipped away like a rat. I don't know where he went. He must have gone after Master. Leave me here and go reinforce him. Ford said anxiously. Okay. The undead knight flew deep into the forest. However, he didn't notice that while he was running, a figure was following dozens of feet behind him. It was Link. If he went alone, he wouldn't be able to know the enemy's specific location. He would need to spend time searching for clues and also be cautious of attacks. Now, he had a straightforward guide. It was much safer this way. Chapter 271, It Sure Is Crowded Today. Gervin Forest. Master, there are four of them left, an undead knight whispered. A black-robed magician stared silently by his side. He looked extremely ordinary from his features. There was neither a veil of black aura encircling him nor a pair of merciless bloodshot eyes. The only thing peculiar about him was his skin color. It was sickly white and had sort of a matte finish to it, making it look just like a corpse. There was a vacant space a few hundred meters away from them. On the open space was a dark elf magician and three ghouls huddled together in a circle. In the middle of those two parties was their target, the mixed blood dark elf alo. This woman was petite in size and looked disheveled. She was drenched in blood, and her hair was a tangled mess. It covered her features completely, and the low-quality cloth used to make her blouse was also completely tattered. From afar, one could tell that this woman had a very good figure, especially her waist. Her waist was extremely thin, giving her an exaggerated hourglass figure. Alas, there were only undead and dark magicians on the battlefield. Furthermore, they were amidst a heated battle, no one bothered to stop and observe her beautiful figure. From afar, the dark magician opposite used a spell to increase the volume of his voice. He shouted, Wavier, you will regret what you did today. Wavier then smiled as many wrinkles showed up on his dried face. He then lifted his wand and instantly, the tip of the wand was enveloped in a thick black mist. Stop talking trash, leave Alo with me, and I will let you go. Do you think I am a fool? Alo's fate can only go two ways. She either dies, or she'll be taken back to the dark forest. As for you Wavier, the death's hand will not let you off easily after what you have done today. Prepare yourself and await death in Delanga. This dark elf magician spoke with an accusing tone. However, Wavier merely pouted and ignored his aggression. He then turned to the undead knights beside him and said, kill them. He had nine undead knights with him and would have no problem dealing with three ghouls. Furthermore, that dark elf magician was almost out of mana points. He would not be much of a threat. The undead knights immediately rushed towards the dark elves. On the other side, as Alo stared at the undead knights who were closing in, she whispered, Rovia, you have no chance of winning. Kill me. Rovia was the name of the dark elf magician. He was a member of the Silver Moon Alliance and was level 6 in strength. He just turned 35 years old and was a rare magic prodigy in the Dark Elf race. Upon listening to Alo's words, Rovia squinted her eyes. He did not reply to her statement and merely suppressed his anger. His fine magician upbringing allowed him to control his emotions well. The Dark Elves consider betrayal as one of the most intolerable crimes. Alo's actions had already crossed his bottom line. In his eyes, Alo was already a dead person. If not for her value to his race, he would personally give her a taste of misery over and over again. However, a ghoul beside him did not manage to contain his anger. Its face immediately contorted and swung his hand at full force on Alo's face. Alo then fell onto the ground lightheaded after that huge impact. You traitor! How dare you speak? This ghoul spoke coldly as he walked forward, pressing one of his feet on Alo's thighs. He then started grinding his feet with fervor. He possessed level 6 strength, and Alo had slender legs. She would never have been able to withstand that pressure. Instantly, the sound of bones cracking reverberated through the atmosphere. Her legs also started to show signs of deformity. Haven't you discovered the law of the divine gear? Aren't you immortal? Then, 
I will make you experience what hell is like. This ghoul snickered as he pressed down with even more force. Alo's body trembled violently under the immense pain. The only thing she could do was to scream involuntarily. Her body would twitch ever so often from the great pain. Rovia stared at the scene without compassion. Five seconds later, he then spoke, All right, stop. We should focus on the enemy. Do not lose hope. We still have reinforcements coming. The prince and master Amons are coming over to help us. We only have to hold on for a while longer. The three ghouls were revitalized upon hearing those words. They immediately put up a defensive posture and prepared themselves for the enemy. After the battle begins, be careful of the beetles on the ground. Do not let Wavier have a chance to sneak up on you, Rovia whispered. The three ghouls nodded. At that moment, an undead knight had already reached a distance ninety feet away from them. He bellowed and charged straight towards magician Rovia. A ghoul stood in his way without any hesitation. He did not have any weapons with him. The only weapon he had was the body bestowed to him by the divine gear. Boom. A huge collision occurred on the open field. Both of them appeared to be of equal strength. The undead knight swung his sword towards the ghoul. However, the material used to create the sword was far too ordinary. The ghoul could grab the sword with his bare hands. Although his claws suffered deep cut from that collision, such wounds were nothing to a ghoul as they would heal in a matter of seconds. His other hand then became enveloped in a black aura as it swung at full speed towards the abdomen of the undead knight. This black aura was terrifying. In previous battles, as long as an undead knight came into contact with it, they would explode like water balloon instantly. There was no way to survive that attack. This will not work on me. The undead knight held a shield in his left hand and blocked the ghoul's attack just in time. He then pushed his shield forward with all his might, shouting, Go to hell. Boom. After a muffled collision sound, the ghoul could be seen being knocked back. He staggered as he tried to maintain his balance. Be careful. Rovia suddenly shouted as he pointed his wand at the ground, Wind Blade Spell. A crescent shaped translucent wind blade then flew towards a specific direction. Half a second later, the wind blade had collided with the beetle that was crawling at high speed on the ground. This spell completely destroyed the magic structure of the beetle and caused it to disintegrate almost immediately. The elemental energy within the beetle exploded instantly, and the area around a 15 foot radius from it was covered in a fiery wave of incandescent flames. This was a level 4 spell. If it exploded within the body of a ghoul, it could be lethal. However, now that it was released outside of the ghoul's body, coupled with the fact that this fire elemental spell was not pure in nature due to the corruption of dark forces, it had almost no effect on the ghoul. The ghoul merely covered his face to shield himself from the heat waves. Wavier, you have gotten the divine liquid and created the undead knights. How dare you go against my race? Aren't you afraid that we will retract our forces? Rovia snickered. Wavier then said with a smile on his face, Divine Liquid. I think it is more like a poisonous concoction. However, there is one thing you got wrong. I did not give my warriors the perfected version of the liquid. Therefore, they could attain strong vitality while not at the expense of being controlled by the Divine Gear. If you don't believe me, you can bring it back and test it out, of course, that is, if you survive this battle. At that moment, a huge explosion sound could be heard. This sound was extremely low, much like the rumbling sound when a fireball exploded within an underground chamber. Following which, a ghoul could be seen being torn apart by the explosion. He insulted a low and even broke her leg. This means that he needs to receive some punishment. Rovia, you will support my decision, won't you? Wavier then smiled. The beetle that was released previously was just to attract Rovia's attention. When he was preoccupied dealing with that beetle, another one had already crept onto its intended target. This ghoul was so focused on the onslaught from the undead knights that he did not realize any peculiarities. From his own perspective, his life probably ended in the most unexpected way possible. Rovia then gritted his teeth. He hated people who thought that the world revolved around them simply because they are more privileged or born with stronger talents. They would even flaunt their skills in the middle of a battle. He wanted to smash Wavier's head into the ground before stomping it to pieces if he could. However, all these were simply thoughts that he could not fulfill. Rovia snickered and said, 
doing such things would make you a traitor of the syndicate. Don't think that you can escape from their clutches. Wavier then laughed as he said, no, no. That's not right. The syndicate wants this to happen. You really think that Morpheus wants to work with you lunatics? You guys want to destroy the entire human race. Morpheus was, after all, a human, though the destruction of his race probably means nothing to him. He will choose to ignore the incident today as long as it does not infringe on his fundamental interests. If I give the syndicate more benefits, they would then have no reason to intervene. Morpheus only wanted to become a god. In this aspect, the Dark Elves could possibly help him do so. However, Wavier's master demon god Tabinos could help as well. In this case, to act ignorant and stay passive would be the best strategy for Morpheus. Rovia immediately fell silent. He had access to secret documents in the dark forest and had a good grasp of the situation as well. He knew that Wavier was speaking the truth. Wavier seemed to be intoxicated with such an overwhelming victory, and he chuckled, a low is like a priceless treasure. After I get my hands on her, I will cherish her well and capitalize on her wisdom. I will not torture her like all of you did. Rovia then shook his head and said, you are being too optimistic. This will be dangerous. At that moment, the screams within the forest ended. The undead knights had attained a victory, losing five of their members to all three ghouls. Wavier then smiled and said, all right, it's over, Rovia. However, before he could speak, a voice appeared from the sky, no, it has just begun. Wavier was taken aback and lifted his head immediately. He then saw a giant owl with a white-haired, old, dark elf on its back. This was one of the pillars of the Dark Elves, level 7 Master Magician Amons. He looked at Wavier from a vantage point and snickered, Young man, let me give you some words of caution. The power of a demon god is not infinite. Your end is already in sight. You are destined to just be a demon god's plaything. Amons, you have arrived, Wavier muttered as his wand began to glow with a blinding brilliance. I have always respected you. Now then, let me see if you are really as strong as the rumors said. However, Amons shook his head to everyone's surprise. He then said, No, I did not come to fight. I am here to settle the dispute. As he said those words, he lifted his wand and pointed towards Alo and said regretfully, She is the source of this conflict. After her death, all will come to an end. A beam of purple light appeared from his wand and charged straight towards Alo. At the same time, a few spatial ripples appeared around Alo. She seemed like she was covered in a vortex of lenses. The beam then missed its target. Alo was still alive. Amons then frowned as he squinted his eyes at the thick overgrowth in front of him. He then sighed, it sure is crowded today. Chapter 272, You All Have the Intelligence of Mortals. Gervant Forest. Wavier seemed to have been prepared. Link, you're finally here, he said, laughing. You're faster than I expected. Even though there were many rumors about Link, even though he had once killed level 8 Demon Lord Tarvis, Wavier's power was nothing like before. He wouldn't go look for trouble with this genius younger than him, but if they ran into each other, Wavier wouldn't retreat. If he could kill Link, Wavier's name would be known throughout the mainland within a night. After he spoke, the forest was silent. There was no response. What, you're going to keep hiding? Wavier sneered. You refused to come out at the Opal City too and secretly used the teleportation spell to take Selene away. Do you want to do that again? Wavier already knew about the event at the Opal City, Andrew had told him. After learning about this, his first reaction was jealousy. He was endlessly jealous of Link. He would possess the woman he wanted. Someday, his undead army would flatten Ferd, kill Link, and he would take Selene for himself. He believed it would not take long. After a while, there was still no response. There was no abnormal aura in the surroundings either. The opponent was well hidden. Amons was waiting for Link's reply too. Seeing this situation, he said, I don't think he'll come out by himself. Wavier, Link also came for a low. I'm determined to kill her. What do you think? Wavier sneered at this. He instinctively wanted to disagree, but then he saw Amon's eyes. Those white eyes stared at him, seeming to send a message. He was an intelligent man and instantly understood. This old guy wants to use a low to force Link out. 
Link was hidden very well right now. They couldn't find him, but according to his earlier actions, a low was his weakness. If Link acted again, he would reveal himself and sink into danger. Even more, if Link didn't act, Amons would use the chance to kill Alo. In that case, there would be no point of conflict between him and the Dark Elves. They wouldn't need to fight anymore. This was hitting two birds with one stone for Amons. This old guy is such a cunning fox. Wavier thought. Thinking of this, he nodded and took the chance to make it beneficial for himself. You can kill her, but I need more venom from the Dark Serpent. If you don't give it, don't blame me for continuing to fight against you. No problem. Amons was decisive. He raised his wand, poured mana in, and slowly created a flame blast fireball. Rovia, move aside. I'm going act. Amons said. Magician Rovia walked to the side instantly. He understood Amons, so he was on full alert. As soon as Link appeared, he would attack. Alo lay on the ground. She had recovered consciousness now, and most of her wounds had healed. She knew her death was coming, but she still wasn't afraid. Instead, she laughed. Amons, I knew I would die in your hands the first time I saw you. I guess I was right. Amons multitasked. He cast spells while he said coldly, in that case, had you prepared to betray long ago? I guess. At first, it was just an idea. Later, you killed countless elves to summon the dark divine gear. Recently, you started summoning demons at all costs. This made me feel that the dark elves had gone on a mad road. You will go extinct, and I don't wish to be with such an idiotic race. Idiotic. Amons was shaken, but he didn't become angry. Instead, he shook his head and sighed. You're not exactly wrong. Unfortunately, not many of our race are clear-headed. Of course, he knew that the Dark Elves were in a dangerous situation. The entire race was like a carriage racing down an uneven pebble road. One small mishap would cause a disaster. All he could do was try his best in keeping the carriage from overturning. Heaving a sigh, Amons completed the fire blast spell. You are very clear-headed, but you chose to betray us, so you must die. Farewell, Alo. The blue-white fireball came closer and closer. Alo closed her eyes, but for some reason, her lips were curled into a smirk. Hum. There was a soft sound, and a red dome barrier appeared around Alo, protecting her. The next instant, the fire blast spell was activated. With a boom, flames burned around the blood-red barrier, but they couldn't break through. Amons frowned and turned toward Wavier. What are you doing? In the last moment, it was Wavier who acted instead of Link. Wavier shrugged. Sorry, I thought you would pretend to kill Alo, but I didn't expect it to be true, to be honest, I must have Alo. If I can't, everyone. Will. Suffer. Wavier forced the last few words out from between his teeth, one by one. He was not joking. You're crazy. Amons had finally lost his temper. Wavier's interference had made his earlier actions seem just like a fool. Wavier laughed maniacally, cackling. I am indeed. I killed my advisor with my own hands and sacrificed my soul to the demon god. Why would I still care about the rules of the mortal world? With that, he walked toward Alo. As he walked, he said, My master's majestic power flows within me. If you think you can kill me, feel free to try. If you have no confidence, then let me take Alo away. Dark elf magician Rovia couldn't keep watching. He raised his wand at Waver. Ball of decay. Black light gathered at the tip of Rovia's wand. It quickly formed a thick ball of black light the size of one's head. But at this time, Wavier raised his wand and pointed carelessly at Rovia. Take a break. Boom. A red ball of light formed instantly. It rushed toward Rovia and exploded. The attack speed was extreme and only took one hundredth of a second. Rovia's ball of decay hadn't even formed completely, and Amons had no time to interfere. Rovia's spell was stopped forcefully. The blood red attack had sent him flying almost one hundred feet crashing against a thick tree. Thud. Rovia slid down against the tree like a rag doll. He had stopped breathing. Seeing this, Amon still did not act. He sat atop the blood-winged owl and stared coldly at the approaching wavier. 
it wasn't that he was not angry now. He had just successfully restrained his anger, so he could preserve his logical thinking. He knew clearly that if they fought, Link, hiding in the darkness, would be the one who benefited. He was waiting. If he let Wavier take a low, Link would definitely do something if he didn't want another terrible opponent in the future. Amons was sure of this. If Link attacked, Amons and Wavier would have the same target, and they could partner against Link. Amons didn't fantasize about killing that human. It would be a victory if Link was badly hurt and ran away. At that time, he would turn back to deal with Wavier. That was the safest plan. Wavier squinted and laughed. Old guy, are you waiting for Link? You're really looking at the big picture, and I'm kind of touched. Don't worry. If Link appears, I'll definitely work with you, ha ha ha. Madman. Amons muttered. On the ground, Alo had managed to sit up. Her clothes had become even more torn during the previous struggle. Only a few rags remained, and she was basically naked. She ignored her pathetic state and waited patiently as the situation unfolded. Seeing her like this, Wavier smiled. To be honest, you're a beauty too. If I saw you like this before, I'd definitely fall for you. But now, you're just a mix of blood and flesh, oh, I almost forgot that you also have a good brain. Your brain is what I need, ah, uh, why did you have to run south with your entire body? That's such a big target. If you just ran with your brain, we wouldn't have to do all this. This was obviously spoken by a madman. A low look sympathetically at Wavier. You're a genius, she replied indifferently, but still, you only have the intelligence of a mortal. Seeing her like this, Wavier was confused. Tisk, poor girl. Where do you get your confidence from? Alo was still smiling. Wavier, Amons, she said. You're all powerful magicians so let me ask you, how many realms does the fireman world have? What do you mean? Wavier was confused. He was a genius but he was still too young, and his magic knowledge was too shallow. All his terrible power came from the demon god. At this time, he didn't catch the meaning behind Alo's words. However, Amons was a true master magician. After half a second, his expression changed. No, Link is in the isomerism realm. As soon as he finished speaking, Alo's body vanished. Her presence and aura disappeared as if she had evaporated from the world. Where did she go? Wavier was shocked. What was the isomerism realm? Amons had already started casting spells while explaining hurriedly, Link is already here, but he hid into the isomerism realm. That's why we can't sense him. Now, he took a low there too. They're using the isomerism realm to escape. F asterisk CK. How could he fall for this trick? Back in the Black Forest, Link was already able to move freely between the realms. How could he not use it now? Amons had overlooked it. With that, Amon's spell was completed. There was a flash, and everything desaturated into a black and white world. Amon's, Wavier, and the four undead knights had all gone into the spiritual realm. Once they entered, they could sense Link and Alo's mana presence clearly. They could also sense that the two were getting further quickly. Hurry! Amon seemed flustered for the first time. Chapter 273 A Gift from the Maiden of Truth Furred Wilderness Dorias bolted through the Gervant Forest with the Dark Prince Walter at top speed. He was extremely fast and covered more than 30 miles within 20 minutes. He was just about to head straight to Scorched Ridge when he heard trotting sounds in front of him. Dorias was curious and accelerated towards the top of the hill. He then saw two women riding at full speed towards him. He squinted his eyes and immediately recognized who they were. One of them had purple-colored hair and wore a light brown armor. She also had a magic pistol hanging by the side of her waist, it was Selene. There was also a young woman beside her with a ponytail. She looked innocent and wore an intricate armor. This was Link's magic puppet Nana. The moment he saw familiar faces, Dorias was ecstatic. He bolted forward and dropped the Dark Prince right in front of them. The Dark Prince then grimaced softly, and a trail of blood appeared on his lips. It seemed like Dorias did not put him down lightly. However, Dorias could care less and asked quizzically, Selene, why are you here? This place was at least 30 miles away from Scorched Ridge. 
Even if Celine wanted to train her sharpshooting skills, she should not have come so far. Celine then took a look at the dark elf on the ground before a hint of worry appeared in her eyes. She then said, if you are back with a hostage, I would suppose that Link is alone right now. Doria seemed unworried as he said, yes, but it will be fine. Link is fighting them, they will not be able to win him. Celine seemed to think otherwise and asked urgently, do you know which direction he went? This, I'm not too sure. It has already been twenty minutes since I left him. Celine grew increasingly worried. At that moment, Nana spoke and pointed in the northwestern direction, Master is in that direction. He is heading towards us at high speed. Are you sure? Celine was doubtful. After all, Nana was merely a magic puppet, how could she pinpoint Link's location so accurately? Master's blood has a familiar presence. Nana can feel it. The moment she said those words, Celine was immediately reminded of the situation when they first met Nana. Link suffered a blow from Nana at that time, and the micrometal on her blade managed to fuse with his blood, allowing Nana to track him down. She even managed to run underwater while trying to eradicate Link. It seemed that she still had that ability. There must be someone going after him if he is running so fast. Let's go. We will get him. Celine waved her hands and charged forward, and Nana followed closely behind. Then what about me? Dorias was left alone once again. Take that hostage back to Scorched Ridge, Celine said. All right then, Dorias once again picked up Walter with his jaws and charged towards Scorched Ridge. Soul Realm. Link was running for his life while carrying a low on his back. In this space, the power of ordinary spells would be suppressed while the power of the soul would be magnified. Link was somewhat familiar with this space. He could still run at a fast speed despite having an extra dead weight. However, the people chasing him was fast as well. Amongst them, the most terrifying one was Wavier. His soul was unusually strong. Link glanced behind him and saw a huge shadow engulfing his sight. Even the sky was dyed a grayish black due to the dark aura emanating from his soul. Link was horrified as he said, Tabinos is truly generous. To think that he would give Wavier such a huge boost to his soul power. There were two methods to increase the strength of your soul in the world of firemen. The first was through training. Magicians would meditate to strengthen their souls while warriors would put in their sweat and tears to grind their tenacity. The strength of their soul would then grow as they develop their strength in the physical realm. The strength of a level 9 magician's soul could be around 1,000 times stronger than an ordinary human. He could scare the wits out of an ordinary human anytime he wanted to. The second method was through a divine blessing. Link had the blessing from the God of Light. This blessing, coupled with his training had granted him with an extremely strong soul. However, Wavier's soul was at least 10 times more terrifying than Link's. It truly was infuriating. Fortunately, while Wavier's soul was powerful, he did not seem to be used to wielding this power. He was also not familiar with the principles within the soul realm, which greatly diminished his traveling speed. He was only slightly faster than Link despite having a soul that was much stronger. Furthermore, Link was carrying a deadweight which reduced his speed. After Alo heard Link's words, she spoke with a nonchalant expression, of course Tabinos will be generous. You have no idea what Wavier did. Link was startled for a moment before he asked, how many people did he sacrifice? In order to appease the demon god, one would have to make a sacrificial ritual. Furthermore, it had to be the sacrifice of souls. At least 50,000. Alo reported a striking figure. 50,000 souls. Link was horrified. The dark elves merely sacrificed 15,000 souls to get their divine gear. How did Wavier get that many souls to sacrifice in such a short period of time? Alo was extremely observant and could already guess Link's thoughts from his actions. She then snickered and said, Why do you think the Delanga Kingdom and the South Moon Kingdom are engaged in such a fierce war? The deceased warriors and refugees all add up to an estimated number of 50,000. This is already the most conservative estimate. Life was truly worthless in times of chaos. One could only give an estimated number of the deaths in a battle, suggesting the cruelty of the war. However, Link did not expect such a huge motive to be hiding in the shadows behind the war. At that moment, he had a deeper understanding of the darkness in the world of firemen. In this world, strength would speak for itself. 
This was exactly why dark forces would easily go out of control and eventually result in horrifying events. This is preposterous. I did not expect such things to happen. Furthermore, it happened in the south, right where my territory is. It was no wonder the Delanga Kingdom refugees would seek shelter in his territory. Those ordinary people had no idea what was truly happening within the kingdom. However, this did not prevent them from sensing danger. Alo then sighed as she said, This is exactly why I wanted to escape from the Dark Elves. They are too scary and too insane. Their actions now will not only destroy their entire race, but also the whole of Firemen. Following which, she stared at Link and said, I intended to approach you the moment I escaped the dark forest. However, I met with some accidents along the way and was intercepted by my pursuers the moment I reached the Girvan forest. However, the result was still satisfactory. You still came to find me. Me. Why me? Link was perplexed. While he was speaking, he glanced behind him once again. At that moment, he had already run out of the perimeter of the Girvan forest onto the furred wilderness. This place had unobstructed vision. He could clearly see that Wavier was merely 900 feet away, with Amons being 15 feet behind Wavier and the undead knights being 80 feet away from Amons. Wavier was able to close the distance by 150 feet every minute. If they continued traveling at their current speed, Link would enter Wavier's spellcasting range after four minutes. Link could at most cover three miles in four minutes. He was still some distance away from the scorched ridge and would not be able to call for reinforcements in time. However, he did not panic. He still had 7,000 mana points remaining, which was sufficient to cast a dimensional leap spell. When Wavier was about to catch up, he would just use that spell to escape. If they dared to chase him all the way back to the scorched ridge, Link would merely call for Nana and give them a taste of his prided magic puppet's power. Alo then answered Link's question very seriously, because you know how to use spatial magic. Spatial magic. What has that got to do with you? Alo then nodded with a serious expression as she said regretfully, it matters, it matters a lot. The things that I am researching on has already exceeded the wisdom of mortals. You are the only person in the world of firemen that can understand my research. Therefore, you are the only person I can approach. Link fell speechless. This woman seemed to be flaunting her wisdom and intellect as though she was meant to be superior to other human beings. What exactly did you figure out? Link asked. He predicted that these findings would be a rude shock to anyone. This would explain why the Dark Elves would chase her all the way to the south and even send Amons on this mission. As he speaks, he once again glanced behind him. Wavier was still leading in the race and was less than 600 feet away from him. Amons, on the other hand, was already 60 feet behind Wavier. If Wavier was alone, Link would have already engaged him in a fight. However, there were two magicians on his trails Amons was also a terrifyingly strong magician. Coupled with the undead knights, Link had no confidence in defeating all of them. Therefore, he could only run. When Link spun around, he noticed a strange phenomenon. He felt that something was obstructing his view. Upon closer inspection, he was then startled. It was Alo's chest. He did not realize before, but Alo had a pretty developed chest. This was especially so as he was running at full speed while carrying her, causing it to bounce invitingly with every step. Link averted his gaze and ran even faster after that. On the other hand, Alo did not realize Link's peculiar gaze as she was deep in thought. After around ten seconds of silence, she whispered, My father is a member of the Silver Moon family. Therefore, the Silver Moon blood also runs through my veins. However, since my bloodline is not pure, I was chosen to be the sacrifice, the vessel for the Dark Serpent. Then why are you? Did you bring the divine gear with you? But it doesn't look like it. I was indeed fused together with the divine gear. However, I created a puppet to go through most of the process in my place. Following which, I freed myself from the control of the divine gear. I this process, I discovered a principle governing the divine gear, and as you have witnessed, I became immortal while being untainted by the powers of darkness. Link was dumbfounded upon hearing those words. It was amazing enough to free oneself from the control of the divine gear. To be able to discover a principle at the same time required wisdom that exceeded his wildest imaginations. 
No wonder she would be revered as the maiden of truth and acted so intellectually superior. She was not arrogant per se. Her perspective of the world was merely too different compared to that of an ordinary mortal. Your motive for finding me is. As you know, the divine gear possesses a divine skill that can devour souls. I have tried solving it but to no avail. I realize that it would be impossible if I tried to do it myself. I need another person who has also exceeded the wisdom of an ordinary mortal to assist me. You are the first person that came to mind. Therefore, I brought with me a treasure trove of the Divine Gear statistics. Link was taken aback, but this was followed by a wave of euphoria. He said, rest assured that I will ensure your safety. This was probably the reason the in-game system would issue a sudden mission that had a time limit. Alo indeed possessed such value. If he had known this would happen beforehand, he would gladly make another trip to the dark forest. Alo seemed satisfied at Link's passion and nodded. She then said, enthusiasm is the best mentor. However, we have to first get rid of our pursuers. They are catching up. Link nodded and looked behind him once again. Wavier had already closed the gap and was only 150 feet behind. In a minute's time, Link would enter his spellcasting range. Link did not dare to take the risk and immediately prepared to use Dimensional Leap to escape. Dimensional Leap was a legendary spell whose power was not constrained by the Soul Realm. This was also the reason Link dared to take Alo into the Soul Realm to begin with. However, a strange thing happened. Upon seeing that familiar white brilliance surrounding Link, the black aura around Wavier suddenly increased in size as well. He then snickered, Link, I knew you would use this dirty trick. Alas, my master had also taught me something. Let me see if you can escape after this. A black miasma rushed towards them at the speed of light, covering Link within its demonic grasp. After which, the white glow around Link was blown out like a candle flame in the wind. Alo and he remained standing in their original position. Link fell speechless. He had made a mistake by underestimating Wavier's strength. He should have used Dimensional Leap earlier on when he was still in the lead. The situation was not looking good. That should have been Demon God Tabino's strength. He had sealed this entire dimension. You will have to defeat them to proceed. Alo explained with a nonchalant expression, not showing any signs of fear and shock, as though she had already predicted this would happen. It seems like it will be another tough fight. Link took out the dimensional scroll. Even if they were to fight, he would prefer it to be held in the physical realm. Only in the physical realm would he be able to unleash his full power. Chapter 274, I Blocked It Translator, Nyoibo Studio Editor, Nyoibo Studio with a whoosh, Link returned to the physical realm. It was a wilderness covered in broken stones. The deep plow magic puppet hadn't reached this area yet, so no one lived here. All he could see was miles of empty land. In the distance, there were some hills. It was too open here. It was unsuitable for fighting, and there was nowhere to hide. Even if he used a disguise spell, he would be found easily. Without hesitating, Link tried to use the dimensional jump again. And he failed again. Link sighed. It really is the god's power. This place is sealed from all realms. Since he couldn't escape, Link began to prepare to fight. First, he activated a level 5 Crimson Edelweiss for Alo. This defensive spell's power was now outdated and couldn't help Alo block all attacks. However, it could act as a buffer and ensure that Alo's body wouldn't be destroyed. She was immortal. As long as her body was complete, she would be able to survive. Then, Link cast the cheetah's agility for himself. This would ensure his speed and strength. At the same time, he said, Alo, can you walk? When they were in the forest, Alo's leg had been shattered by a demon. It had healed a lot already, but it still looked very mangled. Alo touched the ground with her broken leg and shuddered. Her features twisted instantly, but she didn't make a sound. Gritting her teeth, she stood with both legs adamantly. I won't die anyway. I can walk so don't worry about me. Focus on them. With that, she limped and ran deep into the furred wilderness. She wasn't too slow, but it was obvious that with each step, Alo had to withstand terrible pain. She gasped continuously, running and screaming to vent her pain. Link watched all this and had to be impressed. What an extremely logical girl. 
Yes, logic could almost perfectly control a person's emotions. She was the same type of person as Link. During this, Link started preparing as well. He took out the Prophet White Stone. He could only use the stone one last time, but he was prepared to use it without hesitation because Alo was critical in fighting against the Divine Gear. This involved the fates of countless people. She could not die. Even more, she couldn't fall into the hands of the Dark Elves or Wavier. Link would save her at all costs. After taking out the Prophet White Stone, Link drank a bottle of an advanced mana potion. It replenished the mana he had used up earlier. At the same time, he activated the Clear Thoughts effect on his Flame Controller robe. His maximum was 8,500 mana. The Clear Thoughts effect had an effect of recovering 2,000 mana within 5 minutes, so this gave him a total of 10,500 mana to use. This was great, but it would probably only last 1.5 minutes for level 9 spells. This meant he must win within 1.5 minutes. At this moment, there was a flash of mana aura in the distance. Then, several figures appeared out of nowhere. It was Wavier's group who had followed Link back to the physical realm. There were six men in total. Wavier was the closest to Link, around 400 feet away. Around 30 feet behind him was Amon's. The four undead knights were another 15 feet away. After appearing, Wavier looked at Link and laughed uproariously. Link, you didn't expect this, right? No matter how strong you are, you're just a mortal, but me. I have a god's strength. Link ignored him. He took a deep breath and gathered his thoughts, entering a focused spell casting state. To his perception, time had slowed. At the same time, he started retreating toward the furred wilderness. Alo had only run around thirty feet. Seeing how pained she was, Link asked, Aren't you a magician? Why don't you use a spell? Even with a broken leg, she could still use a spell to speed up. I can't. My immortal body has broken the world's equilibrium. The world's laws reject me. My magic has all disappeared. Makes sense, no wonder Link hadn't seen Alo use any spells. After entering the focused spell casting state, Link no longer worried about being gentle. Taking advantage of the fact that the enemy hadn't reached spell casting range, he got an idea and cast two low-level spells as fast as Lightning, Lightweight and Vector Force Field. The Vector Force Field pushed Alo forward. With the help of Lightweight, she was at least ten times faster. Practically flying from the collision, she traveled around thirty feet instantly. This way, Link had nothing to worry about. At this time, Wavier had rushed over. He was only around three hundred feet away from Link. The four undead knights were with him, surrounding him protectively. However, Amon's actions were more interesting. This old fox paced around 330 feet from Link. He neither approached nor retreated. Wavier was extremely confident in his power, and he laughed loudly. Link, have a taste of my master's power. The Eye of Death. Eye of Death. Level, 7 Spell. Effect, creates a huge magic eyeball. Everything under its gaze will become the territory of death. Blood red aura poured from Wavier's wand. It gathered into a huge bloody eyeball 16 feet in diameter. It was very realistic, and once it appeared, it focused on Link. Poof. There was a light sound, and a bloody beam shot from the eye of death to Link. Spatial distortion. This was the best way to counter beam-like spells. The next instant, the death ray turned through Link's spatial lens and went around his body. Link was unhurt, and he started fighting back. Without hesitation, he activated the Prophet White Stone. There was a strong flash of white light. A terrible aura started spreading in all directions. The elements of the furred wilderness seemed to revolt. The elemental gathering was so fast and violent that the distortion of the air around Link was visible to the naked eye. This was elemental turbulence. Amon's expression changed drastically. He retreated immediately and yelled, Wavier, this is level 9. Don't block it. I'm going to. Instead of retreating, Wavier advanced while laughing maniacally. I have an immortal soul. I have an undying body. So what if it's a level 9 spell? It's still mortal strength, but my strength is from God. As he spoke, countless rays of blood-red light poured from Wavier. They formed a red crystal light shield around him. 
Countless strange dark runes flew through it quickly. The Carmine Crystal Wall. Carmine Crystal Wall. Non-level spell. Effect, this spell will suck the surrounding vitality to replenish its own consummation. As long as there's enough supply, it basically doesn't have a maximum limit. Note, everything can be sacrificed to it. Only it will survive. The moment the Carmine Crystal Wall was completed, Link's fortified level 9 Titan's Hand arrived. At level 9, the fingers of the Titan's Hand were more than 10 feet wide, and the palm was more than 150 feet long. The moment it appeared, it clenched into a fist and punched down at the Carmine Crystal Wall. Boom. Titan's fist and the Carmine Crystal Wall collided with a terrifying boom. Pebbles and dust flew up, and one could see the shock waves in the air with one's naked eye. Amons, who had retreated more than 150 feet, was quickly caught up by the shock waves. He had a protective spell, but he could barely keep his balance, let alone cast a countering spell. One second later, the dust settled slightly, revealing the result of the collision. The Carmine Crystal Wall was still there, but it had dimmed considerably. Inside, the four undead knights had all died. They looked strange, their bodies dried like rotten wood. Their souls' auras had disappeared completely too. It was obvious that the Carmine Crystal Wall had sapped all of their vitality. However, the four of them were not enough to withstand a level 9 spell. Wavier's own body had withered too, looking like a skeleton now. The level 9 Titan's hand had fallen apart from the powerful reverberations of the Carmine Crystal Wall. Ha ha ha. I blocked a level 9 spell. Inside the dim shield, Wavier laughed crazily. Once upon a time, a level 9 spell was as far away as the peak of an impossibly high mountain. When he heard from his advisor that a young man from the north had used a level 9 spell to kill a big demon lord, he was so shocked. He couldn't imagine what kind of power that was. But now, he'd successfully blocked a level 9 attack. This was like a dream. If news of this spread, his name would become a nightmare in Fireman. Ha ha ha, old man, did you see? I blocked it. I blocked it. Wavier still wasn't satisfied, so he turned and roared at the miserable Amons, completely wild. Amons was shocked too. He didn't think that Wavier would become so powerful after defecting to the Demon Lord. Level 9 spells were at the pinnacle of power, but Wavier could block it like that. He was terrifying. Not only was his power terrifying, his methods were terrifying too. Amons believed that if he was a bit closer, Wavier would have sapped his vitality without hesitation to block Link's attack. Seeing Wavier like this, he muttered, Madman. After blocking Link's fatal attack, Wavier had no more worries. He turned toward Link. Link, today is the day of your death. I'll take out your soul and imprison it in the wall art of my room. I'll capture Selene and torture her in front of you. Ha, huh, I'll torture her to death. On the other hand, Link was surprised by this too. However, even if his level 9 spell had been blocked, it still wasn't an unacceptable thing because it had done what he wanted it to. Without wasting his breath, he raised his burning wrath of heaven's wand. He activated the flame flood effect and activated a level 7 pinnacle titan's fist. Like the last spell, titan's fist crashed against the carmine crystal wall. There was a crisp sound, and the wavering carmine crystal wall was instantly shattered. Titan's fist continued forward, crashing into Wavier. I have the Reaper's sword. I'll block it again. Wavier cackled and put his wand before him. A giant black sword appeared. There was a black halo behind it, similarly filled with runes. The black sword pierced toward Titan's sword while the light protected Wavier. It was a defensive and offensive action in one. Boom. The fortified Titan's fist was shattered. After the spell collapsed, the fire element flowed out but was blocked by the black halo. It couldn't harm Wavier at all. The Reaper's sword also collapsed. Wavier looked even more withered. He was practically a dried out bag of bones. After blocking Link's attack, he yelled, Amons, when will you attack? After blocking these two intense spells, Wavier only had one fifth of his strength and could barely keep going. Amons finally stopped retreating. Wavier had stopped the strongest attacks, and now it was his turn. Link, a group attack is a bit shameless, but this is necessary. Sorry. He raised his wand and activated a soaring spell. 
he immediately shot forward and prepared to enter the spellcasting range. However, neither Amons nor Wavier realized that on a hill three miles away, two more figures had appeared. Link sensed this, and he was overjoyed. Without hesitating, he retreated. Now, he just needed to drag things out. On the hill. Oh no, Master is in danger, Nana said. With a blast, she disappeared. Celine sighed. An impulsive girl, but no matter how fast you are, you're not as fast as my bullet. She took out her pistol, found a rock to lie down on, and took aim. Chapter 275, Nana, Keep Them Alive Furred Wilderness You old dog, run faster. He is going to escape soon. Wavier hollered. After blocking Link's level 9 spell, Wavier felt extremely accomplished, as though he were already at the peak of his life. He waved his wand brazenly and cast an agility spell on himself. He then chased after Link with big strides. Amons was slightly offended at being addressed as an old dog. After all, he was highly respected within the dark forest. As he moved towards Link, he snickered at Wavier, look at your arrogant face. I can even hear your family jewels knocking into each other. Take better care of them. One day, I will turn you into a dead dog. Wavier kept a spellcasting distance of 270 feet from Link. Blood-red rays shot from the tip of his wand. Once Amons reached his side, he would cast a simultaneous spell together with him. Time seemed to pass extremely slowly. After three seconds, Amons finally got into the spellcasting range as he decisively shouted, Dark Crystal Dragon Cannon. Dark Crystal Dragon Cannon. Level, 7 Spell. Effect, concentrates dark elements to form an extremely sturdy spear. It possesses great penetrative power. If it fails to pierce through an opposing force, it will explode instantly, turning into a powerful dark elemental flame blast spell. Note, Amon's trump card, you will not be able to defend against it. Within half a second, Amon's completed the casting of this level, 7 spell. Upon completion of the spell, the black-colored crystal at the tip of his wand immediately turned translucent. In the air, a 15-foot-long spear spinning at a high frequency flew at top speed towards Link. This spear was extremely fast. It left a long black line of destruction in its trails. Great. You are truly something, old dog. Wavier commended on Amon's spellcasting technique. The blood-red brilliance at the tip of his wand had also taken form. He had learned his lesson this time around and stopped casting light-based spells. Instead, he used a wide-area offensive spell, Messenger of Death. Messenger of Death. Demon God Spell. Effect, summons a flock of crows. Each crow is extremely agile and possesses extremely high offensive power. They can completely devour the flesh of the opponent. In this process, crows can devour life force as well, making themselves stronger. Note, the crows would bring about the orders of the reaper. Welcome to hell, mortal. Ka. Ka. The crows appeared consecutively from Wavier's wand, making a sinister sound as they emerged. They had extremely black feathers and bloodshot eyes. Within a second, fifty crows had already been summoned, circling at high speed in the air. The area seemed as though it was covered in a layer of thick black mist. This black mist then quickly charged towards Link. Both the Dark Dragon Crystal Cannon and the Messenger of Death were very agile spells. Even if Link had mastered spatial magic that could deal with most mortal attacks, it would still be difficult for him to escape. At that moment not only Wavier but even Amons felt a little short of breath. Link Morani, the person who destroyed their plan to massacre Gladstone City the moment he appeared. He then single-handedly destroyed the level, 8 Demon Tarvis and saved Dawn Swordsman Kanors from the Dark Forest. He even killed the wielder of the divine gear Azelia. He was an exceptional prodigy, the strongest combat magician, the chosen one and much more. He was given many accolades and emitted such a blinding brilliance that magicians of his generation could not even hope to compare. However, this legend would come to an end. Furthermore, he would be the one personally ending this spectacular legend. It was impossible for him to stay calm. Ah, this must be the greatest achievement of my life, Amon's thought. From today onwards, no one in Fireman will be able to defeat me. Celine, you are mine. These were Wavier's exact thoughts. At that moment, Link seemed to have given up on defending against such an attack. 
He even stopped running away, merely standing at his original position and casting a level 5 defensive spell on himself. Has he given up? What a clever yet helpless choice, Eamon sighed. That's not fun. Why won't he struggle? Wavier seemed extremely dissatisfied. However, just when this thought appeared in their minds, there was a change in the situation. Eamon suddenly felt that something was amiss, as though he was locked on by a ferocious beast. He felt a shiver down his spine as he said, not good, it's an ambush. This will be fatal. He had lived for over seventy years and had ample battle experience, especially in protecting himself. Once he realized he was trapped in these situations, he decisively gave up on controlling the Dark Dragon Crystal Cannon and charged the defensive ring on his hand with mana. The ring then brightened up and instantly formed a high-level defensive spell, Multi-Crystal Barrier, around him. Multi-Crystal Barrier Level 7 Spell Effect, concentrates dark element particles into a web of intricate lines. Extremely effective against both physical and magical attacks. Note, it is very gorgeous as well. Instantly, countless dark elemental threads appeared around Amon's. The threads were extremely thin and numerous. They crossed each other in an orderly fashion, creating an exceptionally beautiful and translucent crystal barrier. When this spell was completed, the ring on his finger turned into fragments. His offensive spell, the Dark Crystal Dragon Cannon had also disintegrated due to the lack of control, turning into a meaningless cloud of dark elements. However, this was not enough. Amons could still feel the danger incoming. He then pointed his wand in a direction and cast a wind elemental spell. He then flew in the opposite direction from the force of the gust of wind. Just when he completed the action, he heard a crisp sound around him. A white spot then could be seen on the crystal barrier. Following which, the crystal barrier disintegrated into nothingness. At the same time, a flattened corium bullet not larger than the size of a thumb fell onto the floor. A magic pistol. Such firepower. And such accuracy. Amons was horrified. He clearly adjusted his position the instant he felt danger. However, this bullet still managed to hit him. If not for the multi-crystal barrier spell, this bullet would definitely have pierced through his head. Amon suddenly felt a wave of terror overwhelming him. He immediately decided to escape. However, the moment he took a few steps, that familiar sense of danger once again rose in his heart. He immediately kept closer to the side of the pathway and cast a defensive spell on himself. This time around, he had already lost his strong defensive spell equipment, thus weakening the defensive capabilities of his spell. It was only level 4 in strength. Miss. Miss your shot. Don't hit me. Don't. Amons prayed extremely hard in his mind. In the face of that firepower, his weak defensive barrier would mean nothing. Boom. His thigh was shot. It seemed like the gods did not answer his prayers this time around. The level 4 defensive spell only weakened the force of the bullet slightly. This protected Amon's life, although the explosion from the bullet still blew off both his legs, causing them both to become completed crippled. They were instantly turned into bloody foam. The shockwave of the bullets even affected his hip area. Arg. Amon's whimpered as he flew out of his trajectory. He dropped his wand as the intense pain overwhelmed him, ripping him of his sense of reason. He tumbled on the ground as he screamed. He had completely lost all battle capabilities. Three seconds ago. Wavier did not notice any dangers. However, his crows, the messengers of death seemed to be in big trouble. Boom. The air seemed to be trembling as the wind roared. A figure appeared in the middle of the crows. She was simply too fast for the naked eye to keep track of. Wavier could not even see her physical shape, he merely noticed that the number of crows in the air was declining swiftly. Boom. 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 The crows all became balls of blood-red shadow upon a series of explosions. With incomparable speed and impeccable skills, a powerful spell was destroyed in an instant. This was something an ordinary person would never have imagined. What is happening? Is this magic? Wavier had not reacted to the situation. He thought that the shadow he saw was a peculiar spell that Link had invented. On the other hand, Alo had already seen through Link's tactics. She stared at the flurry of images in front of her and sighed, Is this the magic puppet that defeated Ozelia? She is indeed exceptional. 
Within a second, Nana had destroyed all the crows. Her body then became slightly more visible. However, this visibility merely lasted for a tenth of a second. Boom. With another explosion, Nana disappeared from her original position. When she appeared once again, she was already standing behind Wavier. Wavier had a horrified expression on his face. He looked down at his body before turning to look at Nana, who was behind him. There was only one thought in his mind. How can she be this fast? The moment this thought flashed through his mind, Wavier's body crumbled into pieces. He was stabbed at least twenty times in that instant, causing his body to turn into countless meat pieces and bone fragments. None of these pieces exceeded the size of a fist. A translucent soul then appeared from his body. Although Wavier's physical body was dead, he had an immortal soul, granted to him by the demon god. This soul quickly left the battlefield in search of another body. The traveling speed of a soul was extremely fast and exceeded the reaction time limit of an ordinary human. Wavier thought that he would be safe and specifically chose a path that was only 90 feet away from Nana. Wavier's thought process was simple. He merely wanted to see what this terrifying figure looked like. However, in the next moment, something even more horrifying happened. With another explosion, Nana once again flew at top speed towards Wavier. She then swung her main dagger, the last nightmare, forward, causing circles of powerful air ripples to appear in the air. It charged towards Wavier at an insane speed. This, how can this be? Wavier was almost scared out of his wits. His only thought was then to escape, with all his might. This time around, he was successful. The soul had no specific shape nor presence. Furthermore, it had an extremely high traveling speed. He managed to narrowly escape Nana's attack. He then ran without turning back even once. Nana, on the other hand, was a perfectionist. The moment she realized that her attack was unsuccessful, she immediately gave chase, striking fear to the depths of Wavier's heart. Wavier then accelerated and ran even faster. The traveling speed of the soul could reach 3,000 feet in a second. Nana lost Wavier after just a short while, though she did not seem to have any intention of giving up. Link then stopped her. All right, come back. It was only then Nana gave up. She then turned in another direction and leaped forward, appearing right in front of Amon's. She was planning to end his life. Keep him alive. Link frantically shouted. Swish. Swish. The sound of slashing blades echoed through the forest. Nana put away her dagger after slashing Amon's for a few times. Since her master had ordered her to keep Amon's alive, she had to do so. However, apart from the things sustaining his life, nothing else should remain. For example, the legs, the hands, his hair, eyes, ears, and many more. Those that were useless could be severed in case of any hidden dangers. Just give me a quick death. Amon's laid helplessly on the ground. He was still alive, although his body was already entirely useless. He had turned into an empty dark elf pillar, where only his torso and head remained. Hello guys, please subscribe, comment and share this video to your friends if you like the audiobook. Also, I make audiobooks on request, just leave a comment.